So I was born and raised near central Pennsylvania. I was a boy scout from the fifth grade until my 18th birthday. This story takes place in the summer of 2007. My dad was the scout master and my brother was the camp master for years at the camp where this story took place. Needless to say, scouting is in my blood and I've always been engrossed in it. During weekend campouts, we would always play jailbreak, cops and robbers, some people call it. One team, the cops, tried to catch the other team, the robbers, to bring them to a central point, the jail. Anyone on the robbers team that wasn't yet caught could run to the jail, touch it, and yell, jailbreak, and release anyone inside. This went on until all the robbers were caught, and then the team switched. We would play from around 7 to 8 p.m. until about 2 to 3 a.m. on Fridays and Saturdays. Now, for a week in summer, our scout troop would go to a Boy Scout camp in Pennsylvania for a week to get merit badges, to gain ranks, and to gain skills in scouting. Usually, summer camp happened in late June to mid-July. I would also go to a church camp for a week in early June before scout camp. It was when I was getting picked up from church camp, knowing that scout camp was only a week or two out, that my dad took me aside. He told me that one of the kids, Brian, not his real name, was hit and killed by a driver that was texting and driving. The area we live in is rural. I guess Brian was just walking off the shoulder between his parents and grandparents when he was hit. It was a 35 mile per hour zone in a straight road area and the lady that hit him was going almost 55. To my knowledge, she was never charged with anything from the incident. We went to the viewing later that week and then summer camp the week after. During that week at summer camp, we were at one of the campsites located centrally. Each site was named after a Native American tribe. We were the only scout troop in the campsite, so we decided to play jailbreak. There were eight of us playing that night. At the campsite, there are bathrooms called kiabos that have two stalls and a urinal with a sink, all covered by a roof. This campsite in particular had a steep bank just on the far side of the kiabo that you could lay down against and not really be seen in the dark from someone looking down the hill. So our whole team was laying against it, ready to run in all directions once found. We had someone watching behind us, uphill and to our right, as I watched to our left. I noticed somebody watching us from behind a tree. The tree was maybe 30 feet away from where we were laying. The person looked like they were wearing a gray hoodie with the hood pulled up. They were peeking from behind the tree and then ducking back behind it. I said, hey, guys, is that someone looking at us? Everyone looked, then a flashlight from one of the adults swept across the bank and the tree as they walked around the campfire above us on the hill. As the light crossed the tree, I distinctly saw the tree shadow and no person's shadow connected to it. And yet the person was still peeking out and didn't seem to light up as the light crossed them. As we saw this, somebody yelled, run, run, get the hell up. We ran to the campfire and the other players were looking for us already. They were getting ready to search for us. Turns out our friend was killed wearing a gray sweatshirt and was one of the best catchers in the game. I like to think he was having one final game with us before he crossed over to wherever we go. Back in 2013, when I was 28, I was traveling through Jujuy, a remote northwestern province of Argentina for school. We traveled through a few remote villages along the Andes Basin, which consisted of crazy dramatic rock formations. The first village was called Purmamarca. 
The place we stayed at did not have electricity. It only had cold running water and no Wi-Fi. I must admit it was pretty awesome living off the grid and actually conversing with friends and telling stories by the fire. Now, fast forward two days. We arrive at the village of Tilkara, a couple hours north. The hostel we stayed at was quite a bit more modern, yet still pretty rustic. Tilkara was yet another beautiful dust bowl of a village, surrounded by colorful dramatic mountains and alien geography. When I say alien geography, I literally felt like we were on another planet while driving through it. This place did have TV, Wi-Fi, and warm water. We did a lot of exploring that day, hung out with llamas, visited ruins, things like that. That night, we had a traditional Argentine asado with our group around the fire in the common area, outside. My roommates, two girls from Illinois and one girl from Germany, all turned in early for the night at around 11. I stayed out for about an hour afterward, hanging out with my teachers and talking. They were drinking Fernet, a nasty, minty Argentine drink that I had tried previously and will never touch again. The following day was going to be a long one, since we were hiking up a mountain, so I did not partake in libations. I started getting tired, so I decided to turn in as well. My roommates were all laying down watching TV, and as soon as I got in, I got ready for bed. Shortly after, we all decided to call it a night. I fell right asleep. Later, I randomly woke up because I had to pee and I checked my phone. It was 5.37 a.m. As I set my phone back on the nightstand, I suddenly felt something staring at me from behind. The pull of the gaze was so strong I could feel it through the blanket. It was almost like a magnetic energy. I could feel anger and negativity emanating from it. I felt frozen in place for a few seconds. I managed to turn and peek over the blanket to see a dark figure standing at the right corner of the end of my bed. The figure was about six feet tall with really broad shoulders. I couldn't make out any distinguishable features like eyes, etc. Its body was black, but seemed to consist of static. The static was like that of a TV channel, where the signal is out. Black and dark gray instead of black and white. And it moved a lot slower. It just stood there, not budging at all. I laid there for what seemed like an eternity, frozen, too scared to move. Suddenly, I felt the same pull from my left side. I turned, and I saw a similar figure, but slightly shorter, standing at the foot of the German girl's bed. The one and only small window in our room was above our bed, casting light straight ahead, so I know it was not a trick of the light. Multiple times I have thought maybe I was dreaming, but I couldn't have felt more awake. If I was dreaming, it was the most realistic lucid dream I have ever had. I laid there staring at both figures, casting my gaze from left to right, until I did what any normal person would try to do to protect themselves from scary things at night. I pulled the covers over my head. I'm not sure why I was not more proactive, considering the fact that there were two strange beings in the room but I didn't budge. I waited for what seemed like another eternity. The entire time I had to pee like a racehorse, eventually the presence of whatever beings were in the room gradually faded, and the embarrassment of possibly peeing the bed forced me to peek up from the covers to see if the figures were still there. They were gone. I waited for a few seconds to see if they were somewhere else in the room, but when I didn't see anything, I got up, raced to the bathroom, and turned on the light. I peed while peeking my head out the door to make sure nothing was there, and afterward, I ran to the bed, hid under the covers, and fell asleep with the light still on. The next day, I woke up and still considered that maybe the entire thing was just a weird bad dream. 
The two girls in the bed across from me asked why the light was left on in the bathroom, and I proceeded to tell them what had happened. The German girl was taking a shower at the time. Their response was to laugh at me and jokingly ask me what kind of drugs I was on and how much I had to drink. Granted, I was not much of a drinker. I hadn't had anything to drink that night. But I could see how they came to that conclusion, considering that I was hanging out a little later with people who were drinking. After the German girl got out of the shower, the other two girls, who were still laughing at me, told her about how I had seen a ghost last night. Her face instantly drained of color. She looked over at me and said, You saw them too? I asked her what she had seen, and where, and she said that she saw two guys in our room, and pointed out the exact locations where I had seen them. I asked her what she did, and she said that she saw them, and then tried to just go back to sleep because she was so scared. The general consensus of the girls in our room was that the two men in our group creepily came into our room last night, but I didn't believe that. The body shapes and sizes were not consistent to either of them, and I just couldn't see them doing that in general. But who knows? I told my teachers and the hostel owner of my experiences. The teachers also laughed, but the hostel owner brushed it off and said that it was quite normal and that people saw things there all the time. Just another night in Tilkara. Apparently, that region is quite popular for UFOs and is also on an indigenous burial ground. So, they may have been aliens or angry native spirits or something else. It wasn't so much that I could see these beings, but I could feel them. Their presence was one of the strongest things I've ever felt in my life. I felt them before I saw them. If I was ever skeptical of otherworldly beings before, this experience completely changed my mind. Whatever they were, I have zero doubt that they were something from beyond. Beyond where? I have no idea. What's really weird is that when I returned to the United States, I found myself often waking up at 5.37 a.m., multiple times a week. I had never had this happen before that. To this day, it still happens. So, I'll preface this by saying that I've had some pretty insane experiences. This is one of the tamer ones, but it's recurring, and it's always the same. I've lived in four different states in my life. Grew up in Indiana, went to college in Kentucky, lived for four months in New Jersey, and I currently live in Missouri. In that time, I have lived in, give or take, 20 different houses, apartments, and dorms. I've also worked in many different places. This black shadow person has shown up in almost every single one of them. I say it's a shadow, but he's really just kind of a big black mass that definitely looks three-dimensional and kind of fizzles out at the edges. That's the best I can explain it. He usually disappears within four or five seconds of me seeing him, and I always check to make sure that it wasn't my own shadow. The first time I remember seeing him was at the house that I was born in, right before we moved. He was standing in the garage, then quickly disappeared. After that, I would see him in my doorway when I was playing video games. I would see him at school down the hallways, one of the more memorable times was when I was at work, and I saw a black figure walk up to the register to my right. I thought a coworker had come in to start his shift. I said, hello, and my boss was standing next to me and said, who the hell are you talking to? I replied that my coworker had just walked in, and my boss said, um, no, no one else is here. He showed up the night my parents told my brother and I that they were getting a divorce. He was sitting between them, on the couch, which I thought was odd. 
He showed up the day before the worst medical emergency of my life. I was flipping through the mail at my mom's new house, and I could see a black figure peeking around the corner, about ten feet from me. I looked up, and it was gone. I looked back down, and it was back again. This happened three times. On the fourth time, I looked up long enough to see the hands wrapped around the corner of the wall, and a full head and shoulders, before it ducked back behind the corner. The very next day I had a migraine that presented itself as a stroke, at the age of 18. He showed up the day I left for college. He was standing beside my car. He showed up in my dorm room, right before I walked out into the hallway, to see my stalker standing there, smiling at me. She was real, and I'm still not sure how she found my dorm room on the 16th floor, or how she got in. We had to be swiped in, or swiped out with someone who lives there as their guest, but that's a whole other story. My girlfriend saw him once right after we had moved into our new apartment. He was standing in the doorway to our bedroom while we were watching TV. She hadn't believed me when I told her all the stories of him just appearing out of nowhere at major times in my life. She saw him that time, and believes me now. I've seen him five or six times in the last five months. I saw him on the morning my grandmother died, and at her funeral. He was standing next to my father. I saw him at my college graduation party, standing in the corner. The closest I've ever seen him was when I got my new job, and was sitting at my desk for the first time. I looked up from setting up my new work laptop, and he was sitting in one of the chairs immediately in front of my desk. This is the first time he didn't immediately disappear. I could see him for about 30 seconds, and I felt this feeling of approval radiating to me. It was like he wanted me to know he was proud. My girlfriend believes that it's the ghost of the miscarriage my mom had the year before I was born. The black shadow has always been close to my size, if not slightly bigger. She thinks that he's trying to be my big brother and warn me of bad things that might happen, or to be there to support me during major life accomplishments. I tend to believe that because it sounds better than anything else. The reason I'm telling this story is that I had an incident recently with what I thought was my shadow friend. I was on a fire scene, drawing up a diagram in this old rundown building that was being renovated into apartments in a small town in southeastern Missouri, literally about 40 feet from the Mississippi. I'm standing in this room that's being remodeled when I see him in front of me in another room. There's no drywall on any of the walls yet, so I can see the entire area. I stop and look at him and nod my head. When he disappears, a bucket comes flying off a workbench in front of me and lands a good seven to eight feet from where it was sitting, about two feet in front of me. I'm scared out of my mind at this point, and I go back into the area of the building that had already been finished and was where the fire had occurred. I'm waiting for the lead investigator to get back to the scene when I hear footsteps coming up the stairs behind me, followed by the very distinctive sound of boot steps on wet insulation. I called out to the investigator with no response. The boot steps continued very slowly until they reached the doorway, but nobody was there. I get chills just thinking about this. What concerns me is that I saw my shadow friend immediately before all of this, but he's never made a sound or moved anything before. I've also never felt fear around him, only comfort or confusion. I also haven't seen him since. I have no idea what the hell happened. This is going to be pretty short, but I'm going to get straight to the point. I've been seeing shadow people for the last few months. They're not all the same, though. I don't know if it's normal. 
but I see them in groups of one to three. I'm interested to know if it's coincidence that I keep seeing them, or if there's some reason for it. I have met a man with no face before, but I'm not sure if that might have anything to do with it. I'm not making this up, I just want some answers. I don't know why I keep seeing these things, why they show up in groups, and why they're slightly different every time. What do you think? This happened last year when my grandmom was admitted to the hospital and I was visiting her. The hospital was an hour's drive from my cousin's place. At about 11.30 p.m., my uncle and I left the hospital to go back to my cousin's place. A little context. This was in Jammu and Kashmir, India. The main city, Jammu, is connected with other smaller towns via a main highway so we had to use that to get anywhere. We were about a 20 minute drive away from home when we see this woman standing along the edge of the highway, hair tied back cleanly and wearing the traditional red sari or wedding dress with blood flowing along her arm. My uncle, with an intention to help, started to slow down until I alarmed him because I saw her bare feet which were reversed. We sped past her, all the while chanting Hindu chants because we're a very religious family. As we got home, we had a strong fever that was gone by the following morning. We asked around and we were told that there was this girl who lived near the highway who had slit her wrists on her wedding day a month ago because she was being forced into marrying this guy she didn't want to marry. Many people see her and crash their vehicles in confusion. I still remember her, clear as day. I'm getting chills even writing about it. In fall of 2017, I was picking up a friend from his dorm room in the early morning at sunrise. I was parked in my car on campus at Denver University. As I was waiting for him to arrive to the car, out of my peripheral vision, I saw what looked like a shadow person. It was just a torso though, and it was up floating on the sidewalk about 30 feet away from me, on the other side of the road, and going in the opposite direction of me. The second I turned my head to really acknowledge what I was looking at, the figure completely disappeared, and below it, a cat appeared out of thin air and sprinted across the road. I have no idea what I saw. I used to work as a guide and then as a backup, and even as a field director for several wilderness therapy programs for troubled kids in Arizona, Utah, and Idaho. They were all good jobs, but where I worked in Utah was in the West Desert, south of Dugway. It's possibly the ugliest and creepiest part of Utah. Tons of sketchy stuff happened to us out there. This story happened in 2005. The groups were camped in a really nice area for that part of the desert. It was called Indian Canyon. This spot was so nice, in fact, that in the late 1800s or 1900s, some enterprising pioneer family had built themselves a little homestead with a one room cabin and a small barn and a cedar pole fence around the perimeter of that little farm. All of that, of course, now was a crumbling, rotten ruin. The cabin, it seemed, had burned down well over 50 years ago, and what remained of the barn was poking out of the grass 
in two or three foot shards of gray wood scattered all over the nearby vicinity. This week, I was also camped in Indian Canyon, but farther down the road. I was manning the infield emergency response vehicle for the ERV, better known as backup, a new position that I helped invent when I took a list of things that had gone wrong in the field to the directors and explained that because of the horrible response time and spotty satellite phone service, the only reason we weren't shut down or the people weren't dead was because we were lucky, not because we were prepared or efficient at responding to emergencies. Now we had radios and someone listening to them 24 seven, never more than a few minutes away with a vehicle. That's how it worked in theory anyway. One of the boys groups was camped at the mouth of the canyon in the foothills, about two miles away from me. The other just a mile beyond them. The girls were close too. I was camped somewhere in the middle of the canyon on top of a small ridge that had a little jeep track side road branching off of the main dirt road running up the canyon. And the girls were just a couple of ridges over, maybe a mile away, though to drive to them might have to go back out on the main road and take a different jeep trail up to their spot, maybe a five mile trip. I was about a mile and a half below the staff training group that was being held by my then wife, Jessica. There were going to be several groups of parents coming out to visit their kids later in the week. So both the boys groups and the girls groups, all on that side of the mountain, had all elected to stay put for a few days and work on building backpacks and gathering fire sets and a lot of other primitive skills. The training group had been in the field for almost a week and they were getting ready to split up and go join the student groups for the last several days of their training. This left me with less to do than normal. I didn't have to find new sites for groups or drop anyone's water or food. Everyone was well taken care of and no one was moving for several days. I decided to build a sweat lodge next to the creek up near where the new staff were camped. I found the perfect spot well out of sight of the group on a little smooth sandbar right by the water. I got to work. I harvested some long willow saplings that were bendable enough to weave a frame with and arranged them in a 10 foot circle, digging down a foot and a half for each one to anchor it into the sand. I bent them into a dome at least four feet high and 10 feet across and wove the branches together with supporting crossbars until I had a structure that I probably could have stood on without breaking. I walked down to the truck, which I had hidden in some pine trees a quarter of a mile away, and hauled a large bin of tarps and cowhides and plastic sheeting, along with my fire set and some other gear, up to the lodge. As I was walking back to the creek, I remember feeling like someone was following me, but when I stopped to look, I couldn't see or hear anything. It was a beautiful day for July. The morning had started out with some high wispy cloud cover, but that had long since burned off and the noon sun was high overhead. It wasn't yet too hot, however. I was high enough in the mountains that the oppressive heat that I knew was slowly baking the kids groups in the desert below wouldn't reach me for another couple of hours. I set to work placing hides first on my little domed frame I covered those with some tarps and plastic sheeting and secured it all so that I had as close to an airtight and waterproof shelter as possible with only a small arched opening for a door. I secured an old military poncho over the door so that once hot rocks had been placed inside of it, it could be sealed shut and the sweat ceremony could take place. I wanted it as hot as possible. There wouldn't be any children involved in this one so we could go as hot as we wanted. I took the extra time around the base of the lodge to bury all the edges of the coverings deep in the sand. This was as sturdy a shelter structure as I had ever built. It was nice. I spent a good hour gathering sage and juniper and covered the floor of the lodge with a thick padding of the fragrant plants. I did this in part so that it was a soft place to sit for an extended time. 
but mostly I did it because I was intending to invite the new staff down to do a sweat ceremony later, to help some of them prepare to meet actual students for the first time. And frankly, a group of unwashed men and women who hadn't showered in a week in July, all crammed inside a sweltering homemade dome tent sweating buckets, is a smell that should not be endured without as much sage and juniper as possible. If it was really bad, which it was likely to be, I would rub some of it into my shirt and then pull it up over my nose and breathe through that. I went hunting for lava rock. I found an outcropping of some small rounded boulders, perfect for heating on a bonfire and then rolling into the lodge. And I proceeded to gather three onto a tarp. It was heavy, almost too heavy for me to sling over my back and carry, but I managed to make it back to the fire pit I had dug with all three. I left them there and went to gather more. I made this a smaller load because it's not like I was in a hurry. I could take more trips. When I got back to the fire pit, one of my rocks was gone. I just stared at the small depression in the sand where I had placed it minutes before and then looked around for signs that someone, possibly one of the staff from the group, had come and taken it. No tracks. I looked around again and spotted it by the edge of the creek, 20 feet away. I had that feeling again, like I was being watched, but I couldn't see anyone in the trees. I walked over and retrieved my stone, the heaviest one I had carried, and put it back with the others. Maybe it had rolled there through flat, soft, dry sand? Unlikely. I gathered a bunch more rocks, and none of them went missing, and then I built a fire. As I worked, that weird feeling came back, only this time it felt more ominous, like it was mad at me for being there. I stood up, determined to walk out into the woods and find whoever it was. The radio, which I kept on and strapped to my belt, had been silent all day, but suddenly, it crackled to life. Brian, in the boys' group, was doing evening check-in a little early so that they could do their day hike without having to stop and contact me. After we talked, I felt more normal again. I cooked some rice and beans for dinner, and as they cooled off, I piled my stones, probably 30 of them, into a cairn in the center of the fire, and then just piled on all the dry wood and brush I could gather. I took my knife out of my sheath, because that feeling was back, still worse this time. As soon as my fire became almost irresponsibly large, I saw someone moving fast through the trees, straight toward me. I tensed, then relaxed. Will, a seasoned staff working in the training group with Jessica and Katie, came running down the creek. He stopped when he saw me and my sweat lodge and my 10 foot tall flames and broke into a huge grin. I thought it was a wildfire, he said. Some of the new girls are panicking. Nope, just an epic sweat lodge, I said. I was planning on inviting you all down for it when you called in, but I'll consider this your check-in. If you guys want to, you're all invited to come sweat. It'll be ready in about half an hour. Perfect, he said. They're just finishing up dinner. I'll go let Katie in just now and we'll be down. He turned to walk away. Hey, Will? He turned back around. Did you guys lose track of any of the new guys today? Or did one of you three come down this way? He thought for a moment and said, No, I don't think so. Why? That's nothing, I said. I just thought someone might have come looking for me when I was out gathering rocks. Some of my stuff was in a different place than I remember leaving it. That's all. He looked at me with an odd expression. Weird, he said finally. I'll ask everyone, but we've kept pretty busy today, so I don't know when someone would have had time to come down this far. It's okay, I said. Don't stress it. I was just wondering. See you in a few minutes. 
The other two kids' groups radioed me shortly after Will walked off. It was more like an hour before the staff group finally trudged into my sandy clearing. Some of them looked excited, and some of them looked confused at my dome of plastic and sand, and at my pile of glowing red boulders on the still blazing fire, and at the stack of blue five-gallon water jugs that I'd hauled down from the truck for the experience. We thought we were going to die in a forest fire, one of the new girls, Carol Sue, said accusingly. She looked extra smelly. I pulled some essential oils out of my possibles bag. A possibles bag is just a type of leather purse we make on the trail. We call it that to disguise the fact that we're grown men who carry around purses. Put some of this on your wrists and neck. It will help you keep a good frame of mind in the sweat. How many of you have done this before? A handful of them raised their hands. Inside of the circle of the lodge is a sacred place. We will do four sessions, going longer and longer each time. We will dedicate each session to a different part of our lives, our histories, our families, our struggles, and our choices. Try to only speak from the heart about these things. It will be very hot once we begin pouring water on the rocks, and the heat will make it very difficult to speak anyway. So only speak if it is important. Katie and Will were already rolling the superheated rocks into the lodge, using some long willow poles I had made. I gave Jess a side hug. The trainees didn't know we were married, and we had found it best not to let kids or people new to the wilderness group know, because it could have become a distraction from the experience if they got caught up in our personal lives. So side hug was all. As far as they knew, we were just co-workers. I took out a dried sage smudge and lit it on the fire and did the ritual smoke cleansing for each of them as they entered the hallowed ground. I made the last minute decision not to go into the sweat lodge. That last boys group had a student that was a little bit of trouble and I was worried I would end up having to take an emergency radio call about a runner in the middle of someone's heartfelt speaking about their issues with their family or their past. Also, the smell. Also, something just felt off. This was a perfect spot and a perfect time for a sweat lodge ceremony, but it felt not wrong exactly, just off somehow. Instead, I whispered my choice and that maybe I would join the next session to Katie as she was the last to enter, and I sealed the door up behind them, burying the edge of the poncho in the sand like the rest of the construction. I stood by the fire for a minute or two and felt hot, so I walked in the water down the narrow stream about a hundred yards and just looked at the stars that were slowly becoming more and more visible in the darkening twilight. I stood there for at least 10 minutes, enjoying the changing sky. I heard a twig snap somewhere to my left, and the crickets went silent. There was definitely somebody away up there in the trees. I stared hard and could not see anybody at first, but there was a small dark shadow under a pine, maybe 30 or 40 feet away too dark for this early in the evening. Was that a girl in the shadow? It looked like a small Native American girl with two long braids and some kind of headband. I called out to her, but she didn't move. She seemed to be glaring at me. And the longer I stood there, the worse I felt, like the warmth from the air around me was being sucked away. So I took a deep breath, and I did what I always do in the woods when something unknown scares me. I ran at it. Whoever was there took off fast, and I chased them. I lost them quickly enough, I'm not a runner, but I was sure they had been headed in the direction away from my little creekside sweat lodge. I must have gone an eighth of a mile, almost to the road, when I heard all the staff at the sweat lodge scream behind me. My blood ran cold and I turned on my heel and sprinted back up the canyon. 
I almost missed the sweat lodge clearing when I came to it because nothing that I saw made sense. The fire was out, not even a glow. The sweat lodge was gone. The tarps had all been pulled and ripped off and they and the hides were flung out in a wide circle on the ground in the bushes and in the water. The frame was uprooted and folded over on its side to one side of the sandbar and all the new and experienced staff were sitting stunned in a circle on a padding of sage and juniper around a pile of cold rocks. What happened? I yelled as I ran up. After a moment, Katie answered. We were just sitting here, starting to pour water on the rocks to heat things up, and we started talking a little bit about what it means to know your personal history. The walls of the sweat lodge started shaking, and we thought you were outside trying to get in. It stopped for a minute, and Jess called your name, but you didn't answer and we had just poured some more water on the rocks when the whole lodge went cold, like really cold, and it sounded like a massive windstorm blew in and ripped the whole thing off of us, frame and all, and threw it into the trees. I didn't know what to do, so I grabbed my bag and got out every flashlight I had. We started checking each other for injuries. I lied to them through my teeth, and told them that it was a microburst windstorm and that they happened sometimes in Utah and that they were lucky nobody got hurt and so on. Amidst the skeptical looks from the three who knew me, I got Jessica and Will to start taking the stunned newbies back to camp, but Katie stayed. Katie, who had been with me through so many other unexplainable things out here, knew what I was doing. She could tell I wasn't saying something. The fire is out. Like, it's out cold. And it was a thousand degrees 20 minutes ago. And the rocks that were glowing hot 20 minutes ago feel like they've been sitting in the creek, she said. What are you not saying? I took a deep breath. I just tried to chase down a Native American girl who apparently can run unnaturally fast in the dark. Katie sat down hard. I looked at her, but she didn't say anything, so I continued. Today, while I was gathering rocks for the lodge, I felt like someone was watching me the whole time, and I swear I'm not making this up, but I set down that really big rock, you know, the first one you rolled into the circle, and I walked away for a few minutes. When I returned, it was over by the creek, like someone came and moved it, but there were no tracks and it couldn't have rolled there. And then after you all went into the sweat lodge, I walked down to the creek and heard something in the trees. It took me a minute to spot her, but she was hiding in a shadow under a tree. I think I chased her for maybe 30 seconds when you all started screaming and I ran back up here. What Katie said next made me sit down too. Did she have two braids and a headband? I nodded slowly. Early this morning, like three, Jessica woke everybody up and said it was going to rain and that we needed to build a shelter. There were no clouds last night, I said. I know, said Katie, but she woke us all up and insisted that we needed to build a shelter and she wouldn't drop it until we all moved closer together and put up some tarps. I like to see the stars if I wake up, so I moved in close just in case, but I didn't get under a tarp. Neither did Will or Josh, and he's one of the new guys. Well, this morning, just before it got light, I had a really disturbing dream where I felt like I was awake in my sleeping bag and was staring up into the trees above me and there was this little Native American girl with two braids and a blue-gray headband up in the tree over my face, just staring at me. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't move or wake up. I was only able to move when Josh, on the other side of the shelter, yelled and sat up. I thought it was just a horrible dream, until I talked to Jess about the rain last night. She admitted to me that she hadn't been worried about rain, 
but that she had been dead asleep when she felt somebody reach into her sleeping bag and shove her head to the side. She panicked and laid there and pretended like she was still sleeping, but they knelt over her face for a few minutes. She said she was terrified to open her eyes. When she felt them leave, she waited for a few minutes and then woke everyone else up. I was wondering why she slept in the middle of everyone. Now it makes sense. I was quiet. Katie spoke again. Before breakfast, I asked Josh why he yelled and sat up. I was grateful he did, but was curious as to why. He told me that he'd had a horrible nightmare about a little Native American girl. And when he thought he woke up, he saw her running at him. He yelled and she jumped over his head and took off. And that's when he really woke up and sat up. He was surprised that I had heard him yell. He thought he was still asleep at that point and he dreamed the yelling part. I didn't tell Jess or Josh what happened to me and I didn't tell them about each other. But at breakfast, Will told all of us about this horrible dream he had about a little girl dying in that cabin when it burned down. We all freaked out. It's all we've been talking about today. Half of the group didn't believe us and Carol Sue, the loud annoying one, has told everybody that we're just trying to haze the new guys. Even Josh, who's a new guy, is in on it, apparently. And then the sweat lodge thing happened. With what you just told me, I don't think any of us were dreaming. We were quiet for a long time. I think we should move camp down the road tomorrow, I finally said. I'll clean up this mess in the morning. Katie just nodded and stood up. Oh, and Katie? It's probably a good idea for everyone to be under the shelter to sleep tonight. And also, maybe don't light another fire. I'm guessing the one at your group site is out too. She sighed tiredly and walked off into the dark. I just sat there for a while and then slowly made my way back to the truck. I didn't feel like anyone was watching me anymore but that didn't stop me from sleeping in the cab with the doors locked for the rest of the week. I work as a service manager at a Chipotle that is rather understaffed. As the manager, I'm the last one out, and due to staffing, that's usually pretty late. To make matters worse, I commute by bike, so I like to get changed when I finish all my work. This means I'm usually alone for at least 15 minutes in the basement of a strip mall, well after everyone else is gone. From the entire area, not just the restaurant. Because of this, I've heard strange noises and felt a presence behind me. And others have even mentioned being pushed down the stairs or have reported things being thrown down. We have cameras that look down the staircase and trust me, it's pretty weird to watch what happens. But the worst was that one night I was here alone until 2 a.m. doing a full inventory. The last employee left at 12.45. The building was locked down and there wasn't a single other person in the entire strip. But by 1.15, I heard a man and a woman arguing. The sounds were coming from the solid concrete walls. Around 1.30, I heard breathing coming up toward me, so I slammed the office door shut. That didn't stop the breath from coming up to my neck. I could feel pressure on my shoulders. That subsided at 1.50. At 2.10, I was getting changed in the storage room and took my bike out to set the alarm. The second I set the alarm, I hear the sounds of stomping boots running through the kitchen toward the back door, where I was currently in the process of getting out of there. I have never left a building so fast in all my life.
When I was in my late teens, early twenties, I was staying at a friend's house. It was a big and old house that didn't give off any weird vibes. That afternoon, I was walking through the living room, which was pitch black, curtains closed and no lights on. I ended up tripping on a vacuum cleaner. I was about to fall when I felt a hand on my chest push me back up. No one was there. I was a little freaked, but brushed it off and went on with my life. I went to bed later and woke up during the night to see a lady sitting at the end of my bed. She was wearing an old looking nurse uniform with a white bandana. She was just watching me. I didn't feel scared or unsafe. It was just a calm feeling. I closed my eyes and when I opened them again, she was gone. That morning, I told my friend and her parents about it. Her mother went to grab a book from the shelf full of old photos. Their house used to be a place where people would come to give birth, like a hospital, but specifically for birthing. While looking through the book, I saw a picture of the midwife that I had seen. It was an odd experience, but not at all creepy. I like to think that she was just making sure I was okay and was keeping me safe. My twin and I had adjoining bedrooms, and she had to enter my room to exit the house. We shared in experiences. If she got hurt, I would have sympathy pain. She would always come over to my bed in the night, complaining that she'd heard something or had a bad dream. One night, she called out to me, Sissy, can you come to my bed? I refused, and I told her to come to me. She replied that she couldn't, and begged me. I could hear in her voice that something was wrong. I got up and walked to the light switch to turn on the light, and I looked through her door. That was when I saw a tall, dark hooded figure at the foot of her bed. It turned and looked at me. There was no face, only a void. I immediately flipped the lights on, and it was gone. Before I could say anything, my sister asked, did you see it? Chills ran down my spine. She said, Did you see the tall dark thing at the foot of my bed? It's been watching me all night. I'm not a believer in ghosts, but I can't explain what we saw together that night, so many years ago. She's convinced it was something evil. To this day, I don't know. So in 2019, my family and I are driving back from Narrabeen when we drove on Wakehurst Parkway. There's a legend about that road that a lady in all white is on it. And if you're not careful, she can appear inside your car. So we're driving back at around 9 p.m. and we're in the thick bush area. My mother, brother, sister, and I were asleep. My father was all alone. According to my dad, he was driving when he saw a lady all in white on the side of the road. He freaked out, but continued driving on. But then he saw the same lady two minutes later on the same side of the road. My father told us he was so freaked out that he tried to drive faster. Two minutes later, the same lady. After we got home, he told us what he had seen, and personally, I couldn't sleep for a couple of nights. This happened over 30 years ago, so I'll explain the incident as best as I can remember. When I was three, my grandma on my maternal side died of a heart attack. While at the funeral, the adults were outside talking, smoking cigarettes, etc. 
Myself, my older brother, and another family member close to our age were told to stay inside to keep us out of conversations that we didn't need to hear, according to my parents. Well, the other family member convinced my brother that locking me in the viewing room with those red lights over the coffin on was a good idea. Once they locked me in, the other family member called through the door that grandma needed to take me with her because I was her favorite. I screamed and cried as loud as my little self could and some adults took me outside to my parents. I was told that they were just playing and that even though grandma loved me, she was never going to take me away. They were doing their best to soothe a very upset three-year-old. Later that year, we moved two states away from there. One night in the new house, four years later, I woke up in the middle of the night. According to my mom, this was very unusual. I heard a song that only my grandma sang to me. I sat up looking around and I see the lid on my old toy box opening by itself. Once it was fully open, I saw what looked like my grandma standing slowly from inside that box. She turned slowly and creepily around to look at me. I was frozen in place. I couldn't cry, I couldn't scream, I couldn't even move. Then she started walking toward me. She stepped close to the bed and said, I came to get you. You were always my favorite and now I want you to be with me. Somehow I found my voice and screamed. My mom came running in and just before she got to my room, my grandma said, I'll come back for you again and vanished. My mother came in asking who I was talking to. I told her everything. My mom let me sleep in the living room for a few nights while she got rid of my toy box. The toy box was the last thing my grandma had ever given me before she died. To this day, I have no idea what happened. All I know is that wasn't grandma. My family and I have always been animal lovers. I've never known a time when we didn't have cats or dogs with us, and I feel like they helped raise me. When my father was in college, he adopted two cats named Tigger and Cito. Tigger passed away due to a coyote, and after she passed, Cito was never the same. She was grumpy and preferred to be by herself, but I would annoy her with my love anyway. One night, I was carrying her in a wicker basket with some blankets. I would bring her room to room with me as I cleaned up. I'd been petting her and listening to her purr when she suddenly stopped moving. I was maybe 12, and I remember praying for the first time to bring her back to me. It was awful to bring her out to my mom and tell her she had passed. I had a tradition that whenever a pet died, I would make a concrete headstone with little marbles and their name on it. I had set it on our kitchen counter to dry and I left it there. The next morning I checked on it and found a small piece of her fur right in the center. I went around to everyone and asked if they had placed it there and they all said that they had not. It felt like she was giving me one last piece of her. I kept it in a tiny knick-knack tea kettle it lives there with a few of her whiskers that I had found weeks after her passing. I feel like she came to give me one last gift. My boyfriend passed at the end of March and I haven't felt his presence until lately. I'm pregnant and I've been in my nesting phase lately. I was setting up the bassinet and figuring out what sheets to buy, getting ready for bed. I put a blanket down in the bassinet because my cat likes to sit in it, not for when the baby gets here. And I looked out my window, which looks into my neighbor's closet. My neighbor has stained glass for privacy but I saw my boyfriend's silhouette in the window. 
I shook it off as somebody else in the closet, but when I looked back up a couple of minutes later, it was still there, with a hand pressed on the glass. I couldn't mistake it. It was him, down to the haircut. I started crying immediately. And then I smelled his scent and felt a warm, comforting feeling. It's been a couple of months since he passed, and I've always been sensitive to energy shifts and the paranormal. I found it weird that I hadn't felt his presence, but the closer I get to my due date, the more I feel him around. So first, a little context. My house was built in 1599 for a wealthy farming family. The house has had extensions from the Victorian era and most recently the 70s, but much of the original home remains. It was a couple of days ago, but I was in my living room, half watching the news and half on my phone. My dog, who is a very old and chilled back greyhound, suddenly jerks up from the sofa and looks directly to our window doors looking down at the garden. At the time, the curtains were closed, so I thought he maybe heard a fox or had been disturbed by a pesky fly or something. And because I know that dogs can sometimes sense ghosts, I joked, asking if Grandad had popped in to say hello. He was still staring, and then suddenly something tapped the back door quite loudly. Thinking it could be a fox after the chickens, I stood up and opened the curtains and looked out. Dark, but no fox. Then I heard it. It was almost like breathing. At first I thought it was the dog, but as I looked at him, he was facing the other way now. Yet still I heard breathing, quiet, but inside the room. I thought I had overreacted and it was my own breath, so I sat down. Yet, it persisted and got slightly louder, and then I felt dizzy. It was like it was getting more intense, but not louder. And it felt like that dizziness you get if you stand up too fast after sitting for a while. But that made no sense, as I had been on my feet and fine just moments ago. I don't know how to describe it, but it got worse, and I could feel myself panicking despite my best efforts to stay calm which, surprisingly to me, did not work. And soon it was too much. I went out of the room and upstairs into my own room, and I stayed there for the rest of the night. What made it even worse, though, was that while I sat there, trying to comprehend what had just happened, I heard footsteps right below me. I still can't explain it. I was driving home last night at about 1 a.m. It was already a full moon, so I was on high alert for any animals that might cross my path, as I drive through a very rural area that's mostly dense forest on either side of the road for miles to get back. Anyway, as I was turning a corner, a deer jumped out in front of me. I slammed on my brakes and honked the horn. The deer ran into the forest on the opposite side of the road, and I sped up rounding the corner. That's when the freaky stuff started happening. A tall white figure was standing at the edge of the woods. I didn't get a good look at it because looking at it felt wrong. So I sped up, but it had a human shape other than being about nine feet tall. I couldn't make out a face, but it was glowing slightly. After that, I sped up, hoping to get home as fast as possible and the whole way home after that incident, my car kept making weird noises, and my radio had way more static than usual. Does anyone know what this could have been? I was around 12 years old. It was during the summer when school was off. 
My parents would work during the day, so it was just me and my sister, home alone. One day we were in the basement watching a movie. I had to go to the bathroom. As I came out, I saw someone run into the storage room, which was between the stairs and the laundry room. I thought it was my sister hiding from me, so I started yelling her name as I approached the door. I looked in and I saw a white figure dash to the side from behind the furnace. I walked in and started yelling my sister's name again. I was just about to go look behind the furnace when my sister said, what? From right behind me. I asked her if she had just been in the storage room and she said no. I told my sister what happened and we were so scared we ran upstairs and spent the rest of the day hiding in our room until my parents came home. My name is Luna and I'm 35 years old and I'm a hospice nurse. I've been a hospice nurse for the last 10 years. This is a story about a young woman I took care of that I became very close to. The patient in question was 23 years old and was dying of liver cancer. She was given about six months when she was told she was terminal and was put on hospice. I started going to her house twice a week at first and we really liked each other. As she started slowly going downhill, I started coming more and more until I was there every day. Most of the time, we would just sit and talk. She was a very pretty girl with long black hair and blue eyes. She was very athletic and active before she got cancer, so not being able to do things for herself or get up and around without help was very hard for her. She always wore a minty smelling perfume, which I liked very much. I was with her the day she died, and that was a very hard day for me. I got home pretty late that day, and I made dinner for myself, and sat down in the living room in front of the television. I had been sitting there for about five minutes, when I smelled a minty smell that was just like my patient's perfume. Then I heard a cough, and a female voice call my name. I looked over toward the kitchen and there was my patient standing beside the kitchen counter. She just looked at me and she was smiling and then she waved and disappeared. I think it was just her way of saying she was okay. Sometimes to this day, I still feel like she's watching over me. Sometimes I still smell her perfume, especially if I've had a hard day. I've had a couple of ghost encounters that really messed me up, but this one in particular was the worst. My mom was dating this guy, who wasn't like a super country guy, but not like a normal country guy either. He also had a son, who I still stay in close contact with to this day. Basically, almost every Sunday, we would go out to my stepdad's mom's house. She lived in the middle of the woods, but not too secluded. Like, there were other houses in the area. But directly across the dirt road, there was this abandoned house that pretty much looked exactly what you would expect an abandoned house to look like. My stepbrother and I would go in there every once in a while just for fun, and we would see some pretty weird stuff. Like a random chair in the middle of a room, a cooler full of dead roses. But one day, we were headed in there like usual, but I took one step in and I wanted to throw up. My stepbrother kept going and was telling me it was fine and to just come in, but I was not going in there. A couple of minutes of talking go by and all of a sudden my brother's face turns pale as hell. He drops his water bottle and he runs out without saying a word. I follow him, asking him to slow down and he says that we're never going back in there again. When I asked why, he said that he heard a voice whisper in his ear and tell him to run. We never told our parents until like two years later. At the time, we were 12. And, true to his word, 
We never went back in there again. I used to work in a casino. One night, I was approached by an elderly woman, asking about paging someone over the intercom. I tried to explain where to go, but she insisted that I personally walk her to the desk where they can do that. As I walk her through the casino, she started talking to me. She mentioned that she was a medium and how her family has always strictly advised her against sharing that information with people. When you work at a casino, you encounter a lot of scammers and generally odd people. I was polite, but tried not to engage with her much on the topic. As we kept walking, she said something to me about my sister. I stopped and asked her how she knew my sister. She didn't, but started talking to me at great lengths about my family. At this particular time, my sister was going through a very difficult time in her life that was impacting our family as a whole. I was skeptical, but curious. As she went on, I was careful to neither confirm or deny anything, but just listen to what she had to say. She went into great detail about how my father, mother, and even I played into the current situation. She even became visibly emotional, as if she could feel what my mother was feeling. I was utterly astonished, as she told me that I, being the oldest and most diplomatic in my family dynamic, needed to be more outspoken with everyone involved. Everything she had told me was undeniably accurate and insightful, but then she shifted her focus. She told me about somebody I worked with and went into great detail about what this person looked like and how they felt about me. She talked about the dynamic between us and advised me to take caution. At this point, she had lost me, I couldn't think of a single person or relationship in my working life that fit that description. I began becoming more skeptical again, and I reminded her that I needed to get back to work and to keep walking toward our destination. She kept talking to me as we walked, and I began to once again find myself astonished, not just to what she was telling me, but also how she would go about it. Her body language, expressions, her emotional energy, as we got closer, she abruptly stopped walking. When I noticed, I did as well, and I turned back to her. Before I could say anything, she placed her palm at the base of my sternum, above my belly button, just below where my rib cage started. I immediately noticed a physical sensation. I became paralyzed and almost felt like she was stealing the breath from my body. I started becoming hyper aware of my surroundings, the lights and dings from the electronic games, the mass amounts of people walking by, but everything seemed to be in slow motion, almost like I was leaving my body. It could have only been a few seconds, it could have been 20 minutes, I don't know. But I felt as if I couldn't breathe, and I felt weak in my knees. I started to feel like I was on the verge of passing out. Casino security saw this encounter and approached us, when security interrupted us to ask what was going on, it must have startled her, because I felt this shockwave through my entire body. She jerked her hand back and began apologizing profusely to me. As soon as she pulled her hand back, I was able to breathe again and gain control of my body. I was completely freaked out. It must have been visible because security kept asking me if I was okay. I assured them that everything was fine and they walked off. I turned back to the woman who was still apologizing, and she said, if you don't do something about that ulcer, it's going to kill you. I was so freaked out, but I told her thanks that I had to get back to work now, and I quickly headed back to my office. Not only was I in a bizarre headspace, but I was noticeably completely void of physical energy. The entire experience was the most profound encounter of my life, and I will never forget those words or the physical sensation. I was having a lot of stomach issues at the time, but I was way too afraid to get medical verification of an ulcer. I had already previously suspected it, and it was a potential side effect of the medication I was on at the time. But if that wasn't bizarre enough on its own, 
it gets even weirder. The encounter happened nearly 10 years ago, and it has sat with me ever since. But recently, I was reflecting back on it. I realized that the second part about the co-worker, the part that initially made no sense at all, all of a sudden did. That entire situation played out in my life a few years ago. The description of the person and the very specific details were 100% spot on from what was described to me 10 years prior. I even realized that the entire situation was initiated nearly seven years to the day from the moment that this woman described it to me. Not only were the two incidents separated by seven years, but the person she had described I hadn't even met yet and was in an entirely different state at a whole other company at the time. I don't really know what to make of this. I'm open to this kind of thing, but I've always approached these situations skeptically. Still, I would love to hear what anyone else has to say about it and see what you might think it was. I had two friends named James and Sarah. Their basement was super creepy and a lot of weird things happened there. This is one of them. It was a random summer night just like any other, with the exception of some of the hauntings they had experienced getting more frequent and bolder, I guess you could say. James was watching TV downstairs while Sarah was taking a shower upstairs. While James was watching TV, he saw what he thought was smoke, but it was in the shape of a person. It passed right between him and the TV. He didn't really give it much thought and assumed he was just seeing things. A few moments later, he heard a shriek and then what sounded like somebody running down the stairs, but only stepping on about every third step. It was Sarah, wearing only shorts and a sports bra. She bolted out of the house into her mom's house which was the house in the front of the lot. James chased her to find out what was wrong. She finally calmed down and said, I finished my shower and I was laying on my back, playing on my phone. My feet were dangling off the edge of the bed. I thought I heard the bedroom door creak open a bit. I thought it was you, but no one was there. That's when I felt somebody grab my ankles and try to pull me off the bed. That's why I ran out of the house. They did not stay in the house that night. Sarah actually had bruises around her ankles in the shape of fingerprints. That house is creepy. They told me that at any given time in the night, you can hear people talking in the empty rooms. Shadow people peer around the doorways. Things move or disappear randomly all the time. James even caught a picture once of that smoke while there was nothing in the room. In one of the pictures, the smoke even has a face. I've no idea what's going on in that house, but I don't know how they live there. We used to have a mimic when I was in college. People would hear or see me or my husband when we weren't there. After moving to our apartment in another state, we didn't have many experiences and assumed that it had stayed with the house. A couple of months ago, we moved into a different apartment and we've been having some odd occurrences. Things are moved around and reorganized. We hear or see each other when we aren't there. Stuff we used to see in our old place. The mimic has always been kind of helpful, so we don't really mind having it around. The first weekend in our new place, my shoes were organized without either of us touching them. Stuff I needed has popped up on the counters in plain sight. This morning, I was brushing my teeth as my husband was making coffee, and I heard him say, We're almost out of milk. I assumed he meant creamer, since we don't have regular milk in the house and he was making coffee. When I went to make a cup, surely enough, we were almost out of creamer. I went into the home office and asked my husband if he had meant creamer before, 
when I heard him say we were low on milk, and he just gave me this weird face. He insisted that he never said that. My friendly neighborhood mimic, I guess, just wanted me to be prepared when I was going to make a cup of coffee. My boyfriend of five years has crushed on me for probably 12 or 13 years. He was two grades below me and was a bad boy, while I was popular and in all honors and college level classes, so I wasn't aware he existed, until I met him at my dad's business about seven years ago. He apparently talked about me being his dream girl and teased that it would never happen, so that's why I mention this. In 2009, he and his best friend, I'll call him Josh, were getting into pills due to Josh's grandfather being an amputee and unable to properly attend to or understand the hiding of medications, thus leaving large amounts of all kinds of drugs just lying around. This was before the opiate crisis that has affected my generation deeply in the last 15 years. Two days before Christmas in 2009, Josh overdosed in the bedroom that my boyfriend is currently staying in. It's a long story, but we moved back to our respective families because we were laid off during the pandemic and were in a bad wreck, losing the extra car. The room has never felt spooky, never anything strange about it. But I've had a few pranks pulled on me that we believe Josh does to basically congratulate my boyfriend on being with the woman that he waited for. I've woken up to sticky notes completely covering my body, my drinks poured on the floor, and random objects moved right where I exit the bed so that I step on them first thing in the morning. I swear I've heard giggling. Each time, I've angrily asked my boyfriend if he was messing with me, and I know when he's lying. He always says no. We like to think that it's Josh playing practical jokes, something he was well known for. But this is nothing compared to what Josh did for me in 2017. It wasn't a prank. It saved my life. Four years ago, I went into anaphylactic shock. I lost all ability to speak or move my lower body. I was upstairs with a curved and steep staircase, separating me from my phone. I remember crawling to the stairs, knowing it could be fatal if I smashed into the wall that the stairs led to before the turn, with very large, steep steps. I know I was extremely oxygen deprived, but I immediately saw Josh and two of my deceased best friends ascend the stairs and carry me to the living room couch with my nebulizer and cell phone. I called 911, but I had no voice. My friends were gone, except Josh. He told me he was going to wake my boyfriend from the hammock in the back of the yard. And suddenly, my boyfriend dreamed of his friend saying that I was in trouble. My boyfriend came running into the house, and by this point, I was dying. I could no longer use any part of my body, and no air came into my lungs when I inhaled. I remember thinking of my daughter and praying that her father would navigate my loss and that he would keep memories of me alive. He actually died in a freak accident eight months ago, so now I'm fulfilling that for him, but I digress. I struggled to remain conscious, but I was fading. My boyfriend saw the 911 operator on the phone and my sweaty blue body. He told him he didn't think I was breathing, and by some absolute miracle, there was an ambulance passing by my neighborhood. The hospital and dispatch were 30 minutes away. This coincidence, plus my boyfriend's sudden premonition that I was hurt, saved my life. Josh and those EMTs saved my life. I remember the EMT asking my boyfriend if I had overdosed. I hadn't. And I thought of how Josh had died. I was blabbering on about dead people saving me after a large amount of epinephrine, so no wonder they thought I was high. The doctors and EMT were baffled at how I managed to get down those stairs, or even stay alive long enough to get help. I had one bruise on my leg, which was tiny, and that was it, other than the worst headache I've ever had. Turns out I'm allergic to the latex spray paint that we were using. I told them that I slid down the stairs, but that's not how I remember it. The weird thing is, I had never met Josh when he was alive. I don't know how I recognized him or hallucinated him or whatever, but he looked exactly like the picture I was shown. 
I've had a lot of paranormal encounters, but my run-in with Josh saved my life, and he never even knew me. So, thanks Josh for giving me more time on this earth, and I wish we had met many years before. I do hope he's resting peacefully, just periodically popping in to check on us. Back in 2000, when I was 20, a friend of mine, a 19-year-old female, decided she wanted to get an apartment and asked if I would be her roommate. I didn't really need a place to stay, but I decided to do it anyway. We moved to a nice apartment complex right next to and behind the house where my aunt saw her dead ex-boyfriend. The place was nice and newer, so the thought of it being haunted never crossed my mind. I didn't even experience anything, until my roommate got homesick a month in and had to move back in with her folks, leaving me there alone for three months. It started with the lights coming on by themselves. I would go to bed, always turning the lights off and always closing my bedroom door. I was meticulous about the lights, because that's how I was raised. I would go to bed, and at some point, I'd open my eyes and see light coming in under the door. I thought my roommate came home, so I would get out of bed excited to see her, only to discover that I was still alone and the dining room or bathroom light would be on. Then the knocking started. Right after I would lay down, there would be three loud knocks on my bedroom door. Again, thinking my roommate came home, I'd get up to greet her, only to find that I was still entirely alone. A week or so before Christmas, my roommate and I went out gift shopping and went back to the apartment to wrap everything. When we were done, we were both standing at the door, checking to see if we had everything before leaving. The apartment was completely quiet, and we heard this very clearly. My acoustic guitar, which I had leaned up against the wall in my bedroom with the pick stuck between three strings, was plucked, each string in succession then slid along the wall until hitting the floor. We just looked at each other, then walked to my bedroom to find the guitar on the floor with the pick still stuck between the strings. Those strings had been plucked, meaning the pick had been used and then replaced when done. At Christmas, during a party with her and some other friends at the apartment, the VCR turned itself off. It did that one or two other times while I was living there, but never before or after. For Christmas, my girlfriend got me a guitar tablature book for Pink Floyd's The Wall. One night, I sat on the floor of my bedroom learning how to play a song in it. When I was done, I put the pick in the strings and set my guitar up on the wall. But instead of closing the book as I normally did, I left it open and went to bed. Just after laying down, I heard the pages in the book flipping on their own. It was a thick book, but the song I had been learning was somewhere in the middle. I figured that the weight of the pages made it change pages on its own. But when they stopped flipping, I got curious and got up to look. The pages had stopped flipping on the song, Hey You, and when I read the title, I got chills and shut the book, pleaded with the ghost to let me sleep, and went back to bed. While laying there, I realized that if the pages had flipped on their own from the weight, they would have gone in the other direction, away from that song. After that, I started calling the ghost Pink. Anytime something happened, I would just say, Oh, hey, Pink. But one night, I had been out with a friend until around 2 o'clock in the morning. When I opened my door, I stepped in, and I could feel the ghost standing there. I said, Oh, hi, Pink. And I could feel the energy go through me and out of the apartment. That's when I figured it didn't like being called that, which didn't stop me from saying it. Shortly after, my roommate came back and stayed the rest of the lease. Not much happened then. I figured if an entire house could be haunted, then surely an entire apartment building could be. I wanted to ask my neighbors if they ever experienced anything, but I never did 
and actually, I never really talked to them at all. To answer some questions you might have, my roommate and I were and still are really good friends. We never dated, never slept together. She was also really good friends with my girlfriend, and it was my girlfriend who told her to ask me to move in with. Also, I've known since I was around 10 or so that I could feel ghosts, but usually only when standing right where they were. If I stand with them long enough, I usually get an image in my head of what they look like, as well as their mood. In a few instances, I've had them communicate with me like that, their words coming to me as thoughts or images, usually the latter. I typically don't tell people this, because they usually don't believe me, and I would rather not go through with the ridicule and name-calling. However, with Pink, I never figured out who or what it was. I always felt that it was a male, but I didn't know. I still wonder about it from time to time. I have absolutely no memory of this experience, but my mom does, and she told me the story. I was a little over two years old and had just started to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story about three years ago when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until Judgment Day or something like that. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits to haunt houses. Even over 30 years later, she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman, who always talks way too loudly, was literally whispering by the end of it. And she was white as a sheet. I believed her completely, and I still do. My mom never talks about stuff like this. I'm just glad that I can't remember it. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, who we'll call Victor. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to the town from there. My mom said the first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, Don't like mean house. Mean house. Ugly house. Don't like. Scary house, mama. Don't like. My mom says this behavior was extremely out of character for me, but I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now this house was ramshackle and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house, and, until recently before we moved in, still had a working ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in, causing a lot of damage. A lot of this damage wasn't fixed, so my young, broke parents got a very cheap rental agreement. Gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed that the only fire damage left was in the kitchen, since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level. Either way, the landlord was adamant that that room was off limits, and my parents always respected that. I would have looked, a hundred percent. I know all of this because I heard stories about the crappy farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it, and both of my parents have told me that it did give them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our pit Doberman mix boss. She was hanging laundry and I was just rolling around with the dog. She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, Boss started going absolutely ape from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards from the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two, running toward my mom, then turning and running back to the pond, barking frantically the whole time. That's when my mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. 
She took off toward the water at full speed. Boss beat her there and drug me out of the water himself. Thanks, Popper. Love you. Although my mom was confused as to how I'd gotten so far so fast, and how I had ended up in the center of the pond, since it was way over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she just underestimated me and brought in the baby gates and playpens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside, Victor was asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door and one at the top of the stairs. The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen to hear us crying or fussing while she cooked. My mom said that no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, Boss started going crazy again in the yard. She runs up to check on us. Victor's still sleeping. Every baby gate is shut and locked, but I am not in my room. A frenzied search revealed that I wasn't in the house at all. A sudden image of Boss saving me from drowning caused my mom to rush outside to see what he was trying to tell her this time. She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off toward the right, away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around and bark at my mother and wait for her to catch up a little before racing off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from the neighbors. He led her to a thick stand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat and her stomach full of ice. She said that she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking under a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket, where the tree cover was denser. She said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grizzly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently, our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, had been illegally slaughtering cattle and hiding the remains in at least one of the few thick stands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket, just standing there, looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything. I was just standing. She rushed over to me, and after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began questioning me on why I was there and how I'd gotten there. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking at a very young age, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said that I told her, with that serious look that only small children can give, that the children had brought me there. Shitting her pants a little at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her, through the kitchen, get me from upstairs, walk right back past her on the way down the stairs and out with me, all the way over here, she demanded to know what children and where the hell they were now. I looked at her dead serious and told her, the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs, I don't see them anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children. However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there, staring at her, with a serious expression and my mouth closed. She said the same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me. So she was always left wondering, and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was flat impossible. She says there's no way I could have even known it was out there, much less have had the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs, past her, and end up almost two miles down the road, all in under 15 minutes. I was only two, and as slow and clumsy as most toddlers. 
As I said, she's still shaken by it after 30 years. Personally, I have no idea what happened that day. I've thought about hypnosis, but haven't decided if I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery. Because whatever those things were, I really don't think they were children. These experiences happened two to three years ago. I was around 13 to 14 at the time. The first experience occurred to me and my younger sister. It was around nine o'clock at night, not too late, but we were folding clothes and I heard a faint knock. I asked my sister if she had heard the knock, but she said no. I just shook it off because I thought it might have been a relative or something. But about 10 minutes later, we hear the knock again, and this time my sister heard it too. This time it was way louder. I mean, you might think that that's not scary or creepy, but the knock came from our window, and the window is only accessible to someone in the home, because the window is in our backyard and no outsider has access to the backyard. We immediately bolted out of the room because we were frightened. The next experience happened only to me. It was also around 9 p.m. at night, and I had gone into the kitchen for a cup of water. While I was pouring water, I heard a loud knock on the living room window. I got so scared that I yelled for my mom, who was in the other room at the time. She checked outside, but all she found was a rock. Everyone who lived in the house at the time said that someone had gotten a rock and thrown it at the window as a joke, but I disagreed. I disagreed because the rock that my mom found was only in our front yard, and our front yard gate was closed at the time. You need a key to be able to open it. I don't know though. What do you guys think? Was it a ghost or a person? I was probably 10 to 12 years old, and my friend, I'll call him Bill, and I, were going over to another friend's house, I'll call him Jake, for a sleepover. I'll keep this brief, but this has always stuck with me, and I felt like sharing. We were all hanging out in the living room in the late afternoon. I wanted a drink, so I walked into Jake's kitchen. When you walked in, there was a table to your immediate right. I think it was Jake's birthday or something, so there were some balloons tied to the chairs. I looked over and I saw an old man sitting in one of the chairs. At least I thought I did. I only saw him for a split second, and I assumed I was just seeing things. Never mentioned it to my friends because it was honestly just a, oh, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye kind of thing. An hour or so went by, and Bill went to the kitchen for some food or whatever. When he came back, he told Jake and I that he saw a man sitting at the kitchen table. I got so excited because this was a damn sleepover and now we had ghosts involved. I told them that I thought I had seen the same thing earlier, and Jake said it sounded like his dead grandfather. Later that night, Jake's dad was working at the kitchen table before going to his bedroom. Once he was out of there, I went back to get some food, and I saw him still sitting at the table. I literally turned to ask, didn't you just leave? But there was nobody there. Some other things happened after that, but I kind of chalked those things up to our overactive imaginations given the first thing. I have two reasons, though, to believe that this wasn't a ghost. Number one, maybe we mistook one of the balloons for a human head. Totally possible. Number two, maybe I did tell my friends what I saw the first time, and I'm just blocking that part out of my memory. This would make what Bill said seem totally unbelievable, because he was younger than me and probably just wanted attention. But I'm 90% sure I never said anything to them, because I really didn't think anything of it when I first saw it. The balloon thing has been my main theory. I'm not a believer or a disbeliever in the paranormal. This is the only story I have that could have been paranormal. But 
it's really hard to tell what happened. Last Thursday, in the early morning, my dog passed away. It was really hard on the family, and it was especially hard on me. I remember after the at-home euthanasia company picked her up, I sat down where she had last laid, and I just cried my eyes out. I remember wishing out loud that I could hold her one more time, to play with her, to pet her, to run around and just enjoy her company. After I felt better composed, I got up and spent the remainder of my afternoon looking at pictures of her with my girlfriend. Later that night, my mom came home and mentioned that there was a stray in the front yard. Although I was still grieving, I wanted to make sure that the dog outside got the right owner. Thankfully, it didn't take much to help out. She was timid, but a few treats sealed the deal. She came into my backyard willingly, and I started posting around to find the owner. She enjoyed my company from the get-go. She encouraged us to pet her and hug her. She latched onto me like a newborn puppy and followed me throughout the backyard. We weren't confident enough to let her in the house, so she slept outside. She slept, by choice, in the same spot that my dog would sleep. Apparently, the dog had been spotted at our neighborhood park and a family had been trying to get her for the past few days. They tried everything, food, treats, snacks, but she wouldn't budge. The family asked how I managed to get her to come to me, and I just said that it didn't take much. They took her off my hands and checked her into the nearest vet. She left willingly and didn't look back. She was wagging her tail until she passed my block. I can't take her in, because honestly, I'm not ready for a dog yet. However, it's crazy how a brief moment with this dog eased me in so many ways. Everyone I tell mentions that my dog probably sent over a guardian dog to ease me. That stray came to me readily and let me pet her, hold her, play with her, things no one else could get her to do. It's the last few things that I wish to do with Bay before she passed on, and I don't think that that's a coincidence. I was working a part-time job at a church at the time of this event, and it was at the end of the day, so I was cleaning up and getting ready to lock it up for the day. For context, this church is very old, and there are graves on the property that date from the 1860s. The place has burned down twice. I go to the church's kitchen to grab my lunch bag from the fridge, and when I walk through the door, out of the corner of my eye, I see a woman at the counter to my right. I thought it was my boss, but the fridge was straight ahead, so I walked forward and grabbed my stuff. I turned around and there was no one there. I was alone in the kitchen and the door didn't open, but there was someone there. I made a conscious effort not to look because I'm kind of socially awkward. I thought about it and realized, wait, that woman was wearing a white dress with a pink floral pattern on it. How on earth could that have been my boss? She only ever wears jeans and sweaters. I kind of freaked out and I went inside and locked up the church. And I told my friend about it who's been going to the church for a long time. I didn't tell him what she was wearing, just that I had seen a woman that I didn't recognize. He told me that people like to joke about the church being haunted, but that there was no way I saw a ghost in broad daylight like that. It was the light playing tricks on me. Sure. After my job was done, I forgot all about the interaction, until I got a text from my friend. It said, Bro, was that woman you saw working at the counter wearing a white dress with a pink floral pattern? I never described the clothing to him. So we both saw the same woman in the kitchen cooking. Our theory is that back in the day, the women would do all the work in the kitchen for church services. She must have been buried on the church grounds, and she was just there, working in the kitchen for decades or even a century. 
continuing on with the work she had always done. To start off, I'm not really a believer in the paranormal. I mean, sure, creepy things do happen, but never to the point of me thinking that it was definitely a ghost or whatever. But one night, a few days ago, it was nearly midnight, and I was on my bed, thirsty during a heat wave. So I get up, ready to get a Gatorade, and I open my door. I see this black and brown shadow figure. It was crouching was six to seven feet tall, and zoomed across my living room into my dining room. To top things off, my cat saw it, definitely, because the cat reacted. So I go get my Gatorade, cause ain't no demon gonna stop me from quenching my thirst, and I get back to my room and think about it. It couldn't have been my door, it opens inward, and it couldn't have been one of my cats. Here's the worst part. My stepdad lived in a house with some paranormal stuff going on. I thought maybe it followed him. Maybe he brought some kind of demon into the house. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm haunted. I really don't know. But another experience was at my dad's house. I was in my room at the end of the hall, and I heard the slider in the kitchen open. Keep in mind it's at night, and everyone is in their respective rooms. So, being the guy I am, I take out a pocket knife and investigate. As soon as I open my bedroom door, the bathroom door next to my room slams shut. Now, I don't know if this could be connected to the first story, but it was really, really creepy nonetheless. I have no idea what's going on, but that's my story. This happened in mine and my husband's first house, several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born, but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery. For the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet, but we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving nightlights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall, moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures, and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me, and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So, what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters. But my husband sort of grabbed my arm, not hard, but firm, and he whispered, What the hell? while looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m. and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. I did and he handed me another smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. 
My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911, and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door, so when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son, and sit. I was just rocking him, back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer. Not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable, still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up, but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier, and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first. I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved, and I hugged him and I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, let's go back to our room, or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out, saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better, but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house, really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again. This time, I was wary of the room, though. I couldn't help but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there. But I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. At first he sort of smiled, but then in all sincerity he said, maybe it's a ghost. I said, excuse me? He didn't elaborate. Probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing at least not in our house, and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it, though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel, have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone, and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident, the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious, that if he thought our house was haunted, we should go, now, back to his mom's. Then we, somehow, just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home, and I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. My husband put our son down in his room and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. I remember laying there, sort of nodding off as we watched some late-night TV. Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway, but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit, before I'm wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, Whoa, what's wrong? but I just turn his head to the upstairs, and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning, rapidly, 
or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room, because we heard it externally, but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled, and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside, he's got a handful of stuff, and without a word, he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep, as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling, because he, my not-scared-of-anything husband, was terrified. He said, we're going to stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place. It's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable. Trying to get more out of him, but having a hard time with it, he finally said, It opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts, and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there, and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, handed over the keys, and haven't really looked back, other than to talk about Remember When, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house. Not even a little bit. So this happened a week ago, and my whole family is still kind of freaked out about it. Our last upstairs neighbors moved out about six months ago, and the house had been empty until about two months ago. We put it at about that time that we first detected the presence of our new neighbors. Now, we were close with the first family who had lived there, and they were tenants. They were moving out because they had bought a house of their own and we had even helped them with the process. This is an important detail, because on their last day there, I remember as clear as day my mother asking them if the original owner had found somebody else to rent it out. They replied that they hadn't, as far as they knew. We had never met the owner. The incident that I'm about to describe was all the more surprising, considering we had never seen a mover's truck or any other items being unloaded and moved, but we just chalked that up to our own ignorance. We lived in a huge apartment complex, after all. These things happen. Fast forward a month later, and we were already annoyed by their presence. We would hear loud footsteps, both running and walking, in the middle of the night, sometimes extending to the wee hours of the morning, the creaking of heavy furniture being dragged, weird scurrying noises, like there was an animal with them, and on some particularly nasty days, even steel vessels being dropped, a ball being dribbled, a glass marble bouncing, or the ringing sound of a coin being dropped before it settled, and many other sounds we could never identify, but you get the idea. In case you haven't gleaned from this point on already, the walls here are pretty thin. On this particularly chilling day last week, it was about 11 p.m. at night. That's when we heard the first set of knocks. It was just a tiny rap of three, one quickly after the other. And you couldn't have heard it unless you were really quiet. They weren't so much knocks made with fists as someone using an object to probably tap on the floor repeatedly. So when that first set came, we were surprised, because it was pretty late in the night and we weren't expecting anybody everyone was home. 
We waited a while, and when we didn't hear anything again, we shrugged and thought it was a prank or a mistake and went back to doing our own thing. For context, we were not in the living room opposite where our front door was. We were at the other end of the house. So these knocks were louder than what you would expect to hear in case somebody really was at the front door. Half an hour later, we hear, yet again, another set of knocks, this time five, each one oddly drawn out and increasingly heavy. This is when we realized that it was coming from upstairs. Now, you have to realize that this did not phase us in the slightest. They were habitually noisy, so while we did freeze for a moment or two, we just carried on. At about this time, my parents start talking about how this was their last straw, and the next time they were to even so much as move, they would get put on blast on our building's WhatsApp group. The next and final set came an hour later. It was just two this time. Except they sounded less like knocks and more like sacks of beats being dropped. I think I even heard something tiny roll after that second one. But I'm not sure about that part. At this point, it was around 12.30 in the morning, and my mother really did lose it. She did what she had promised to do. She posted for all to see how rude our neighbors were, and how inconsiderate and inconveniently loud, and she went back to sleep. Now this is where things get really weird. My mom awoke to a flurry of messages asking her who she was talking about. One lady who lived on the same floor as our neighbors told my mom that nobody had moved in there after the last ones had left. On hearing this, we were all very alarmed and upset because the four of us couldn't have imagined the exact same things, right? My father completely flipped and banged on the door countless times, to no avail. We did consider the possibility of squatters, but we could never verify because the owner wasn't in town, and we would be breaking and entering if we tried to see for ourselves. We were convinced that it was very much real, and had a perfectly rational explanation. But after that day, we didn't hear a single noise, and the paranoia had very much set in, so we were always on our guard, ready in wait for when they slipped up. It's been a week now, and I can't tell if we just experienced the weirdest glitch for two entire months, or if something else is going on, so make of it what you will. Nobody believes us. Some even questioned why we put up with them for that long if we genuinely believed that they were a nuisance to us. And we don't really know how to answer that one. Maybe high tolerance? Maybe it's ghosts or some kind of haunting, but there's never been any issue with that before. Maybe it's a glitch in the Matrix, and they're from a parallel universe or something. Either way, it seems that our upstairs neighbors aren't real, and we have no idea what to do about it. Over the weekend, I was out of dental floss. I can't stand that. So I looked around for a forgotten roll. I looked in my son's bathroom as well. Nothing. On Tuesday night, my son and I went shopping and I picked up a floss, Tom's, that I had never tried before. I grabbed one because I'm very picky about floss and I was not sure whether or not I would like it. My son then asked if he could get one too, and of course I said yes. We go home and my son unpacks the groceries. The two boxes of floss are on the counter. I take mine upstairs, unwrap it, throw the box in the bathroom trash, and try it that night. I hated it. Last night I go to floss again and there is now a second one in the drawer. The exact same. I think, well that's weird. Why did my son bring his floss into my bathroom? But I forgot about it because sometimes he uses my bathroom, so whatever. This evening, I'm cleaning up the kitchen, and there's his dental floss, on the counter, unopened. I go back upstairs. There are still two flosses in the drawer. They're both completely new except that the one that I have used has, of course, a slightly smaller roll 
The containers are transparent so you can see it. But I had never tried that kind before and I only bought one. So how did I end up with two? I hate to admit it, but I have often read accounts of things like this happening with more skepticism. I always figured that people just forgot that they had two of something because the items are so often insignificant. But here I am, in the possession of a mystery floss. I'm kind of honored and excited by the possibilities of what this could mean, but that's my glitch story. One time I was in Russia. It was the first time that I had ever traveled there and I was 19. It was actually Ukraine. I found a bar that I thought was so cool. I met a girl there and we went back to her flat and hooked up. Six years later, I went to the exact same bar. I met another chick and I went home with her. Only it wasn't another chick. It was the same one as before. I didn't realize it until I was at her apartment. We hooked up and I left with my hair standing on end. She spoke Ukrainian, I didn't. I don't even know if she recognized me, and it wasn't like I could ask her, so... There was a guy named Nikolai as well, and I met him on both trips too. The first time I met him at a bar. The other time I ran into him on some side street one day when I visited for the second time. This is the second biggest city in Crimea, with a population of over 330,000 people. What the hell are the chances of this happening twice? Interesting. This happened about 20 years ago, when I was 16, but I remember it like it just happened because it freaked me out so badly. I've never seen anything like it before, and I wouldn't have believed it if somebody had told me the story, but I witnessed it myself and I have never been able to find a logical explanation. I was a huge boring nerd, and I still am, so I was lying in bed reading The Complete Idiot's Guide to Learning Latin. You can look it up online to see how it looks. Big orange and white book with black print, like textbook sized. I heard my mom call to me from the living room. So I sat up and glanced around for something to use as a bookmark, since I was always very careful with my books and refused to dog ear the pages. I didn't see anything handy, and my mom called for me again. So I knelt down next to my bed and carefully tented the book on the floor at a steep angle so the spine wouldn't take damage. Then I opened my door and walked out. Our house was a three bedroom, but not very big. When I walked out of my room, I turned left and went down the hallway past my brother's bedroom door, which was closed. He had a habit of pacing his room while he talked on the cordless phone, and I could hear him doing just that as I walked by. At the end of the hallway, I turned to look into the living room, but I didn't leave the hall. My mom was sitting on the couch with her boyfriend, and she looked over and asked if I knew where the remote was. I said I didn't, and she said, okay, so I walked back to my room. I was gone maybe 45 seconds at the max. I walked in, closed the door, and turned to walk over and pick up my Latin book, but there was nothing there. It was gone. It was so unexpected and impossible that I just froze. It was like my brain couldn't come up with any possible actions to take in this situation. So I just stood there, staring blankly. There were only four people in the house, one of which was me. My brother never left his room during those 45 seconds. I'd have heard his bedroom door open, and I'd have heard him stop talking. He has a very deep, rumbly voice. My mom and her boyfriend were getting ready to watch a movie in the living room. Even if one of them had tried to pull a weird random prank by taking my book, they wouldn't have had time to pull it off. 
unless they'd literally been running, which I would have seen and heard. And it's not like anyone could have broken in and taken it. The previous owners had been burglarized once, so they had a burglar bar installed on all the windows and doors. Our joking nickname for the house was Fort Knox. Besides, what thief would come in and steal a Latin book? All this was running through my mind while I stood there staring. After a few minutes, I decided my mind must be playing tricks on me. I know the human brain can ignore information right in front of it if it decides it isn't important for some reason, which is how we can miss seeing something in plain view. I was amazed to have an awareness of the phenomenon in real time, and I marveled over how strange the brain is. I started to slowly approach the spot on the floor while staring at it, wanting to see the moment when the book would appear to materialize there as my mind stopped being stupid. But it didn't happen. I thought, all right, well, my eyes are playing tricks on me, but my hands won't. And I crouched down and swept my hands across that spot on the floor where the book should be. I felt nothing, just the carpet. I was totally shocked because my mind is playing tricks was the only reasonable explanation that I'd had. And now that was out. Had I completely imagined the crystal clear memory of tenting the book on the floor? After a few more moments of staring and rubbing my hands all over the floor, I decided that was the only other possible explanation. I must have actually put the book somewhere else. I got up and proceeded to tear my room apart. I pulled blankets and pillows off the bed, combed through both of my bookshelves, opened desk drawers and dresser drawers, shook out clothing, even opened my closet and practically turned it inside out. Every few seconds I would stare back at that spot on the floor, but it was empty. After close to an hour of searching, I finally laid down to peer underneath my dresser. Nothing. Then I sat up, shaking my head in defeat. There was nowhere left to look. I glanced back one more time at the spot on the floor. The book was there, exactly where I thought it had been, tented just how I had left it. I froze up again, breathless, feeling like I had just been electrocuted. How the... After I unfroze, I gingerly picked it up and looked at the page it was open to. Same page that I'd been on when I put it down. It was as though the past hour had never happened, except that now my room was trashed. Where in the world did my book go? And how did it come back? I have four kids. I know that I have four kids, but recently I just feel like there should be another one, but they're missing. When we go out, I head count and I get flustered because I can't find the extra one. I have to consciously remind myself that there are only four, but my heart just doesn't believe it. I had just put it down as one of those weird feelings and I pushed it aside. Then, my parents sent money to my kids. They sent $100 to each kiddo. They sent me $500. I called them and asked them why they had put in so much, and they were confused and said that they told me they were sending $100 per child. I reminded them that I only have four kids. They were silent for a moment, and then just kind of laughed, and said they must be getting old, because they thought there were five. Then tonight, my daughter walked into the lounge room. She looked around and said, I know we're all here, but our family feels small. My son agreed. I hadn't said anything to anybody about my feelings lately because they already think I'm ancient and forgetful at 40. I don't really know what this means, but it's definitely strange. And apparently it's not just me. Does anyone else ever have these feelings? Was my other kid lost in a glitch? I don't know what it could be.
I'm not sure if this is considered a glitch, but most nights, and I mean not every night, I can hear people talking. I can never fully hear what they're saying, but I hear people chatting back and forth. I wish I could say I hear the same people talking, but every time I hear them, it's not always the same voices. I do live in a building with four other tenants, but the thing is, I usually hear this chattering at odd hours of the night. It's when my well-known neighbors are asleep. I work in a kitchen, and I usually don't get home from work until at least 1am, so I'm usually up until about 6. I could chalk it up to spiritual activity, but it doesn't feel like that. It's almost like I'm hearing a life that I've lived somewhere else or that other people have lived here over the years. Like I'm hearing things from other dimensions or past times. It may be odd to say, and I'm okay with being completely wrong, but it's as if the memories of these walls are speaking at night. The word is that the building I live in used to be a bed and breakfast, so this place definitely has some stories and has seen a lot of different faces in its day. It would make sense that I would be hearing different voices every time, but it's really interesting to me. I am very interested in learning about what it is I'm experiencing, so if you have any ideas, let me know. In June of 2007, I was at the hospital at 1 in the morning because my friend got his fingers caught in a taxi door, and one was visibly broken. The wait in the emergency room was long, and the vending machine didn't have any coke. The receptionist told me that there was another machine in the next building, which was always stocked because it's not as busy. The receptionist gave me the directions, and I exited the A&E department walked down two long corridors and an enclosed bridge which connected the two buildings and got to the other end. When I got to the other end of the bridge and opened the double doors, I was back at the emergency room entrance, which was impossible because I would have had to double back on myself. And to add, it was probably six minutes of walking. I've never been able to explain this. Everyone I've ever told has said that I must have been drunk or tired. Sure, I might have been tired, but I was not drunk because I was driving. I wish I could have found a way to get a CCTV of that night. I still can't really explain it, other than a glitch. I am a 30-year-old male. When I was in my early 20s, I had a strange encounter with a man who claimed to be from my future. I'm not entirely sure that this could be considered a glitch. However, this incident was definitely peculiar and I haven't been able to completely forget about it since. Admittedly, some details are now hazy as this happened to me over 10 years ago but I have tried my hardest to remember as much information as I could in hopes of getting some closure. Around 2011, I was taking Japanese night classes once per week at a local university here in the UK. At the time, my classes would finish at around 9 p.m., and I would usually return home via train. I was still living with my parents back then, and I distinctly remember having a small window of time to catch the infrequent night train back to my hometown after my lessons would end. It was winter, and I recall the station being busy with Christmas shoppers. I had unfortunately missed my usual train, and had to wait over an hour for the next arrival. I was looking up at the live departure board with frustration, when I was approached by a friendly American man in his early to mid 40s. I remember that he was underdressed for the weather, or even the season, as it had been snowing for days and was particularly cold outside. He was wearing only a baseball cap, a sweatshirt, and a light windbreaker. Nothing about this struck me as too odd at the time, as I gathered he must just be a tourist who had not anticipated how cold it could be. 
Back then, I was incredibly shy, and I wasn't the type to strike up conversations with strangers. However, I recall feeling entirely at ease from the moment I saw him. He was tall, athletic, and spoke with a strong accent. He was friendly and approachable. Nothing about him gave off any warning signals. If anything, I was taken aback at how unconventionally attractive he was. Our first interaction was brief. He initiated our conversation by asking if I had been waiting long. I naturally replied out of politeness if he had been stuck waiting for a while too. He was, in fact, quote, waiting for a friend and had just gotten into town. This quickly evolved into us both making small talk, with him introducing himself as John. Eventually, he asked if I wanted to grab a coffee on the account of how easily we hit things off. My train was due to arrive and I didn't have much time, so John quickly asked if I wanted to pick up where we'd left off again over coffee tomorrow. I agreed, we exchanged numbers, and I left to catch my train home. I remember after this instance, I felt a feeling similar to deja vu. It was like a wave of familiarity had washed over me. I was 100% sure that I had never met John in my life. However, I was left with this strange, overwhelming feeling after departing. I felt intrigued by him. When I arrived home, I received a few text messages from John and we agreed to meet up in the same location the following day. At this time in my life, I was still closeted and I hadn't come out to my parents as being gay and I wasn't prepared to tell them I was meeting with a stranger. I usually pride myself on being a good judge of character, and I would not have agreed to meet John if I hadn't felt that the situation was safe. After all, it was difficult to meet guys at that age, and I wasn't about to pass up the opportunity of a date with this handsome older dude who I just felt an abundance of chemistry with. However, I did make sure to let some of my friends know my situation, in case anything were to happen. The following day, John was waiting for me at the same location we had met the night before. Despite the freezing weather, he was still wearing the same light clothing and baseball cap. I can recall him being incredibly charming, and I felt the same overwhelming sense of being familiar with him from the moment we met. I was definitely curious, and I was eager to find out more about him. At this point, we couldn't decide on a location and wandered aimlessly around before deciding to grab coffee at a local Starbucks. As we started to make conversation, I noticed that he was only interested in talking about what I had to say. I remember that he seemed overly happy to be talking with me. When I would speak, he was often so excited that he would barely let me finish before moving on to another topic of conversation. I almost got the impression that he knew what I was about to say already. For instance, he knew that I had a sister before I told him. I also noticed that he would rarely talk about himself, often sidestepping my questions or changing the flow of conversation when I asked him anything directly. He was definitely quirky, and for the most part we spoke about our shared interests. I remember thinking that he was odd, but I definitely didn't feel suspicious of him, despite the fact that he seemed rather private. The only information I remember about him was that he was from America, but that he had been traveling for some time, the way he put it. He claimed to play several instruments, and was in a band, and he mentioned that he had a troubled religious upbringing. However, this is where things get strange. John and I left the coffee shop and decided to go for another walk around the city. We spoke for a long time, and I remember that we'd been laughing a lot and generally enjoying the time we'd spent together. However, we eventually stopped along the riverfront that runs throughout my city, leaning over a bridge as we spoke some more about each other's lives. This is when John asked if he could give me a hug. I remember looking up at him, and his expression seemed genuinely melancholic all of a sudden. Almost bittersweet. Although I was feeling a little confused, I said of course, and hesitantly leaned in for the embrace. I remember that he hugged me incredibly tightly, and when we eventually let go, there were tears in his eyes. I asked him if he was okay, and asked what was going on. 
Admittedly now feeling incredibly confused and a little bit concerned by what was happening all of a sudden, he said, you're never going to believe me. I can't quite remember the entire flow of the conversation that followed. However, I will try to summarize everything as best I can. We took a seat on a nearby bench, where I remember that his composure was incredibly calm, and he said everything with the sincerest conviction. He told me that he was somebody from my near future, and that we knew each other very well. He told me that he had traveled back in time to visit me. However, he was incredibly adamant about not answering how or why he had managed to do so, only stating that it was, quote, recreational, and that time travel, quote, doesn't work how we think, stating to me that he had only wanted to visit me once more, adding that I was much younger than he had anticipated, and that I looked so different from when he knew me. He almost hinted that he had found me at the wrong age. I could tell that there was a feeling of sadness throughout everything he was telling me, as he kept repeating over and over how happy he was to see me, yet he said everything with tears in his eyes. I instantly began taking everything he was saying as a joke, feeling skeptical and ready to leave immediately. I remember standing up and telling him that I had to go. The information was too much for me to process and I felt the same overwhelming flood of deja vu creep back into my system. The sensation was so intense that I remember trembling as I stood up to leave, with the atmosphere around me suddenly experiencing a drop in pressure. This is when he took me by the hand and said, I'll see you again someday. I ran away without saying anything. I remember being so overcome by emotion that I burst into tears as soon as I was out of sight. Afterwards, I was so confused and disturbed by the situation, it took me days to process it all before attempting to articulate it to my younger sister and friends, all of whom remember this incident as the crazy tourist I went on a date with. However, ten years have passed, and I can't help but feel affected by this incident. Every now and then, I remember the face of John and the strange feeling of contentment and familiarity I had around him. After our date, I remember trying to text or call the number that he contacted me on, only to be notified that that number no longer exists by an automated message. He had seemingly vanished without a trace, with no further instances of seeing or being contacted by him since. This definitely could have been a case of an individual who was clearly unhinged, but it was so eerie that I haven't been able to forget about it. I have always wondered who John was, or perhaps who I was to him in this possible future. Nowadays, I am currently in a happy relationship with my partner of six years, whom I have no intention of ever leaving. But every time I recall this enigmatic encounter I had with John, I can't help but wonder if I had glimpsed into a possible or parallel future, one where things have drastically changed for me on a personal level. I have so many questions surrounding what he told me. Was I still alive in his time? Were we romantically involved? Was he a future colleague or even family? Every time I recall these long, distant memories, I'm overcome by an inexplicable wave of emotion almost like I've lost something. It's incredibly difficult for me to articulate the feeling that I felt that night. I have never been able to forget about it, and I am entirely sure that I would still recognize John today if I ever encountered him again. This is the first time I have ever shared the full version of this story outside of my immediate circle, but after discovering the community here, I felt the need to share. Has anyone ever experienced anything similar? or have perhaps read other relatable stories, or have suggestions or ideas. I've felt almost haunted by this meeting since it happened, and I would love a little bit of insight from those more experienced in theories and concepts of time travels and glitches. A few years ago in college, I was on a dance team. Every fall, we would hold auditions, 
and a new girl would join the team. Her nickname to me is Panda, so that's what I'm going to call her for this story. She was really nice, but I also didn't think much of it, as she was just an acquaintance at this point. Anyway, I was going through some dark shit in college, and I was journaling one day. I remember specifically writing a line like, I don't want to be here anymore, and I don't know what to do about it. Immediately after writing that, Panda's name popped into my head. It's almost like it was implanted in my head, rather than a thought that came from the conscious me. I wrote her name with a question mark after it. I didn't really know what to think. It was entirely random to me. At this point, I hadn't known her well enough to assume that she'd been going through anything. I wasn't sure what made me write her name down after that statement, but I moved along with my journaling. Later that same day, our dance team met at a party, and I could tell that something was off with her. Based on the weirdness of journaling earlier that day, I felt compelled to pull her aside and ask what was wrong. It turns out she was struggling with self-harm, which I could entirely relate to based on my past. I was taken aback. That's a weird enough coincidence. But what really floored me is that right after she admitted that to me, she said, I don't want to be here anymore, and I don't know what to do about it. It was the exact sentence I had written in my journal with her name next to it with a question mark. I guess it could be considered a common statement, and I know that it's not the craziest glitch in the matrix if that's even what it is, but I'm also not somebody that expects things like this to happen to me. I know the universe is weird, but my life feels very average and normal. What are the chances that I would write something down like that with her name next to it, hours before it was said to me, accurately predicting who was going to say it? Ultimately, she and I ended up becoming best friends, and it was that day that made all the difference. But it still weirds me out to this day. Last year, I was off work for five months because of tumors in my throat. After surgery, I started a new job, and my first week back at work, I was cashing through a lady who had two carts full of stuff, so obviously I was helping her for a while. She had her daughter with her, who was probably 12 to 14, and was very high on the autism spectrum. She wasn't nonverbal, per se, but she apparently didn't like to talk to strangers at all, and generally preferred not to speak whatsoever. Her mom said that there are only three people she ever speaks to, otherwise she ignores everybody. So anyway, she's talking to me the whole time, telling me about the balloon she's getting and how she likes going to stores, which had her mom so happy and surprised she was trying not to cry. The girl was talking to me the entire time, and I was honored. Then, suddenly the girl asks, So how's your throat feeling? Her mom looks at her and says, that's such an odd question to ask someone. Why are you asking her that? The mom laughs and the girl asks me again. I told her it's feeling pretty good and I asked how hers is. She said, mine's good too, but I was worried about you. It was so weird and her mom's like, sorry, I don't know why she's being so odd. I told her, no, it's okay. It's just super ironic because I just had surgery on my throat in April. The girl goes, yeah, I know, that's why I asked. The mom freaked out, thinking her daughter must be sensitive or have a connection to the world that we can't understand. I have no idea what it was, if it was a glitch or an encounter with someone who was psychic, but it was really strange and kind of beautiful. I wondered if maybe she knew me in another dimension, or maybe she's just in tune with another dimension. Maybe time is more fluid to her and she can know these things? Maybe another me met her before my surgery. Maybe it was just coincidence, though. Who knows? But it was interesting, nonetheless. This is something my grandma told me. 
It was summer in the late 70s. My grandpa was stationed in California, while my grandma, mom, and uncle were living in Oklahoma. My grandma and great-grandpa decided to take a trip with the kids to visit my grandpa in California. They made it there safely and had a really good time while they were there. The morning they left, my great-grandpa called my great-grandma back in Oklahoma to let her know they were about to hit the road. It was about a three-day drive, taking the scenic route and stopping to sleep at rest stops. It was a normal trip, my mom and her younger brother playing in the back seat. They had made it to New Mexico and were only about eight hours away from home, when they were suddenly hit by a freak blizzard. They could barely see where they were going, so they were driving slowly and looking for somewhere safe to pull over and wait out the storm. They saw a bunch of lights on the road coming toward them, and assuming it was emergency vehicles, they pulled over to the side of the road to let them pass. The next thing they know, an officer tapped on their window, waking them all up and asking them to move along. They were confused, but just kind of brushed it off, thinking maybe they had just decided to sleep where they were rather than continue driving through the blizzard. Except, when they started to look around, there was no snow. There was no sign whatsoever of any storm. They stopped at a gas station, and my grandma said something to the attendant about the storm. He didn't say anything, but looked at her like she was nuts. They got back on the road and were home that evening. When they got home... My great-grandma was in a full panic, asking them what the hell happened to them. Apparently, it had been ten days since my great-grandpa called to say they were heading home. They all have an entire week of their life missing, and they have no idea what happened to them or where they were during that week. It's currently 12.03 a.m. and I'm still processing what happened today. I was home with just my nephew, who was taking a shower, so nobody could have opened the door. A little backstory. My dog Ziggy and I were outside so he could take care of business. When he was done, we came back in. As we're coming inside, my nephew is pulling up. He comes in and gets in the shower. I come into my bedroom, leaving Ziggy in the living room, I walk up to my bedroom window, and I see Ziggy running from the chinaberry tree in the yard to the corner of the house. Instantly tripping, I run from the bedroom to the front door, which is right by my bedroom. I open the door and call for him. As I'm calling his name, my nephew opens the bathroom door. He's right here, he says. Now when I tell you my mind was warped, I mean it was gone. I stood there for five minutes, staring. I didn't know what to think. He was literally just running in the yard two seconds ago. How the hell did that happen? I was so confused. Has this happened to anybody else? Last night, I went to pick up my dog from my dad's house, and something really weird happened. It was around 10 p.m., and I picked up my dog. I've driven from my dad's house at night a thousand times, and I know the road back like the back of my hand. He lives on a ranch, and to get back to the freeway, you have to turn left when the road forks. So I'm driving to the end of this road, but the fork never comes. I keep driving on and on and on, but the road isn't ending. After a good ten minutes, and note that this road is rather short and should have only taken me about two minutes, the road finally forks. I make a left, and on the side of the road I see glowing eyes, like cat eyes. Then the road just ends into a big ditch. This road should have led to the freeway. I turned around and started driving back, when all of a sudden, a dog jumps on the side of my car. This thing is growling and snarling at the window. This is going to sound lame, but it's the truth. 
I got chills and a really bad feeling of dread. And I'm like 90% sure that that was not a dog. I slowed down, panicking, because I thought I was going to accidentally hit this dog. I love dogs, even demonic ones. But then it just disappears. I looked around the car with my flashlight, and this thing was just gone. I floored it out of there and turned back onto what I thought was the main road, and kept driving. I got the GPS to navigate back to my house, and it said that I was a little less than 10 miles away from the freeway. This is literally impossible, because the road that my dad lives on is not that long, nor does it lead to any other road that long. I was so panicked that I floored it home, and I forgot to expand the map to see where the heck I was. Once I got home and calmed down, I went on Google Earth to try to see where I went. And it doesn't exist. There's not a single road that long. Nor anything that resembles what I saw anywhere in that area. I have no clue what happened, and my friend and I are convinced that I traveled into an alternate universe for a little bit last night. That the cat that turned into the dog was a skinwalker. Whatever else, we don't really know. I'm not sure if this is a numerical glitch or just an uncanny coincidence. This story isn't anywhere near as interesting or eerie as some of the stuff I've seen and heard. It might be one of those guess-you-had-to-be-there stories. But this rather strange thing happened to me and I strongly feel like it was either a glitch or a synchronicity of some sort, and I've always wanted to tell this story. When I was in my early teens, I always liked the numbers 2549. They were just my favorite numbers, specifically those four, specifically in that order. I don't know why, but I always felt like they rolled off the tongue, and being a dumbass kid, I'd go around saying 2549, 2549. If I needed a password for something, it was 2549. When my parents let me choose their lottery numbers, it was 2549. My brother would always tell me to shut up and that nobody cared about my favorite numbers and that they weren't cool or significant in any way. I knew that. I just liked them. Fast forward to me turning 14. I got my first cell phone. My parents were very strict. I never had a phone as a child. Anyway, I'm really bad with technology. So, I asked my tech-savvy brother to help me with setting it up and with SIM activation and whatnot. A few minutes after fiddling around, he looks at me in disbelief. He goes, Lainey, have you seen your cell phone number? I hadn't even looked at it, let alone tried to memorize it. So I was like, no, why do you ask? He was like, come over here and have a look. I swear that the last four digits of my cell phone number were 2549, in that order. My favorite four numbers, in the correct order, just happened to be the last four digits of my first cell phone number, a randomly generated number that nobody had picked. My brother's the only one who understands the strangeness of it, because he had heard me harp on about those numbers our entire childhood. We both just stared at it and then laughed at how coincidental it all was. To this day, my phone number is still the same, and I always chuckle to myself when I give people my number because I still enjoy saying the numbers out loud, just as I did when I was a kid. Life is weird. My mother is the sweetest woman. Sometimes she slips money into my wallet for things even though at this point in my life I don't really need it, thankfully. I recently used my PayPal account to order and ship something for her, because she had forgotten the password to her own account. It cost about $20, and I never thought about it again. She, not surprisingly, left a $20 bill on my kitchen counter a week or so later. I found it after she left, stuck it in my purse, and then went to sleep. 
I randomly remembered it a couple of days later, and I sent her a quick text message while she was at work that said, Oh, I did find that $20 you left. Thank you. That's all it said. She sent me a message about an hour later that said, That was the cutest picture of you, but now I can't find it. I asked which photo, because of course all I had sent was the text. No photo. She said she was busy at work, but on the screen she saw the small unread text and a photo. So she quickly opened it to see the full photo of me. She showed it to her coworker, so she's not the only one who saw this. She described the photo. She said I was holding a $20 bill right under my face and cheesing hard. She described my shirt and my hairstyle. Here's the thing. She described exactly how I was dressed and exactly how I had done my hair that day. But I'm a million percent sure that I never took a photo, nor did I send her one. Just a thank you text. She was trying to figure out how I could delete the photo after sending it to her phone. If that is possible, I certainly am not capable of doing it, nor would I. All I can think is that there was some kind of glitch. This isn't the first time I've experienced a glitch, but it is the first in a long time, and I just thought I would share. I was 18 and living in a big house in a small village with my mom. We had a large garden with a designated area for our eight rabbits. Every evening, we would take turns to go out to feed the animals before it got dark. However, this particular evening, we had arrived home so late that it was already darker than usual. We agreed to feed the rabbits together because it can be quite creepy out in the garden alone at night. I went to the bathroom and told my mom that I would meet her out there in a minute. When I was done, I went straight to the garden where I heard my mom call, Jess, as she heard the door close behind me. I answered, yes, and I saw her upper body pop up from behind the trampoline to make sure it was me. There were no lights outside. However, the combination of the moon, stars, and distant low light of the motorway was enough to illuminate the area to be able to see quite clearly. I was only around 10 meters from her, so I could see her face and her very distinct big curly blonde hair. She said, okay, and bent back down behind the trampoline to continue feeding the rabbits. I looked down at the grass as I made my way to the bottom of the garden, so as not to step in any holes dug out by the rabbits during their runaround time. As I made my way down, I spoke to her about how naughty one of the rabbits was acting that day. It took me no longer than seven seconds to get to the rabbit area. As I approached behind the trampoline where the rabbit's hutches were, I looked up and expected to see my mom standing there, as I had just seen and spoken to her a few moments before. She wasn't there. I looked around for a few seconds, thinking she might be hiding in order to give me a playful scare, when, to my horror, I heard the back door of the house close. I looked up quickly and saw my mom walking out into the garden. I immediately speed walked up that garden toward her so fast with total terror in my eyes. She asked me what was the matter, and I just said, I'm never going down there again. I just saw you and spoke to you, and by the time I got down there, you were gone. Then you walked out the door. She looked at me wide-eyed and assured me that she had been in the kitchen getting her shoes on the entire time. She's not skeptical at all about these kinds of things, and from the look on my face, she could tell that I had experienced quite a scare, so she believed me straight away. We were both quite nervous about going back down there. However, the rabbits needed feeding, so we had a nervous laugh and cautiously went down to feed the rabbits together. We had a look around, and there was nothing there. I don't know who or what I spoke to in my garden, Maybe it was a glitch in the Matrix, and my mom from another timeline appeared to feed my rabbits. Or, perhaps some darker forces were at work that night. I've read a little bit about doppelgangers and how some people recognize them as warnings of death. I don't know if it's related, but not long after this incident, half the rabbits dropped dead within a few days of each other. I still can't explain what happened. 
I've never thought about glitches in the Matrix as a serious thing, until I started reading more about them. All this time, I've blamed my weird experiences on ghosts. Though I've never seen one, I still believe in them, since my experiences are, at least to me, still unexplainable. I moved into my current house six years ago. It's almost a hundred years old, in the oldest neighborhood in my very large city. Weird things would happen, but we would just shrug it off. You know, lights flickering when we would tease each other about ghosts, things falling off the shelves and out of the cabinets, things going missing and then reappearing in weird places, or by weird means. And then, these three events happened. 1. Our living room TV remote disappeared for two years. Then, one afternoon, I was sitting on the couch, picking up little play balls and throwing them to my toddler. I went to pick up another ball, and right in the middle of the ball pile was the remote. It wasn't there when I made the ball pile. I still thought that maybe somehow the toddler had put it there, but I really don't think so. Number two. I used our garden hose, which has a very specific cap on it. I was done with the hose, wound it back up, turned it on to wash my hands off, turned it off, capped it, and walked away. As I was walking away, my roommate walked to the hose and immediately asked where the cap was. I turned, walked the several feet back to the hose, and sure enough, that cap was gone. Not on the ground, not in the bushes, nowhere. I still just thought that maybe somehow it got lost, but that doesn't make a bit of sense. I had just put that cap back on a few seconds before, and nobody else had walked up in that amount of time. Last, but definitely not least, the weirdest incident that actually made me believe it was a ghost was this. I was sitting on one side of the couch, and my roommate was on the other side. He started the movie that we were going to watch. I had an ashtray and a lighter sitting next to me. I put everything down right where it was supposed to go and then leaned the lighter onto the ashtray. A few minutes later, I went to get it again, but the lighter was gone. I figured maybe it slipped between the couch cushions or went somewhere else, but nope. We took all the cushions off and it wasn't there. My roommate picked the entire couch up, and nothing was underneath it. The lighter just... vanished. I ended up having to use a book of matches. After the movie, I went to bed, but I left everything else, minus the lighter, on the couch. I woke up the next morning, but... where I had left my matches was my lighter, laying right in its spot. At first, I was like, let's be reasonable here, and called my roommate. He said that he didn't find or see the lighter, but he remembers the matches because he used one in the morning before he left for work and put them right next to the ashtray. Ever since then, I was convinced that there was a ghost in my house, but maybe these are glitches in the Matrix. What do you think? This happened two years ago, sometime between September and November of 2019. My girlfriend, we'll call her Mary, and I drove up to Berkeley, California for the weekend, my hometown. I now live in Los Angeles. We went there to see some of my old friends. The day we arrived, we went straight to my oldest friend, we'll call him Paul's, dad's house, where my family spent every Christmas and Thanksgiving my whole childhood. His family is quite well off and has a large property at the top of Berkeley Hills with a full panoramic view of the Bay Area, Golden Gate Bridge, San Francisco skyline, etc. It's a pretty breathtaking view. 
It was probably about three or four in the afternoon, as the sun was starting to dip, but not yet setting. The three of us were sitting on his deck in the backyard, catching up, about to get in the hot tub with this gorgeous view. Now, for the sake of what happens next, I feel like I should describe the seating arrangement. I was sitting on a bench perpendicular to the bay, with Mary sitting to my right. I was facing Paul, who was sitting on a bench perpendicular to mine. We were just telling stories, making jokes, and laughing quite a bit, when out of nowhere, a rapid black rip sped between where Paul and I were sitting, making a loud tearing sound, and vanished from view as quickly as it had appeared. Initially, I thought I had hallucinated it, until realizing that Paul and Mary were equally stunned and shocked by what I had just seen. All of us were like, what the hell was that? And it became immediately clear that it was no hallucination, especially since we all quickly agreed on its description. Whatever it was, was long and black. I had thought for a moment that it was the largest bird I'd ever seen, but its speed was unlike anything I've ever witnessed. It was just rapid. We all looked in the direction that it seemed to be headed, but there was nothing where it should have been, despite being able to see for miles. It was present for what felt like a millisecond. Blink and you'd have missed it. We discussed it, each of us as bewildered as the next, and agreed that maybe it was like a hole in a pair of jeans ripping wide open. We all decided that it felt like a rip had sped between us and closed as soon as it had opened. There was no follow-up or evidence of the phenomenon except for the certainty that we had all seen it happen. I don't know what this was, and I've never had any similar experiences, but to this day, the three of us all remember it vividly. I don't know if it was a rip in the Matrix or what, but I'd love to hear thoughts of what this could have been. Has anyone else ever had a similar experience? This wasn't anything mind-blowing, but it happened to me earlier today, and it made me so confused. I live in an apartment building, and the ground level is like a communal public space. I was taking the lift down from my apartment level to this ground level to exit the place in the morning. The lift doors have transparent panels, so you can look out of the lift. And because of how lifts usually slow down when they're reaching the destination floor, and the doors sometimes take a few seconds to open. I had a good 10 seconds to look at what was happening at the public space in the ground floor. From what I saw, there were three men mopping the floor, and one old lady, who I know is my neighbor, was walking across the space in front of these three men. But when I was in the lift, I noticed that all four of them were frozen. But it was weird because they weren't just standing in casual positions. The men looked like they had just frozen as they were mopping, and the old lady was literally mid-stride. I spent a good three or four seconds wondering what was going on as I waited for the lift doors to open. But the moment the lift doors opened and I stepped out, everyone started moving. The men went back to mopping the floor, and the lady continued walking again. It was so odd, though, because it literally looked as though somebody had pressed play on them when I stepped out of the lift. It was so weird to me. I have no idea what happened. I am a 26-year-old female, and my boyfriend is a 26-year-old male. One day, we went for a big walk around the town that we were living in at the time. It was the middle of the day, probably around 2 p.m., and we were both completely sober. At one point, we were on the side of the road, on one of those lanes where people run and walk, and we saw a female child, around 12 years old if I had to guess, jogging. She was in our lane and coming our way. 
I remember finding it strange for this child to be out jogging on her own. There was no one else around, and it was a pretty remote area, like a countryside road. But I didn't mention anything to my boyfriend. We were walking side by side, so I walked behind him so that she could pass. I stopped seeing her for a few seconds, but when I saw her again next to me, she was a fully grown woman in her mid-forties. He immediately looks at me before I can say anything, in total shock, and asks, Did you see that? I asked him, did he also see a child turn into a woman? And he said, yeah. He said that she never really left his sight, but as he blinked and looked again, she was no longer a child. We even looked back to confirm, and she was still the mid-40s woman. Since then, I've been noticing other, smaller glitches. I don't know if they were always there and I just didn't pay attention, or if that started a whole chain of events. Either way, it was odd. This isn't exactly a horrifying story, so don't get too disappointed if you're not terrified. For background, I'm a 15-year-old Irish fella called Ross. I go to school in Ireland, and I'm now in third year. At the start of the second year, I knew a fella that joined the school. I was in charge of showing him around, and we've been good friends ever since. He is Portuguese, and his name is Tiago. I'll call him Tig for the story. His school bag is a fairly small, bright red bag. He's a little bit shorter than me, and his hair is quite short and brown in color. One day, I was upstairs in my school. It was break time, and I was going to my group's usual spot. I turned a corner and I saw Tig walking along the hallway. This was weird, because at the distance I was from him, I would have seen him come up the stairs. I didn't think much of it at the time but I sped up to catch up to him. There was another corner coming up. He rounded it, and I followed suit. Except he wasn't there. There was a staircase going back down and two bathrooms. One for lads and one for lassies, but no Tig. Considering how close behind him I was, he would have had to have sprinted towards and then jumped down the stairs or jogged into one of the bathrooms. If he went for the stairs, I would have heard it so I figured he was in the bathroom. I sat at the bench and waited. Tig was the first other person in our group to arrive. He rounded the corner and sat his bag down. The realization hit me hard. He wasn't in the bathroom, and whatever or whoever I had followed was not Tig, even though it looked just like him. Same backpack and everything. I asked him if he had already been up there, to which he replied he hadn't. He had no reason to lie. Now, I know what you're thinking. It was someone else. First of all, the person that I saw looked the exact same as my friend from the back. Second of all, no one else in the school has that bag. At least, I've never seen anyone else with it. And third, the only place the person could have gone without sprinting down the stairs, which I probably would have caught a glimpse of anyway, would be the bathroom. No one ever came out of the bathroom. At least, nobody that I didn't watch go into it. Finally, my friend is a fairly distinct character. Not many people have the same body build as he does. Like I said at the start, it's not exactly terrifying, but I do believe it to be a glitch in the Matrix. Years ago, I was working nights as a phlebotomist, the person who draws your blood, in a hospital. There was this doctor who was notorious for ordering recurrent tests incorrectly. He would order a single draw when he really needed a serial draw 90% of the time. But because one in 10 times he really did want a single, you always had to check with him. This night happened to be the start of daylight savings, so at 1.59 a.m. the clocks would turn to 3 a.m. instead of 2. At about 1.30, I get an order on my screen from this doctor. 
I was the only fleb on nights, and I worked with two techs. I sighed and showed them. Oh look, Dr. X ordered this test again. I'll see if he's on the floor and if he really wants this or if he wants the cereal draw. I went up to the floor and he was at the nurse's station. I remember it so clearly because he was wearing plaid black and yellow skinny pants under his white coat. I couldn't stand the guy and I thought his loud, ugly pants just drew attention to his loud, ugly personality. I walked up to him and said, hey, I just got this order for XYZ patient. Did you mean to order the three cereal draws? He was dismissive and said something like, of course I did, can you just draw three? I, of course, cannot just come poke a patient three different times without orders. So I asked him if he could reorder it and I would go back to the lab to print the stickers and come right back and do the first draw. I drew a couple of patients quickly knowing that he would take a few minutes to get the order in. I rode the elevator back to the lab and checked my computer. It was 1.58 and the orders were there, so I printed them and stuck my specimens in the centrifuge while they printed. I pulled the labels off the printer and looked closely and realized that he had ordered the single draw yet again. I pulled up the order code, wrote it down for him, and went back to the floor to just ask him to do this order exactly. When I got to the floor, he was standing exactly where he had been when I came up the first time, wearing plain black pants. I assumed somebody had forced him to change, and I knew he was going to be really annoyed when I asked him to reorder the labs. By now it was definitely past 1.59, so the clocks were reading three-something. I asked him if he could reorder the test. He was totally pleasant and not at all frustrated that I was asking him again. I asked him if room 2008 had thrown up on him or something, and if that's why he had changed his clothes. He then seemed offended and was like, what are you talking about? I was like, sorry to offend, but when I came up to you earlier, you had on yellow pants, so I just assumed something happened. He scoffed at me and said, I've been wearing these all night. I don't own yellow pants. You must be confused. I'm thinking he's just being weird and should just admit he got puked on, but whatever. I go back to the lab, print the orders, and finally draw the patient. I stop to talk to one of the nurses for a moment, and on my way back down, she says something like, I saw you talking to Dr. X. He's being weird tonight right? And she seemed kind of shaken. I said, yeah, he was wearing those hideous pants and then tried to pretend he wasn't. She told me that he walked into a room on one side of the wing wearing the yellow pants right before the time change and then walked out seconds later from the other side of the wing wearing black. I was weirded out and went back down to the lab where the techs asked me where the samples were for the patients that I had drawn after first asking Dr. X to reorder. I opened the centrifuge I had left them in, and they weren't there. The orders showed that the labels had never been printed, and when I apologetically went to redraw the patients, they had no idea who I was and didn't have cotton or tape on their arm from where I'd drawn them earlier. I still have absolutely no explanation for this, it appears that everything between first receiving the incorrect order and returning to ask him to reorder for the second time never happened. The text didn't remember me showing them that he had ordered incorrectly the first time or anything. The only reason I didn't check into a psychiatric facility was the nurse who corroborated my story. We hardly knew each other at the time, but we like trauma bonded over the experience and we've talked about it so many times. The weirdest part to me is that it coincided with daylight saving starting. That is completely a societal construct. Nothing actually happens when we move the clock, so what the heck? I still get the chills when I think or talk about it. And because people always question why I was so tuned into the clocks and to know exactly when things happened, I was a worker whose shift was an hour shorter that night. We all kind of watch the clock and do a mini celebration when it changes.
This is a glitch that I have thought about a lot over the years. I have no explanation. It was just a weird thing that happened. It was 2011, and we were 16. My best friend and I were in town, wanting to get some McDonald's. Her car declined, so we were walking to the bank opposite the mall. While we were crossing the road, we saw her older brother's best friend, Mark. We both yelled out, Hello, Mark. I yelled out, Nice shirt. It was a lion with flames all around it. I remember very well, because I had a huge crush on him at the time. He ignored us completely, like he didn't even hear us. We both commented about how rude that was, finished crossing the road and got to the ATM on the other side. While there, Mark comes along from the opposite direction. He's wearing the same shirt, and we ask him how he got there. That we had just seen him cross the road, and the light hadn't gone again, so he couldn't have crossed again. He's very confused and said that he just came from the opposite direction and had never crossed the road yet. I mentioned this to my best friend a week ago, and she remembers the same thing that I do. Neither of us have any idea what happened. This happened yesterday, and I can't stop thinking about it. My boyfriend wasn't home, and I had put my phone on charge behind the couch. I sat down and started reading. About ten minutes later, I heard my boyfriend shout, Baby! And I sat up, startled. He sometimes does this when he comes home just to make me aware of his presence before he comes into the room, because I always jump if I don't hear him come in. I sat for a second because I couldn't hear any movement, then turned around to get off the couch and go see him and see what he was doing. As I got up, my phone lit up, and it was a text message from him, literally just a few seconds after I'd heard him call me. I thought nothing of it until I opened the living room door and he wasn't standing in the hallway. I checked my phone and he'd actually texted me something pretty urgent and it made me even more freaked out that I had heard him shout so clearly. It felt like in some weird way, whatever it was was trying to get my attention to turn around and get my phone. So I always thought this was strange. I even told people about it, but chalked it up to people working overnight or something. But now, I'm not so sure. I worked for one of the biggest tech companies for about 10 years. I traveled a lot and sometimes taught workshops. I remember visiting Puerto Rico to deliver a workshop. I was really impressed with the people in the office. They were serving lunch on silver dishes and had a really classy atmosphere. It was a company location, so there were no customers in the office. One strange thing that happened, but not necessarily weird, was after eating lunch with the students, I'd started teaching again, and little by little, the office people would just casually walk in, right past the projector, and me lecturing, and grab lunch. I wasn't mad, I actually found it kind of funny. Besides, the staff had some good looking and generally nice people, so there's that too. The strange part was that I remember after one class cleaning up for the night and visiting the bathroom before leaving, and I noticed that it was a bit aged. Maybe leaking faucets and water stains, nothing gross, but it was definitely an old bathroom. There were several stalls and urinals. Now, I left likely at around five o'clock and the office was closing down. The next day when I visited that bathroom, it was completely different and looked brand spanking new. I'm talking marble, tile, everything looked like it had literally been done overnight. I remember mentioning this and really getting no response from anybody. That night was when the oil refinery blew up. I booked my flight a day early and got out. I was afraid that it was either an attack or the smoke would force the airport to be closed down, 
which would cause havoc with me trying to get home. I never did figure out what was going on there with that bathroom or with the people. Looking back on it, maybe they weren't real either. Or maybe it was some kind of glitch. I've mentioned this a few times to people over the years as a funny story, thinking that they had actually remodeled this bathroom overnight. But now that I think of it, there's no possible way that they did that. I was leaving when the office was getting ready to close. There were no signs, no workers coming in, and no recollection of the employees the next day. Plus, this work wasn't just a makeover. Like I said, it was granite counters, tile walls, the works. It was just very strange. About 25 years ago, I lived in Texas. Most of my family lived in Utah. My sister called me one afternoon and told me that my niece and her three-year-old daughter were in an accident, but had to be in two different hospitals. The three-year-old, Court, was at a children's hospital. You have to remember, there were no cell phones back then. My sister told me that they were fixing to do surgery on Court for a blood lump behind her eye. My sis was with her as her mom was having surgery at the other hospital. My sis asked me to pray for them both. I was laying on my bed praying, but when I prayed for court, it felt like I was in her room, and I put my hand on her head while I prayed for her. Jump forward two years, and my family went to Utah for a family reunion. One of the days that I was there, my sister asked if I wanted to see pictures of court in the hospital, and I did. The sister said that a weird thing happened. Court was sleeping, so sister went to get snacks out of the machine. When she got back to the room, Court was awake. Remember, she was only three. Court asked my sister where Aunt Deb was. That'd be me. She said that I was in Texas. Court said, no, she was in here. She put her hand on my head and she was talking. So, yeah, I guess I really was with her. I don't know if that's some sort of glitch in the matrix sort of thing, but it certainly was memorable. A couple of years ago, I experienced a moment straight out of the Truman Show. I was skiing on Whistler Mountain with my family. I'm a fast skier, so I usually will zip down the mountain and then wait for my dad to catch up with my phone in hand in case he needs to reach me. One run, I stopped about halfway down the mountain to wait for him to catch up and received a phone call from my dad. When I picked up, he didn't answer. Instead, I heard what sounded like radio chatter. I couldn't make out exactly what was being said, except for one thing. We lost him. Wait, wait, he stopped by the tree. Then the line went dead and my dad came skiing down. Not only was he not on his phone, but his phone was dead. I told my family about this and even had the phone call record in my recent phone calls as evidence that I had at least received a call when I claimed I did. What was especially strange is that my younger brother had a memory of the event as well. He said that I had skied to the bottom of the mountain where he was eating lunch and that I had received the call in front of him, but I didn't. He also told me the next morning that he had a nightmare that men in suits were standing all around his bed telling him to forget what he had seen, and that, quote, he could never know the truth, he being me. He could have easily been messing with me, sure, but he seemed really shaken up at the time, like genuinely scared, and he's still fascinated by the events whenever I bring them up today. When this happened, it completely shattered my worldview about reality. I still find myself questioning what's real, it was a very strange event. I feel like I was never supposed to experience it. Like I said, it eerily reminds me of that scene in the Truman Show 
where his car radio is playing security radio chatter of them following him. I don't know what to make of it, but it was really, really strange. This happened when I was 16. My mother used to take my phone at night and then give it back to me when she woke me up for school the following morning. Every morning started the same. She would wake me up, I would go to the bathroom to take a shower and get ready, I'd come out and put on my uniform, she'd give me breakfast, and then I would run out of the house to catch the public bus. This is the important part. I would always take my phone into the bathroom with me. I'm the type of person who plans my day by the minutes. I knew I had to take my shower for X amount of minutes, get out of the bathroom by X, leave the house at X, etc. So the same routine. I was in the bathroom and I remember it so clearly. My shower took way longer than usual. And instead of it being 7.15 when I got out, the phone said 7.23. I remember rushing out of the bathroom as I was supposed to leave the house by 7.25 on most days. I rushed and put on my uniform, and my mom followed me half out of the house with my breakfast. I distinctly remember checking the clock before I left, too, trying to figure out if I had time to catch the bus or if I would have to take a car to school. The clock was at 7.28, so I did have time to catch the bus. It was a snowy day in January. I also remember that vividly. The sky was gray and dark, but that's how it was every day. The streets were eerily empty. I stood at my bus stop, which was on the side of a pretty busy street. Not today. No one was on the street. Maybe one car passed by every few minutes. I started to get worried that I would be late for school. And that's when I looked down at my phone to call my dad to see if he could drop me off. It was 4.03 in the morning. I was shocked. It couldn't be. I walked back home and my mom was still up getting my other sister ready for school. She was surprised to see me. I told her to check the time, and to her surprise too, it was four o'clock in the morning. She started saying how she had sworn that her alarm woke her up at seven, like it does every single morning. We both looked at each other and just swore that we'd seen the time. A 4 a.m. snowy day and a 7 a.m. snowy day looked almost identical outside, but I know that I checked the clock enough times to confirm that it was in the seven o'clock hour. Regardless, we all went back to sleep, and again I woke up at 7. This time I made my dad take me to school, and the whole day I had my eyes on the clock. This incident never happened to me again, but I still have no explanation for it. Approximately five years ago, one of my co-workers, an 18-year-old woman at my job, didn't show up for her shift one day. The next time we worked together, I asked why she had called out the other day. We just so happened to be in the presence of one of our supervisors, and we were all standing close to the entrance. She told us that her house had flooded because her younger brother left the faucet running right before her family went out to dinner. They came back to the house being mildly flooded. Unfortunate, but not too crazy of a story. The next day at work, the same coworker and same supervisor were standing in the exact same spot as the day prior, close to the entrance, and were talking. I asked my coworker how her house and family were doing. She asked me what I was talking about and why I would ask her that. I said, you know, because of your house flooding. She became very visibly upset and bothered and demanded to know how I knew that her house had flooded. I became very confused. I asked her, don't you remember telling me that literally just yesterday? She insisted that she didn't tell me about her house flooding and demanded to know how I found out this information. I was bewildered and I was convinced she must be messing with me because she 100% told me and our supervisor about her house flooding. 
I turned to our supervisor and I'm like, did she not tell us about her house flooding yesterday? Expecting an obvious yes in response. However, our supervisor said she had no idea that her house had flooded either, and it was the first time she was hearing about it. I was stunned almost into silence, and I'm incoherently babbling, trying to explain that she definitely did tell us this. My coworker cuts me off and says, there's absolutely no way you could have known about that. I haven't told anyone about my house flooding aside from our general manager. Not even, and inserted the name of another coworker who she was really close with. She said, if I haven't even told her about that, why the F would I tell you? She literally looked at me with disgust and stormed off. At this point, I'm still convinced that it was some kind of elaborate prank. I asked the supervisor who had witnessed it before about the whole thing again, and she still maintained that she was unaware about her house flooding. This disturbed me greatly, but it's just so freaking insane that I was still convinced they had to be messing with me. The next time I worked with flooded house coworker, I said hello to her, and she just glared at me in response and walked off. After that day, it was never the same. We worked together for another six months or so, and she continued to avoid me. If we had to interact, she was rude to me and treated me like I was some kind of creepy stalker that was obsessed with her. I swear on my life that she told me about her house flooding. I remember it very vividly, but her reaction to me knowing was so intense and so prolonged. I really don't think she was faking that. My supervisor also maintained that she never actually told us about it. I even talked to her best friend about it, who also said that she had not previously known about the house flooding. Her best friend told me that it was best to just leave the topic alone and to leave flooded house girl alone. I have no explanation for this. And when I tell people about the situation, they either tell me I'm crazy or making it up. I don't know how to explain it. I don't even believe in parallel universes, but I don't know what else it could be. Other than a switch up in the timelines or something. I don't know. It haunts me though. I think about it all the time and it just makes me feel sick. I just got home from work an hour ago. I have these dreams every night where this Japanese girl is always riding shotgun in my dream car, which is a 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner. The dreams have been getting a little too realistic for my taste. For example, she has a whole name, first, middle, and last. Either way, the dreams almost always consist of she and I just driving around and laughing at some dumb jokes. Well, tonight on my way home, I decided to glance over to the passenger side mirror and she's just sitting there. Same hair, same clothes. It was her. I'm not sure why, but I wasn't really unnerved by it in any way. That is, until she looked over to me and smiled. I smiled back and she was gone. Poof, she just vanished as if she was never there. Hell, the seatbelt was even undone. I'm honestly not sure how to feel about this. I'm guessing that in another reality or universe, I'm dating the girl of my dreams, and maybe there was some kind of overlap. I guess dreams could be realities. Maybe they're alternate realities. But could there be an actual meaning behind all of this? I still can't figure it out. What's even weirder is that I did some Googling about her name and I can't find anybody that exists with those names put together, first, middle, and last. I have no idea what's going on.
My wife and daughter had the same glitch experience at the grocery store earlier today. She said that she and my daughter were walking, looking at something in an aisle. They were looking for something, and they thought they were on the right aisle, but then they realized it was over in the next aisle. So they turned the corner and started walking down that one, but realized that they were actually on the aisle they had just left, from the beginning. Not like they had turned around, but like they had made a full circle even though they hadn't. They noticed right away, so they turned around to check the aisle they had just left to confirm what had happened, and it was a completely different aisle they'd never even been on. After that, we were eating lunch. She looked over at our son and said that he just looked different, as though he had aged since she'd seen him last. This change that she has noticed in our son only seemed to happen after this weird glitch. Is it possible that my wife just shifted realities? If so, what happened to my original wife? She seems exactly the same. We can't really figure out what just happened. My husband wrote his perspective about me shifting realities after some grocery store incident with my daughter. I wanted to share the story from my point of view. I was in the grocery store with my daughter doing some shopping. We were down the canned chili aisle. While walking by the chili to the left, I mentioned to my daughter that it was too bad that no one in the house liked chili dogs. She replied with, yuck mom, hot dogs are gross. I said, okay, well, we do need some canned corn. So I looked above the aisle to read the signs above all the aisles that I could see, and I noticed the canned vegetables were on the next aisle, to the right. So we walked, got to the end of the aisle, and turned right. Before we turned the corner to the aisle on the right, I looked down it and saw the chili to the left. I stopped and said to my daughter, hey, weren't we just down the chili aisle? My daughter said, Whoa, Mom, we were. But now we're standing outside the two aisles looking back and forth between both of them. I looked to the one on the right, the one that we had just been down, and I saw baking goods like flour and stuff like that. We both kind of tripped out a little and laughed about it, chalking it up to just being confused. I'm open-minded, but this definitely couldn't be possible. We wrapped up our shopping and came home. Fast forward to dinner time, minus a few details. The long story short is that I noticed my son's features looking slightly different to me. I kept saying how he just looked slightly older. Kind of like when you send your kid to camp for a week and when you see them, you notice how they aged just a wee bit from the last time you saw them. I asked my husband if he thought it was possible for a person to notice the moment of the slightest change of aging in a child. We're pretty open-minded in our house, and we like to entertain conversations that don't always fall in line with society's standards. It's fun, and we like to think for ourselves. At some point, a while later, my daughter said, Hey, Mom, tell them about what happened at the store. I told the story, and my husband, being his lovable weird self, said, I think you experienced a glitch in the Matrix. Maybe my old wife is gone, and that's why our son looks different. I laughed it off because I always like to see the rational side of things and also thought he was mostly joking, so he posted about it. I have no idea what really happened at that store. Had my daughter not been there to experience it with me, I might actually believe that I in fact do have some kind of mental illness, like so many of the commenters seem to think. I'm also a firm believer that that's how most of society is brainwashed to think. Oh, this is weird, someone's losing their mind, give them meds. Over the past five years, I've been on a journey of loosening the grip that society's conditioning has had on me and trying to unlearn most of the things from my upbringings. I'm trying to learn to think for myself and also to realize that my life may not be what it seems to the next person. Perception is everything and experiences are different depending on who's experiencing them and how they vary. I'm not saying that I shifted realities. I'm also not saying that I'm insane. There is no black and white. There's only what I experienced, and nobody will see things the way I do. Maybe I will never truly know what happened, and that's part of life. Nothing has to have an answer. 
Not every situation out of the cookie-cutter life experience has to be labeled as crazy. My challenge to all the skeptics ready to deem me insane is that nothing is what it seems. Have an open mind. The next time you judge a person based on a story, try to think of all the times someone was trying to judge you based on a situation that you saw completely differently. Does that make you insane? Like I said, I would definitely have seen a doctor had it not been for the fact that my daughter and I experienced the exact same thing. Anyway, that's my perspective of what happened that day. I may never be able to explain it, and that's okay. When I was in my 20s, my then wife and I were standing outside a bakery waiting for it to open. There was also a family behind us in line, a father, a mother, a young boy, and a girl who was a little older. I remember the little boy because I thought it was odd that he was playing on the rounded metal railings on the opposite side of us, just climbing and hanging off of it like little kids do. The boy had brown hair and an oversized winter coat on. Nothing was said between my wife and I, and when the bakery opened, we went in, and so did the family. Except, there was no boy. I figured he was roaming an aisle or something, like kids do. So we check out, and so does the family, but still, no boy in sight. We walk out and get into the car, and notice the family leaving with just the daughter. I wasn't really thinking too much about it, until my wife says to me, Where's the little boy? That's when I was a little shocked. We discussed the boy and what he looked like and how he was dressed, and we also talked about what he was doing on the railings while we waited. But there wasn't a boy anymore. This is a little bakery off a highway with no other stores around and no houses. The parking lot is also small and in plain view of the only entrance and exit door. We were both a little spooked, and we're not entirely sure if it was a ghost or some kind of glitch in the matrix. Like, maybe we were seeing two different timelines or a parallel universe or something. But in any case, that boy just glitched out of existence. The last hour of my life has been really surreal for me. So I got off work just a little while ago, and I ended up on Instagram, just kind of browsing the reels. I do this every now and then, just for filler, and it almost felt like my hands were just leading the way. Well, I ended up on this video of some girl, and I liked her style, so I went to her page. I was just watching a few of her videos. For whatever reason, because I never do this, I clicked the comments, and I ended up clicking on the first commenter's profile. As soon as I do, I see the pictures of this person. I look up at the name. This profile belongs to a long-lost friend of mine that I went to elementary school with. I went to school in a very small town. My sixth grade class had fewer than 10 students. I haven't used Facebook in over six years, and even my Instagram doesn't have my real name attached to it. But when I found their profile, I instantly added them and sent them a message. We had no mutual friends, and they actually lived in another state, and had for the last 10 years or so. We messaged back and forth, and I found out that they had been having a hard time recently, but that they were trying to stay positive. I also found out that we both had similar outlooks, and we agreed that we were supposed to find each other again. I plan on calling them again this weekend to catch up more thoroughly, but holy crap, what a beautiful thing. Still, it seems like more than a coincidence. I don't know if it's a glitch in the matrix or something like that, but it was wild. Several months ago, I lost the last pair of glasses I had. 
I remember the last place that I had them, which was my friend's car, on my knee. I have to take them off in order to see my phone. I couldn't find them after I got home. I tore my house upside down looking for them. I even looked in the driveway, thinking that maybe I still had them on my knee when I got out of my car. I called my friend to look in his car, but nothing. They had just vanished. Fast forward to last week, my husband and I do yard work for an elderly man, and we haven't been to his place to work in close to a year. He was out of state during that time, dealing with trying to sell a house out there. Anyway, we went to do his yard work last week, and my husband was taking and pulling weeds in one of the flower beds. He yells for me to come and take a look at something. I get to where he is, and he's holding in his hands my glasses. He had just uncovered them, buried in a flower bed. There's no possible way for them to have gotten there, much less to be buried under the dirt. I've been so shook over this, and I would love to hear any ideas on how this could have happened. We're pretty sure it's some kind of glitch in the Matrix, but dang, it was super weird. Let me preface this story by saying that when this happened to me, I, a 33-year-old male, was barely 16, and was as much of a skeptic or a believer as any kid at that age could be. I'd had other unexplained incidents before this, but this is the one that really stuck with me most of all. I went to bed in my very boring, very normal, mid-2000s bedroom. I played a little Nintendo DS, later than I should have on a school night, I'll admit, then slept for maybe an hour or two before waking up in desperate need to use the bathroom. I roll out of bed, not bothering to grab my glasses. My first mistake, as someone who's literally legally blind without them probably should get them, and I take the muscle memory four steps diagonally across my tiled bedroom floor. I am a very tactile person due to my visual impairment. And I had my whole house, not only my room, memorized to a T for safety. I reached for my doorknob, and I get nothing. Okay, so maybe I'm not quite as awake as I thought. This never happens to me, though. I wake up if one of my parents so much as breathes wrong across the damn house, but okay, I guess I'm groggy. I reach to the left since I must have angled my walk wrong. Nothing. I try right. Nothing. Did I not walk far enough? I feel really awake now. I take another step, regretting the no glasses choice. I can barely make out shapes in the daytime, and darkness is just a blanket over my eyes, so I can't see my door, or my bed, or my own hands in front of me. I can't see, period. But the door should be there. So where is it? I take another step, two, three, four. I flail my arms forward, silently pleading, please let my door be there. And I swear I can see the nightlight in the hallway that's there so that I won't eat carpet on my way to the bathroom. Thanks, mom. But no matter where I reach or how far I go, I can't get close enough. My memory gets hazy here. But after maybe two solid minutes of aimless walking toward the hazy outline of light around a door, my last thought from that between time was feeling that I was not at home. Then I'm in the hallway and I sleep on the couch the rest of the night. Looking into my room felt like staring into an abyss. Nothing ever came of it, but I don't know if anything will ever get under my skin the way this did. I felt so unsafe, so helpless and alien in that space that I had known so well. Wherever it was, it was not my room.
I don't know if this would be a glitch, but I sure as hell don't have any other way to describe how or why this happened. My best friend and I are driving down this windy road in our town that has a speed limit of 45 miles per hour. We have the windows down, the music up, and we're just talking and laughing, all the usual things. I believe we were on our way to a mutual friend's birthday party. On this one specific part of the road, there's a relatively sharp turn that bends around a guardrail. If you were to drive through the guardrail, you would plummet a great distance before hitting the shallow river below. Mind you, I have been on this road countless times, and I have never been paranoid or imagined anything specific about this turn. It was just one of many places on this particular road that you had to slow down a good bit before continuing your way around nothing major. We start to approach the turn, and while in the middle of a discussion about some drama going on at the party we were on our way to, we both grab the sides of the seats, her one hand remaining on the steering wheel. At the exact same time, in the middle of a conversation that had nothing to do with the road. We weren't speeding, there were no cars around us at all. It was just a peaceful drive, not unlike any we've had previously or since. We glanced at each other with big eyes and pulled onto the side of the road after making it around the turn. After stopping, we immediately bring up the exact thing that we both pictured in our heads at the same exact time. She loses control of the wheel, which results in us smashing the guardrail and plummeting over the edge directly into the water. We both felt the same sensation of not being able to breathe correctly until we pulled the car onto the side of the road. And we felt a tingling sensation in the back of our head, a weird buzz in our ears. We both experienced the same exact thing at the same exact time, never happened to us before or since. It was, to say the least, extremely bizarre. I don't think I'll ever be able to make any sense of this experience, and I was on edge the entire night after this. I would love to hear any ideas on how or why this occurred. Once a week for the past two years, I've walked to and from a supermarket. On the way, I walk down a long road which has houses on one side and a whole lot of nothing on the other except for the remains of a little store that sold newspapers and daily essentials. For the past two years, I've passed these remains and recalled the time, around six years ago, that my friend and I were passing the store, but we had to take shelter there when the heavens suddenly opened and a heavy storm started. It made me feel a little melancholic to look at the remains, thinking of happier times and so on. What used to be a store that happily served its local community was now barely three partially knocked down walls and a pile of rubble. Last week, it was the three walls and a pile of rubble. Today, to my utter astonishment, it's the same store as it was six years ago. I couldn't really say what it looked like in between then and the past two years as I only moved back to the area two years ago. Kind of run down and old looking, but certainly not a pile of rubble. I can't be sure, but I believe it's the same two old men running it, who called my friend and I a cab that day when we were caught in a storm. Three weeks ago rubble, today just like it was years ago? I'm pretty sure this is some kind of glitch in the matrix, but it's my first experience since childhood that I would describe as supernatural. Something happened to me yesterday, and I still can't process it. It's driving me crazy. I always come home at 11 p.m. after going out with my friends. Before I forget to mention, I live alone in a quiet neighborhood next to a park. Yesterday, before I went home, I was taking a walk, listening to some music in the park. There were a few people there, and there were several people in front of me. 
As I'm walking, suddenly everything paused for four minutes. I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought it was some kind of prank, but when I turned, nobody was moving, even flinching. And it was so cold. It gave me a really creepy vibe. It's like I was in a different universe, or something glitched in the Matrix. My phone wasn't working, and neither was my watch. Then everything went normal again. I have no idea what happened. I tried to talk to a friend, but he didn't believe me. I mean, why would I even lie about something that sounds so crazy? Is there any explanation for this? This is a silly story, but one that really solidified my belief that our reality is not what it seems. Either that, or my house has a very mischievous ghost. Last week, I put four rugs in the dryer. Three big rugs, and one smaller rug, which is about 24 by 18 inches. When the dryer was done, I opened it and I removed the rugs. Only three rugs came out. I looked into the dryer to make sure it wasn't somehow stuck to the top of it, even though it's too heavy to really do that, and it wasn't there. I was confused, so I looked in the washing machine. Not there. I looked behind the washer, behind the dryer, nothing. I looked in the hamper, the closet, the bathroom. That thing was nowhere. By this time I was really confused, and annoyed. I looked in the dryer again, still empty. I then looked in both bedrooms, thinking that maybe I just thought I put it in the dryer, but I absentmindedly laid it down somewhere else instead. I looked all over the house for it, and I couldn't find it anywhere. I checked the washing machine and the dryer one more time. Still no rug. I even spun the dryer wheel and turned it, just to make sure that it wasn't still in there somehow. And I even stuck my head in there. No rug. I let it go and decided that it will show up at some point, thinking maybe I threw it somewhere like a dresser drawer or put it in a box without thinking about what I was doing. The next day, around noon, I decided to do the sheets. So I threw the sheets into the washing machine and turned it on. Then I opened the dryer door to make sure that it was empty, having pretty much forgotten about the missing rug from the previous day. And there sat the rug, plain as day, laying in the dryer that I had checked multiple times. I couldn't believe it. I checked that dryer at least three times, and it was completely empty. And now, out of the blue, there sits the rug. I live alone, by the way, and nobody has been in my house for months except me and my two cats. So, to this day, I have no explanation. This took place when I was a teenager, somewhere between 16 and 17. My dad was a truck driver, and I went with him for a couple of weeks in the summer. We were in Texas. I believe it was Fort Worth, but I'm not positive. We pulled into a truck stop and got out together to head into the store for something. On the way in, I saw a girl that I instantly recognized. She recognized me as well, and we basically ran into each other. We started enthusiastically catching up like old friends. I remember just being so excited to see her again, asking her how she'd been doing. My dad and her dad seemed puzzled when they reached us. Our dads did the whole small talk thing about being truckers and I really didn't pay attention to what they were saying. After a few minutes, they turned to us and asked how we knew each other. We both paused and realized that we weren't sure. My dad asked her name, and I realized I had no idea what it was. She didn't know mine either. Her dad seemed pretty freaked out by this, but nothing really rattled my dad that much. My dad went on to explain that it was my first time ever being out of Pennsylvania, where I was born and raised. It turns out she had never been outside of Texas. We were strangers. Then, 
It was like, in the moment, I realized we hadn't met before. I also suddenly couldn't even remember what we'd just been catching up about. I remember asking her how she was doing, but I don't remember her response. It was like as soon as our attention was drawn to the fact that we didn't know each other, the whole conversation disappeared from my memory. But I was so sure that we had had a detailed discussion about our lives just moments before. It became really awkward after that, and we all parted ways. My dad told me later that he had seen plenty of strange things being a truck driver his whole adult life, and that I shouldn't let it bother me. But I still think about her, and wonder what happened. I was so sure that I knew her, so sure that we had been very close, but I have no memory of her, and now I know that I had never seen her before, and I've never seen her since. Quite a while ago, I was inside an Irish pub in Donegal, visiting my aunt on holiday. It was a music night in the pub, and my aunt was playing the fiddle. A couple were on guitar and bass, and the regulars in the pub sang along. As well as my family and I who were visiting, an American couple who were also visiting were in the pub having a pint. The American guy was really nice, offered me and my brother a coke, and about 30 minutes passed while we're in the bar together. I'm a little bit shy, and I'm thinking of ways to start a conversation and act social. The American guy's wife was talking to my mom, and I was thinking of saying something stupid to try my luck. The first thing that came into my head was, are you from Tennessee? I knew that they were Southern because of their accents, but I had no idea which state they were from. I decided it was a dumb idea, and I kept quiet, sipping my Coke. Five minutes pass, and my mom asks, so which state are you from? And the American woman replies, Tennessee. I was surprised by the odds, but I didn't really do anything about it. For the rest of the time that I was in the pub, though, I just sat there thinking about the odds. Many people in many states have southern accents. As far as I knew, it could have been any one of them. I don't know if it was a glitch in the Matrix or what, but it just seemed a little bit too good to be true. This spring, I took a trip with six other friends of mine. Throughout this trip, all of us except for one kept having strong feelings that we were missing a person when we weren't. A few examples that I can remember. We would have the cars packed up and ready to go, but nobody was leaving because we thought we were missing someone, like they were in the bathroom or at the campsite. But then we would realize that everyone was present. A different night, we were sitting by the fire Six of us were around the fire and one person was at the picnic table, maybe ten feet away, so I was fully aware of where they were, when I suddenly got a strong feeling that someone was missing. But I physically counted how many people we had, and all seven were present. Lastly, we had dealt a round of cards. All seven of us were sitting at this table, but we didn't start the game because we were waiting for someone, until somebody finally said something like, Oh, everyone's here. I thought we were missing somebody. To which all of us but one said that we had also felt that way. I'm not a super big believer in the paranormal or glitches or anything like that, but this was straight up bizarre. The only somewhat explanation I have is that our friend group does have more than seven of us in it, but we all knew how many were on the trip. I remember specifically feeling that someone was missing, not a specific person, just an absence that we all felt even though there wasn't one. I couldn't figure out who it was that I thought wasn't there, and no one else could either. Maybe it was just a weird thing, but it definitely felt strange, and I still don't know what happened.
I've always been a believer in both religion and the paranormal. I would see shadows standing outside my door when I was at my dad's house, and I would see and hear the occasional door slam. I never really thought my mom's house was haunted, though. Sometimes things would be out of place, but that's about as far as it would go. This one instance in particular, however, has changed my whole perspective on my mother's home. It was about one in the morning, and I was playing PS4 with some friends from back home. My grandmother was sitting in her lazy boy, and my brother was getting in the shower. We'd just gotten through a game, when all of a sudden I heard an eight-note jingle of We Wish You a Merry Christmas. It sounded straight up like some kind of festive ringtone. I ignored it at first, as I assumed that it was coming from my brother's phone. But he always brings his phone with him into the bathroom when he showers, so I didn't know what to think. The source of the sound was coming from the back room just opposite of mine. It was a decrepit old room filled with toys from my childhood, as well as some leftover decorations. I tried to ignore it, but it persisted, growing louder. I finally got up and walked toward the room, hesitantly. I could hear it coming from just to my left side as I was about to enter the room. And then it stopped, without warning. It didn't finish the tune like it was a toy off the rails. It was as if it sensed my presence and just decided to cease. I was both creeped out and dumbfounded. I looked around in that room for at least 30 minutes, but I have seen all of our Christmas decorations, and we don't have anything that plays a jingle like that. I know this sounds silly, but I couldn't sleep that night. The air felt a lot heavier, and I just couldn't sleep. I felt something was watching me from that back room. I've tried to find anything that resembles that jingle on YouTube, but to no avail. I mean, surely I've heard we wish you a Merry Christmas, but not the same sound and tone like this thing. I've honestly never heard anything like it. It freaks the hell out of me. About two years ago, I had a dream where my friend and I, I'll call him John, were at an old abandoned barn, seemingly in the middle of nowhere. We were on the outside of the barn, just talking, when dusk started to settle in. I told John that I had to be going, or I would be late. I started down the path that led around the barn to wherever I knew I had to be going. I remember that it was just a simple dirt path with a simple wooden fence running along the left-hand side of it, leading into a wood line about 100 to 200 yards away. As I turned the path around the barn, I look up and I notice a humanoid figure in the middle of the path, about 20 yards away. Naturally, I was startled, so I turned to John. For some reason, he had been following me and I hadn't really questioned it. I asked if he saw it too, but as soon as I opened my mouth to ask, he was gone. I turned back and the figure stood in the same spot, so for some reason I continued along until I got about five to ten feet from it, and suddenly I was able to make out its features. The moment I looked upon the figure up close, I recognized it immediately as Death or the Grim Reaper, but it was unlike any iteration I had ever seen or have seen since. It had your typical dark hooded robe, but its skull-like face shimmered like an emerald in sunlight, with two small red orbs in its eye sockets. The part that I remember disturbing me most was his friendly smile that stretched from ear to ear. His mouth and teeth were like a bottomless pit of darkness, and his teeth resembled those of a shark. The part that I think really caught me off guard was when he spoke. He had what I remember being a surprisingly normal voice, though it was actually fairly pleasant to listen to. His words are the main thing that still puzzle me, because I feel like there's some meaning to them. After making eye contact and smiling, he said, You're a day late for judgment. And that's when I woke up. 
It's the only dream in my life that I remembered that vividly when I woke up, and the only dream or thought that I've ever been absolutely compelled to write down. I still carry that page folded up in my wallet. Can't really explain why. Does anyone have any theories on what this might mean, if anything? I told my friend that was in the dream about it, and he thinks that it's connected to the time when I was around 14 and drowned in the reservoir. My brother pulled me out and I came back. The last thing I remember from drowning was letting go and a peace coming over me before I blacked out, and then nothingness before I awoke on the boat with my brother over me. My brother estimated I'd been underwater for at least a few minutes before he had managed to get to me. Maybe I was supposed to have died then and I didn't. Maybe that's why I'm late for judgment. Whatever the reason, I'm very interested to hear what anyone else thinks this might be. Let me just start this off by saying that in our culture, apple trees are said to be cursed. They're said to be homes for children who died young, women who were killed or died while pregnant, and things like that. It is said that if you pick an apple or a leaf off the tree, you're going to have bad luck, or even die. My half-sister lives in an old village in Bosnia, and many deaths happened there so it would be no surprise that elders said the trees were cursed and that the kids shouldn't eat the apples that were on them. Apparently in the 30s, a pregnant woman died of blood loss while giving birth underneath that tree, the one that's in front of my half-sister's house. It was common for women to give birth under trees in that village, and it's not a myth because her grave can actually be found in the graveyard and some of her family members are still alive to confirm it. Anyway, my niece and I, as the foolish kids we were, shook the tree one day until a bunch of apples fell down. We put them in a bucket and ate a couple, and threw the rest into a lake near my half-sister's house, just for fun. Around one month later, I came back to the village for my half-brother's wedding, and saw that the tree was gone. I asked my sister about this, but all she said was, there never was a tree there. Everybody knew about this tree. Everybody talked about this tree. But now everybody's acting like it never was there. I am legit so creeped out. Years ago, I worked at a mall. I was assigned the evening shift, so there was never that much action. I would usually come into work and just read a book or call some of my old friends to see how they were doing. The fun of this job all changed eventually. One evening, my manager decided to come in and keep me company. My manager and I developed a close friendship. I was leaning against the counter talking to her. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw a black shadow man dash right by me, heading to the back of the store. The back of the store is locked, so nobody can gain entrance or exit through that way. I asked my manager if she saw it, and she did not. I searched the whole store to find nobody, and nothing weird. I just thought my mind was playing tricks on me. Another night, I was working by myself, when I heard a loud bang. The store I worked in was one of those mystery room games where people would solve clues to break out, like an escape room. One of the themes of the room was special ops, so the loud bang was from a military helmet prop. I realized that some things may fall, but this object was tightly secured on a shelf. Plus, military helmets are not the lightest of objects. It's not like they get blown off. Another night when I was working there alone, I was reading a book by my favorite author, Stephen King. I believe the book was It. Very faintly, I heard my name called. Again, I looked all through the store and nobody was there. I thought I was just a crazy person. About an hour later, I felt a hand on my shoulder and the hand exerted some force. This freaked me out. 
I closed the store about an hour early and went home. All the activity got quiet for a few months, and I started working the morning shifts. My manager asked me to come in early so I could reset some of the rooms from the previous night. About 30 minutes into my shift, I get a phone call from a strange but normal-looking number. I picked up the phone, and all I heard was static for a while. Very faintly, I could hear a man talking. Then, all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a robot, like in the movies, say my name and hang up. I legit thought I was losing my mind at this point. On my last day of work before leaving for university, I was saying goodbye to my coworker. She just casually mentions how lucky I am to leave this spooky place. I felt relieved because she shared similar stories to mine. About a year after I quit, somebody on a forum page asked if anybody had had experiences at this particular mall. I told them some of the same stories I just told you, and it turns out a lot of people there had weird experiences. This happened to me not long ago, and it confirms to me that our house is haunted. We have had some questionable experiences living here, but this, to me, is a no-brainer. I was walking through the hallway and down the stairs to get to the kitchen, empty thermos in hand, acquiring some water for my girlfriend and myself. When I got to the kitchen, I heard someone coming down the stairs behind me. Knowing people were home, I thought nothing of it. I continued toward the sink, but I turned around just to see who it was. When I got to the sink and had turned all the way around, prominent footsteps faced me and stopped at the bottom of the stairs. There was nobody there. I stood there for a second, wondering if something would appear or walk back up the stairs or something, but nothing. So I filled up the bottle and went back upstairs, and as it turns out, nobody had been up. When I was about four years old, my great-grandpa gave me a soft clown doll for Christmas. It had long, noodly arms and legs, and it was about the same length as me. I liked clowns at the time. The 80s were a different time, and I was a bit of a strange kid anyway. So I never thought about them in any kind of negative way. I used to lay it down parallel with me in bed, between me and the wall, and would usually wake up to find it on the floor as I usually turn over and am generally restless during the night. One morning, I woke up, laying on my left-hand side facing into the room and my back facing toward the wall. I woke up aware of some movement behind me, out of the corner of my right eye. So I turned my head slowly to see that this thing was sitting up from the waist and had its head turned almost right around so it was looking down at my face. Its head was flicking slightly from side to side, in the same way that people do when they look at different parts of your face. I didn't understand what was happening, beyond knowing that this wasn't right, so I started to sit up and turn to face it. As I did, its head turned back, and it lowered itself slowly back down to the bed, until it was just laid there staring at the ceiling and lifeless again. I know I wasn't pushing it against the wall or moving it in any way, my own hand could have been doing it from an angle, but seeing as both hands were in front of me, I don't think that was the case either. It was daylight and morning. It just wasn't right. I threw the thing across the room and ran to my parents' bedroom. Nothing happened with it again or any other toys after that. My great-grandpa was still alive at that point, so it's not like he was haunting me. I'm pretty sure nobody will believe this story because it sounds like a scene out of a movie. It's easy to say that I must have just remembered it wrongly or been mistaken, but I know what I saw, and I'll never forget it, because it forever changed the way I look at everything.
My girlfriend and I moved to a new apartment about six months ago. From the first night we moved in, I noticed weird things out of the corner of my eye. I see what looks like dark, static figures in our hallway and bathroom. Sometimes the figures move, but they mostly look like they're just standing still. I never see them fully, only out of the corner of my eye. When I turn to look, they vanish. We have a cat and dog who have both acted strangely when it comes to the bathroom. My dog demands to be with me, and if I do not let him, he freaks out, which is something he's never done. Also, our cat will sit in the dark bathroom for hours, also something that is a new behavior. There have also been many times where my dog will start growling or barking at the hall or bathroom. Whatever it is, it usually doesn't do anything physical, except for one time. I had a migraine, so I was sitting in a hot shower with the lights off. Suddenly the cabinet door under the sink opened and slammed shut. When I looked at it, expecting to find the cat or dog, there was nothing. I was alone. That was several months ago, and it's the only time something physical has ever happened. I told my girlfriend about it, and she agreed the apartment has a weird vibe, but she hasn't seen the figures. I'm just curious if anyone else has experienced this. I feel like the stress is just maybe making me crazy or something. Maybe not. I had a dream one night about my sister's ex-husband's sister. In real life, she was sweet, yet troubled. She was bipolar, grew up with an abusive father, partied a lot, moved many times, and changed her name a few different times. Sometimes her first name, sometimes a variation of her first name, sometimes a nickname, or sometimes even her middle name. I never got to know her very well. She was kind, and she and her brother were very close. I hadn't thought about her in a solid year or more. I didn't have a deep connection to her or anything. And one night, she's in my dream. The dream didn't really have anything to do with me. It was her and her baby. She didn't have a baby in real life that I knew of. And they were so joyful and happy and peaceful together. At one point, her mom was there, being happy and peaceful with them. I can't even explain the premise of the dream, but that's how dreams go, I guess. It was just about her and her baby and them being so happy together. I woke up and thought it was weird, but I didn't think that much of it, as I often have pretty colorful dreams. I check my phone and I have a text from my sister saying that this woman I had just dreamed of had committed suicide the day before. So of course I was like, Whoa, I just had a dream about her. I told my sister all about it. I made her ask her ex-husband if there was any kind of baby involved. To everyone's shock, he told my sister that in her note, she had admitted she was pregnant. So of course, my sister told her ex about my dream, and she said she felt it brought him some comfort, thinking that she and her baby were at peace now from such a conflicted and difficult life. I wasn't really sure why she would come through my psyche as opposed to anyone else's, especially someone who knew her better, but I have seen ghosts since I was eight, and I've had a few kind of paranormal or spiritual experiences in my life, so maybe I'm just the one that's most open to that kind of thing. Has anyone else had people that have passed away come through in their dreams? To add to her tragic story, her boyfriend had just been killed in a hit-and-run accident while he was on the side of the road working on his car about a month prior. The whole thing was just so sad. I know it was a dream, but I like to think she really did find peace. That they both did. And that somewhere, they're okay. Last night, I had a very disturbing dream. I was driving the car with my wife riding shotgun. My kid was in the back seat. When we reached a sharp curve, I saw the headlights of a large vehicle coming down the wrong side. Turns out it was a bus. 
I tried to swing my car away from the oncoming bus, but I got hit on the side. We went skidding across the road, and I could see the face of my terrified wife and my son flying in the back seat. Then I woke up, and I had to calm myself down before I could go back to sleep. Just a dream, right? Well, this morning during breakfast, I turned the pages of the local daily over. Then I saw it. There was a story of a family that had gotten killed the night before in an accident when their car was sideswiped by a bus. The freakiest part, though, is that the car is the same make of mine. The bus is from the same company as the one in my dream, and the location where they got hit was where I was in my dream as well. Am I just trying to fit things into my dream narrative? Or is there something to this? I'm really freaked out. At the end of August 2016, I had open heart surgery, and while I was under, I had no heartbeat function for nine hours. I had an experience that felt like I went to the other side. I don't know what to call it, but this is what I saw. As a note, there was no fear. I was not afraid at all. I became aware that I was somewhere. I was holding on to, with my right hand, what felt like a piece of cloth. I felt like I was standing on a rock in space, like the dirt or soil or sand under my feet was gray and appeared like what you would see on the moon. To my left was utter pitch black darkness. Directly in front of me, I was holding on to with my right hand what felt like a piece of cloth, like I said, and this cloth was on a much larger thing or being in front of that which obscured my vision. I had to see or look around this being. It looked as though there was a cave or something. It was very dark in that cave and very gray where I was. Out of the cave of the darkness came what I can only describe as a worm-like figure as big as I was. It had a purple face and no facial features, just gaseous purple stuff. And it came right towards me, hard and fast. As it got close, it was repelled from me and made a squealing noise and scampered back into the darkness. Another one came out of the darkness and came toward me also. It reflected from what seemed to be some sort of force field around me. It also made a displeased sound and then ran back into the darkness, leaving behind the purple gaseous trailers, like tracers. I don't even know how else to describe them. I realize that the thing I'm holding on to is sort of like a Grim Reaper, for lack of a better description, but it wasn't a Grim Reaper. It was different. But it was clothed in the black cloth-like material that I was holding on to with my right hand. Then another really, really big worm came out of the darkness, and this thing just charged at me like a horse at full speed. I braced for impact. I wasn't afraid, I just braced for the impact I thought was coming. It screamed out as though it felt pain when it got close to touching me. It never actually touched me. It just got really, really close. It too left behind a purple trail as it scampered back into the dark cave that was ahead of this, I guess what we'll call a gatekeeper instead of the Grim Reaper. I looked to my left and there's nothing, just a void of darkness. But up and over to my right, I see a cluster of stars or lights. There were pink and blue with yellow, and it looked so inviting. I felt like that's where I wanted to go. I felt my feet lift up off of the thing I was standing on, and it's as though my feet just came up off the ground. My body tilted, and I began to turn toward that light or cluster of lights. I'm still holding onto the cloth, and I can't seem to let go. And as I pretty much decided that I didn't want to come back here anymore, I was happy being where I was, or wherever I was getting ready to go. The gatekeeper thing I was holding on to looked down at me, and very condescendingly said, Not today. Not your day. At that point, I woke up in the ICU, and I was intubated. You're not supposed to wake up intubated, I was told. 
I was on a fentanyl and morphine drip, so I would not wake up. But once I was awake, I couldn't fall back asleep. I stayed like that, conscious, for 25 hours until they finally decided to use propofol to put me back into a coma-like thing. They left me there for 30 hours. When I woke up, I was ready to start pulling tubes out. I recovered really quickly and life is great, and it's been nothing but a journey since then. I guess it was a near-death experience, or something weird. I don't really know what it was, but it was interesting, and I thought I'd share. And this happened 14 years ago, and it happened while I was pregnant with my first, when my grandmother, who I was very close to, was dying. Anyway, my ex-husband was on the computer until he heard me screaming and yelling in my sleep. He came to wake me up and calm me down, so I did. He went to go to the bathroom, and while he was washing his hands, he saw in the mirror, which was facing our bed, a girl standing over me, looking at me. I was screaming in my sleep again. He said it was a shadow, and then he saw her walk away and disappear. He couldn't find her and thought it was bizarre, but he didn't feel that it was evil. A few months later, he saw her doing the same thing, only this time, I was sleeping peacefully. I had my baby, and my grandmother had already passed away. We had a nightlight in our bedroom so that I could see my way around when getting up to feed the baby. He said that he could see her face more clearly due to the nightlight, but couldn't see who it was. She didn't look at him. She was just staring directly at me while I slept. And then she turned and walked away and disappeared. That was the last time that he saw it happen. What could that be? It's kind of creepy to hear that some girl is just standing by my bed looking at me while I sleep, even if he doesn't think it's evil. It still boggles my mind to this day. The house we had was brand new and we had built it only a year prior, so we have no idea where a spirit would have come from. The following case was narrated during a famous radio program called La Mano Peluda, The Hairy Hand, around 2001. A civil engineer, who wishes to remain anonymous, shares his story. This happened in Tepotzatlan, Mexico City. When I was studying, I met my wife at Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, where she studied medicine. When we got married, my father-in-law gave me a piece of land in Tepotzatlan, where we decided to build a house. Little by little, we were building the home, and when it was finished, we decided to have a celebration with friends and family. The party transcended without eventualities. However, when everyone had retired, at dawn we heard strange noises inside the house, like laments, dragging chains, strong blows, etc. This worried my wife a lot, and as a strong believer, she prayed for protection. I used to be kind of skeptical of these things, and I didn't give it any importance always trying to find a logical explanation. On one occasion, I went to work, and my wife called me on my cell phone, asking me about a pair of mining boots that she found near the basement. I usually wear this type of footwear due to my work in construction, but it seemed strange to me since I only had one pair, and I was wearing them at work at the time she called. Upon arriving to the house, I found my wife somewhat worried, and when looking for these boots, I found them just at the entrance to the basement over a puddle of water. None of this had a reason to exist, since the boots were not mine and there was no water leak that could justify the large puddle that was there. At first I thought they were from one of my subordinates and that he had possibly forgotten them there, but looking at them carefully, they were not the type of boots or brand that we usually use, so not knowing who they belonged to, I threw them away. After that day, the wailing and the noises became louder and louder, until the point that I got used to them. However, my wife spent terrible, horrified nights praying. 
For this reason, I decided to buy a firearm, a 45 pistol, for anything that came along. On one occasion, we went to my nephew's christening and returned to the house late at night. But since we were already tired, we went to bed to go to sleep. The main bedroom is located on the second floor, and to get there, there's a wooden staircase that creaks when you step. In the early morning, the creaking woke me up, and I got very nervous. Then the creaking stopped. I prepared my weapon, thinking that it was a thief, and suddenly, someone started punching on the door as if it wanted to break it down, giving me the impression that this intruder had enormous strength. At this point, my wife woke up abruptly, and I, with weapon in hand, instructed her to lock it as soon as I left to confront the stranger. I opened the door suddenly and clearly saw a man descending the stairs in a hurry when he saw that I was armed. I emptied the gun, hitting him more than five times in the back, and I watched him roll down the stairs. Call the police, I yelled to my wife. Then I ran to turn on the stair light, but to my surprise, there was no one. Instead, what sat there on the stairs were those boots that I had thrown away months ago, but this time over a pool of blood. My wife was so scared that she called a priest to bless the house. I personally set the boots on fire until they turned to ash in front of me. For some time, things seemed to be normal, so much so that we decided to have children. And to make my wife feel calmer, we took one of her uncles into the home. Her uncle was an old man who, due to an accident at work, had been disabled, but his company made her feel good. Everything was going along well, so I dared to work out of state without concern. More than three months had passed since the last incident. It was already dark when I returned home after a work trip. My assistant and another trusted employee were with me. Upon arriving at the house, I was surprised to find the lights off. At first I thought they had just gone out, but I listened to the television and it was on. I moved over to the living room to see what was happening. I found my wife's uncle out of his chair. He was dead, and immediately I was alarmed. I began to scream for my wife. I finally found her, hidden to one side of the dining room, sitting in a large pool of blood, sobbing uncontrollably. Thinking someone had hurt her, I called emergency services. The paramedics immediately took my wife away confirming that she was fine, but that she had lost her baby. Upon checking the uncle, they just confirmed his death. They said that it was due to cardiac arrest, but his face reflected absolute terror. Had it not been for my assistant and the other worker accompanying me and serving as witness, the police probably would have accused me of harming my wife and killing her uncle, as they found nothing that suggested the entry was forced. There was no evidence of a stranger in our home. My wife spent three weeks in intensive care until she finally began to show improvement. When she woke up, due to the trauma, she had lost her memory. She doesn't even remember me. I have taken her to psychiatrists. Even with hypnosis, we've tried to make her remember. But as soon as she begins to relive what happened, she becomes completely hysterical. She'll just say, here it comes. Here comes the one who will harm us. Take care of him. We've never been able to find out who he is, what he is, or what he wants. Due to the state of her health, I was forced to confine her to a psychiatric hospital in Guadalajara City. I visit whenever possible, although she doesn't remember me. She believes that I am a friend. After everything was over, I returned to the house, and the first thing I saw when I opened the door were those damn boots in a pool of blood next to the basement. Since then, I haven't returned to the house, which is, to date, uninhabited, as it has been completely impossible for me to sell it. I know what you're going to think, but I really need you to hear me out. I firmly believe in the existence of aliens, but I'm also very skeptical of evidence that's presented. But after what happened to me, I don't know what to believe. 
So, a couple of years ago, I had picked up my sister from her school dance, and we were on the drive home. The road we took to get home had no street lights and about three homes along the side of it. This road was in the middle of wine country. It was about 9 p.m. in the winter, so the sun had gone down a while past and the road was pitch black. The road was hilly, so when you reached at the top of one of the hills, you could see all the way down the road. There were no other cars on the road. As I was driving, some kind of machine or craft went by about 30 feet in front of my car from the left side of the road to the right. The speed is not something I can be 100% sure of, but I know that it was going by fast enough that I couldn't make out its shape. All I could see was that it had what appeared to be headlights on all sides, no brake lights in the back. It had to be about six to eight feet long, but again, it went by so fast that I cannot be positive on that number. At first, I dismissed it as some kid riding around on a dirt bike or an ATV. On the right side of the road was a huge field, so I figured that once I got to where it had gone by, I would have been able to see whatever it was in the field. I reached where the craft had gone, but there was nothing. I drove around a bend where you could see the whole field and there was nothing to be seen. I was and am so confused about what I saw that night. I mean, maybe it could have been somebody on a bike or a cart, but I've never seen any man-made vehicle that has white headlights on all sides, that moves that fast, and that can disappear in moments. This all started a few months ago. My friend and I found out about skinwalkers, and for a while I just knew that I had one following me. But after a while everything stopped. But now things have progressively gotten worse. It all started as one night I was talking about creepy things on the phone with a friend of mine. Some things started happening. Lights would flicker, my phone wouldn't charge, the fan would turn on and off, things like that but there was never an electrical problem in the house. Then the nightmare started. Every night for weeks, I would have a nightmare about a skinwalker or moving to a new house and it being haunted with demons or losing somebody that I love. The dreams don't sound that bad, but trust me, they were terrifying. One of the skinwalker ones was so bad that I didn't sleep for days because quite frankly, I was too afraid to. I've never had nightmares like this before. And then the sleep paralysis started. It's always a girl or a monster that stands in the corner and gets closer every time I blink until it's right on top of me, choking me, and then I snap out of it. It's terrifying, and now every time I'm by myself in the darkness, I have this heavy feeling of being watched. It's so bad that it gives me immediate anxiety. I hear things calling my name out of my window, and it smells like rotting meat. Things scratch the side of the house. It's awful. I can never fall asleep because I'm afraid of what's in store for me when I do. And it's always the same demon in the dreams. Sometimes when I wake up, I see it, and it fades into the darkness. Once in my nightmare, it whispered into my ear and said, I will follow you throughout your life. If you look into the darkest corner of your room, you will always see me staring back at you. Someone please help me with what this is. No one will listen, and I think I'm losing my mind. So, I'm not really sure how to explain what has happened in my apartment recently, but I will give it a shot. So my girlfriend and I moved into our first floor, two-bedroom apartment in February. One of the bedrooms seemed to have an odor that irritated my girlfriend and her mom's cat allergies. 
We just assumed that the previous tenant had a cat, even though they said they didn't. Anyway, the landlord had a professional carpet cleaning company come and clean the room, but the odor remained, just not as prominent. Usually we just kept that door closed. I work from 1 p.m. to 1 a.m., so I'm not home until usually 2 a.m. My girlfriend started telling me that she would hear people in the kitchen during the night. You can't hear any of our neighbors talk, even during the day. I mostly just brushed it off, until one night when I woke up at 4 a.m. for no reason. I heard a deep voice right behind me say, Hey there. And that was just the start. A few weeks later, when I got home at 2 a.m., I was in the bathroom getting ready for bed. I was facing the door of the bathroom, looking out into the apartment, but I had my head turned looking at my back in the mirror. I saw what I thought was my girlfriend walk out of the room and go to the kitchen. It spooked me, and I looked out and didn't see anybody in the apartment. I checked our room, and my girlfriend was still in bed. The next morning, my girlfriend woke me up and asked if I had knocked her lunchbox off the refrigerator when I got home. I told her that I hadn't, but it was on the floor when I got home. It wasn't even on the edge when I put my ice pack back in the freezer. She also asked if I had gone into the other bedroom when I got home, because the door was slightly ajar, and I told her no. So, we still aren't sure what's been happening in our apartment. It seems to only happen in waves because nothing of note has happened in a week or two. So this happened roughly six years ago in Pennsylvania, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I was working for Burger King at the time, and I had just gotten off the night shift at roughly midnight. I was driving home, and I saw a light that was about 50 feet off the ground. It had an orangish glow like a street light. I could see it very clearly. The night sky was clear, and there was no fog at all. I thought it was just a new street light that had gotten put up. I just kept staring at it. Out of nowhere, this thing shot straight up in the air and just vanished. It gave me chills and made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Ever since that day, I have always looked to the sky on my drives home from the job that I have now. I don't know if it was extraterrestrial or what, but it was something. I had just gotten back from the beach, and I went inside the house, looking for my grandmother. The door was unlocked, and she never leaves without locking the door. I didn't see her on the couch, and her bedroom door was not closed, so I knew she wasn't taking a nap. But it was just odd that she wasn't on the couch or the front porch. I glanced at the table, and there was no note. I called for her and I heard a kind of muffled sound that I thought might have been a muffled call for help. I ran to the back. I didn't see her on the bed, so I ran to the bathroom, and she wasn't there either. I called again for her, and I didn't hear anything. So I looked around the bathroom once more, and then back to the bedroom. I swear that I saw her laying on the floor in the bedroom. I saw her long enough and well enough to see what she was wearing a blue sweater, and jeans. I blinked, and she wasn't there. For a moment, I thought I just imagined it, so I ran to the front of the house and looked around. I thought maybe I should go get my mom. This time, though, I saw my grandma's neon yellow notepad on the kitchen table, so bright that it was impossible not to see, and there was a note saying she'd gone across the street for a second. I looked at that table and there was no note before. I felt so disoriented and confused for a second. I went back outside, and there was my grandmother with the neighbor. She was wearing a completely different outfit, too. I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want to freak anybody out. 
I just kind of hope whoever that other person I saw got help passing on, or whatever they needed. Long story short, I signed my grandma up for a clothing subscription. You know, the kind that you fill out a questionnaire and a stylist picks things out for you and sends them to you in the mail. You try them on and keep what you like. It's like a subscription box. Anyway, my grandmother called me and said that she wanted to keep everything, so I logged into her account to mark everything. Guys, I shit you not. The sweater that my grandma was wearing when I had seen her on the floor? She received it in that pack. I'm kind of freaking out. I want to tell her, but again, I also don't want to come off like a weirdo. I mean, she already knows I'm weird, I just don't want her to think I'm that kind of weird. I guess I'm safe for a while because it's the summer and that's definitely a winter top, but I don't know. It makes me nervous. So this story happened about 20 years ago. You know, before cell phones and fast internet. When I was little, my family used to make a really big deal about Christmas. They made it a goal every year to go and see as many of our relatives as possible. I have six uncles, two aunts, and a crap load of cousins, and that's just on one side of the family. Because of how many people we had and the fact that everyone's Christmas plans with their other family members were all at different times, we used to celebrate Christmas with this side of the family at around 10 p.m. on Christmas Day. We would all hang out until well after midnight, and this was all at my grandma's house. My grandma's house is way out in the country. My grandpa was the pastor of a Baptist church that was conveniently located about 100 yards in front of their house. Religion was always a big deal, and we would always have church service first, and then presents. So this one Christmas, we were nearing the end of church service, and one of our elderly cousins, who was always there and spent the whole day and night with my grandparents every year, hadn't shown up. Let's call her Betty. Everyone was getting really worried about her. I was 10 at the time, but I could still see the worry in their faces, even though they tried to ease us kids. There was no answer at her house, and like I said, cell phones weren't really a thing back then. Also, to get to this tiny little town, you had to take this long, dark, curvy road way out into the woods, and we knew her eyesight was getting bad. Betty finally shows up, and as she pulls in, we all sigh in relief. But when she gets out of the car, she's white as a ghost. Everyone was trying to figure out what was wrong, but I think she was in shock because she wouldn't talk to anyone. Finally, after some time of resting, she told us that on the way there, it had been raining and a man was hitchhiking along this dark stretch of road. After nearly hitting him, she decided to have the Christmas spirit and pick him up against her better judgment because it just wasn't safe for him to be there. She made him sit in the back because she wasn't completely comfortable with the situation. And as she was driving along, she started talking to him. You know, just pleasantries. And the man wouldn't talk back. Finally, trying to figure out what was wrong, she looked into the back seat at the man. And his face was changing colors. And his appearance was scary, as she put it. When he finally spoke to her, he said in a very loud voice, Gabriel's horn is to his mouth. And then he completely vanished from the back seat. Now, when it comes to the paranormal, I'm usually a skeptic, but this one makes my stomach turn because of the type of person Betty was. She was a God-fearing woman who was elderly and definitely not the type of person to lie in any fashion. She also wasn't really the joking or prankster type. So, it being well thought out and some kind of elaborate prank is out of the question. To this day, it still gives me chills. About two years ago, I had a dream where my friend and I, I'll call him John, 
were at an old abandoned barn, seemingly in the middle of nowhere. We were on the outside of the barn just talking when dusk started to set in. So I told John that I had to be going or I would be late. I started down the path that led around the barn to wherever I knew I had to be going. I remember it just being a simple dirt path with a simple wooden fence running along the left-hand side of it, leading into a wood line about 100 to 200 yards away. As I turned the path around the barn, I looked up and noticed a humanoid figure in the middle of the path, about 20 yards away. Naturally, I was startled, so I turned to John. For some reason, he'd been following me, and I hadn't questioned it, to ask if he saw it too, but he was gone. I turned back, and the figure stood in the same spot. For some reason, I continued along until I got about 5 to 10 feet from it, and was able to suddenly make out its features. The moment I looked upon the figure close up, I recognized it immediately as Death or the Grim Reaper, as traditionally pictured. But it was unlike any iteration I'd ever seen or have seen since. It had your typical dark hooded robe, but its skull-like face shimmered like an emerald in the sunlight, with two small red orbs in its eye sockets. The part that I remembered disturbing me the most was his friendly smile that stretched from ear to ear. His mouth and teeth were like a bottomless pit of darkness, and his teeth resembled that of a shark. The part that I think really caught me off guard was when he spoke. He had what I remember being a surprisingly normal voice. It was actually fairly pleasant to listen to. His words are the main thing that still puzzle me because I feel like there's some meaning to them. After making eye contact and smiling, he told me, you're a day late for judgment. And that's when I woke up. It's the only dream in my life that I remembered that vividly when I awoke, and the only dream or thought that I've ever been compelled to write down. I still carry that page folded up in my wallet. Does anyone have any theories as to what this might mean, if anything? I told my friend who was in the dream, and he thinks it's connected to the time when I was about 14. I drowned in the reservoir, but I was pulled back out by my brother, and I came back. The last thing I remember from drowning was letting go, and a peace overcoming me before I blacked out. Then, nothingness before I awoke on the boat with my brother over me. My brother estimated I had been underwater for at least a few minutes before he managed to get to me. Maybe I was supposed to have died then and didn't. Maybe that's why I'm late for judgment. Whatever the reason, I'm very interested to hear what anybody else might think. My paranormal experiences started really early on. It started with my sister and a group of her friends playing with a Ouija board when we were younger. My sister and her friends were between the ages of 10 and 12, and I was just 7. My grandmother told me that because I was the youngest and the most innocent of the group, something latched on to me. I have many stories to tell, but here are some of the shorter ones. My mom saw a black figure which looked like a person crawling on all fours with dislocated joints, coming down the hallway and wearing one of my Halloween masks. When my mom turned to face it, it disappeared. She screamed my name thinking that it was me trying to scare her. When she saw that I poked my head out of the day room, which was added on to our trailer, her face lost color. She realized it couldn't have been me. She had me go into my room and dig out a Halloween mask that was a skull faceplate with horns around the top. She said the figure was wearing it, and she wanted it out of the house. On three separate occasions, my grandmother had woken up to a little boy wearing an early 19th century sailor suit. When she looked at him closer, she could see that his skin was pale and that it was dark blue and black around his eyes and lips. Another time, I was playing with my dog by throwing a blanket over my head, and he would pull the blanket off. 
One time when I was doing this, my dog started to whimper. Before I could take the blanket off to see what was wrong, I heard a deep, raspy male voice breathe heavily in my ear. My dog proceeded to freak out and bark. These are the shorter stories that I have, but my entire life has basically been haunted. Moral of the story, don't mess around with Ouija boards. During my childhood, I used to live in the city of Patna, Bihar. We used to live in a joint family. Back in 2006, my cousin's sister, I'll call her S, had relocated to Bangalore to attend her engineering college. S was always cheerful, respectful, and courteous. None of us could ever have imagined what was about to happen to her. One day, the doorbell rang and I went to open the door. When I opened it, I saw that S was standing there with a solemn look on her face. Our family ushered her in and asked her about her trip home, about 1,500 kilometers. She said that she had no recollection of the trip. We later found out that she had taken a flight home, although she claimed to have no idea she had done so. The next six months are as easy to recount as they were painful to live through. S started exhibiting signs of depression, although some in the family felt that there was something more sinister going on. She wouldn't talk to anyone. She wouldn't eat properly. At times, she would start burning up with a fever and scream for it to stop. At night, she would start laughing maniacally or sometimes wail and tear her hair out. If someone tried to console her, she'd outpour a filthy barrage of abuses in this gruff, animalistic voice. Since my other sister is a psychiatrist, she promptly diagnosed her with depression stemming from low self-esteem while in college and started a course of medication. The medication was administered to her regularly for six months, but her condition never improved. My maternal aunt and uncle had reached a breaking point and they decided to seek the help of a master tantric, an occult practitioner, and honestly, they would have done just about anything to get their daughter back. The tantric in question was supposed to be extremely clairvoyant and adept at the occult sciences. When he entered our home, S began to scream and wail at the mere sight of him. The tantric just stared at her for a while and then told us he would be going home to perform the exorcism ritual and we should ensure that S didn't leave the house during that time. After exactly three hours, S again started to scream, although this time she tried to run out of the house. It took four or five of the biggest guys in our family to pin her down to the bed so she wouldn't run out. She still tried jumping out of the window. Her screaming brought the entire neighborhood out who gathered around the house to watch the spectacle. After about an hour, she fell completely silent and slept like a baby for six hours. When she woke up, she calmly asked us what she was doing in her home and why she wasn't at the college hostel where she was supposed to be. She had turned completely normal, except that she had no memory of the last six months. My maternal uncle and aunt met the tantric and asked him what had happened to their daughter. The tantric nonchalantly replied that somebody had put a lower class of Muslim spirit called a jinn on her. He said that the spirit was induced inside her through first attaching the spirit to a hair, which was then mixed in biryani, a traditional Muslim rice dish, and fed to her. He also told them he knew the identity of the person who did it, but he wasn't allowed to reveal it to them. My uncle then went home and carefully asked S about the last thing she remembered from college without giving her any information about what the tantric had said. She told them that she had this Muslim friend who was in love with her and had proposed to her a few months ago. She wasn't interested in him and politely refused his advances. The guy begged her to remain friends, and she agreed. She said her very last memory was the day of Aid when the Muslim guy had invited her for lunch and served her biryani. She couldn't recollect anything after that. My aunt refused to let her go back to college after that, 
She continued her education in a local college and later moved to the U.S. and is living a normal life. We do avoid any mention of what happened to her, though. Sometimes it triggers pretty bad memories. The Fairbanks, Alaska area has an older cemetery, Clay Street, that I was drawn to for a while when I was 18. A boyfriend of the time had family buried there, and we visited to keep the graves clean. Me being the edgelord I was, I took a picture on one of the gravestones. It was the grave of a little girl, and it stuck with me, so I made peace with her by leaving a cute little picture. I often have dreams of this ex-boyfriend and that I'm pregnant with a little girl, not pregnant by him now, just a dream. There are a lot of areas in Fairbanks that give me a nope vibe. The gold dredge out by the Chattanooga Lodge, that always gives me a bad vibe and is said to be haunted. I spent a lot of my childhood in Valdez and we would always go hang out at the old Pioneer or Chinese cemetery out by Rogue River. Old Town Valdez, the OG Valdez that had to be destroyed because of the 64 earthquake, has a weird vibe too. Valdez often has reports of UFO sightings. I believe I've seen one too. There are satellites that monitor the pipeline, but you can detect the pattern and know what they look like. Unless the pattern and lights changed for a few minutes for some reason on the satellite and then it was definitely a UFO. There have been reports of alien abductions in the Nome area. One day, I innocently wore my alien shirt out there, and I had to change. Apparently, they get a lot of alien hunt tourism, and it's not welcomed. In this area, there's really nowhere for people to go unless they fly out. People chalk up random disappearances here as people just getting drunk and falling into the ocean or getting eaten by wildlife. Considering the culture there, that is likely the explanation. But still. One of the dorms at UAF had a student there who was murdered with no witnesses, and the case has been cold for nearly 30 years. They never remodeled the bathroom she was found in. One day I had this weird urge to sit in the tub there, so a friend of mine went and did that. It felt surreal to just sit in an empty tub in this bathroom. We were both overcome with this overwhelming sadness likely due to us sitting there in this tragic bathtub. All I know is the Fairbanks area is really weird, and so are a lot of areas out there. Who knows what any of it means? Growing up, I had a ton of weird experiences, but I think this is one of the hardest to explain. It happened when I was about three years old. For context, my mom fell pregnant with me a month after her aunt died in a fatal car crash. When I was born, I would often react to things that nobody else could see, usually with laughter or cute baby noises. Eventually, as I grew older, I had an imaginary friend. When I was asked what she looked like or what her personality was like, apparently I described my mom's aunt exactly. Anyway, back to the story. I'm a small child and can't talk properly yet. I'm walking to see my grandma with my mom, which was about 10 to 15 minutes away. We're walking down a small, quiet residential road that has a junction at the end and probably about 30 yards away from the junction. As we start to approach the end of the road, my body language changed and I started to panic. I grabbed onto my mom with both hands and started screaming, no mommy, no. My mom looked ahead and saw nothing, just a quiet residential street. She tried to calm me down, but with all my might, I held onto her and tried to physically prevent her from walking any farther. I just kept shouting, no mommy, no. She started to get frustrated as this went on for about two minutes. All of a sudden, there was a huge crash. My mom looked up and at the end of the road, a car had completely lost control. 
gone over the side of the road and crashed into a front garden wall, exactly where we would have been walking if I hadn't made a fuss. Still to this day, we can't explain it. It was so out of character for me to have done something like that, and I could honestly only speak a few words. It surely would have killed me, and probably my mom, too. I literally owe my life to whatever it was that saved us that day. Since then, I occasionally have premonition dreams that turn out to be true. Or I can wake with a sense that a friend I haven't seen for a while is upset. It isn't as often as I'd like it to be, and I'm still never 100% sure if it's coincidence or if I'm onto something. Any advice would be appreciated. This happened in Daytona Beach, Florida in 2012. It was the summer between my freshman and sophomore years in high school. A little background. My grandparents lived in Florida at the time. Close-ish to Daytona, but not in Daytona. We decided to take a vacation within a vacation and spend a weekend at a hotel in Daytona. When we got there, for whatever reason, my grandparents decided that they didn't want to stay and that they would come pick up my mom and I at the end of the weekend since they only lived about an hour away. My mom and I asked them to please drop us off at Joe's Crab Shack for dinner and said we would walk back to our hotel. Somehow, we completely misjudged how far away the restaurant was from our hotel, so it ended up being this insanely long walk. We were expecting it to be about two to three miles, but it ended up being more like six or seven. On the way back to the hotel, it got dark on us. There was enough light from the street to be able to see pretty decently, but to get up to the street, we would have to go through an alleyway, and we just didn't feel comfortable with that, so we decided to stay on the beach. Now, I want to say, even though it was dark, there was a full moon and enough light from the street that whenever we passed a person, we could clearly make out their face if we were close enough. So while the dark may have played a small factor in this, I don't think it was enough of a factor to make me just dismiss the experience. So as we're walking, we see a light headed toward us about six-ish feet off the ground. We weren't too concerned because it looked like somebody going the opposite direction as us wearing a headlamp, maybe taking a nighttime stroll on the beach. As the light got closer, we noticed that it was extremely steady not like somebody walking, and especially not like somebody walking on sand. As it got close to us, this is what we saw. A cloaked figure wearing a brown monk-like cloak with a large hood. It was not walking, but just gliding along. In fact, there were no visible feet. There was a light shining out from under the hood of the cloak, but there was no face. Except for the light, it appeared to be completely black inside, almost like an empty cloak floating through the air without a person inside it. It didn't seem to notice us, and just glided on past. My mom and I remember this event exactly the same way. I'm a very scientific person, but I still can't really explain this, as it was definitely light enough that we should have seen a face and feet, but we didn't. Has anybody else come across something like this? What do you think it was? One time, my mom and I were going out for lunch. We have two dogs. One that's 100 pounds and another that's 50 pounds, so they aren't small. My mom told me to let them outside before we left. They were going to stay out there and play, use the bathroom and all that while we were gone. So I did. An hour later, we get back and our dogs are not outside. Okay, I thought maybe I didn't let them out, even though I know I did. We check the house which is one story and about a thousand square feet, so not huge. Nothing. Well, maybe they are outside and they just aren't coming to us. There are plenty of hiding spots in our backyard, with two sheds, a lot of trees, 
and a sectioned off area that we call the squirrel yard. We once had a pet squirrel, but that's another story. The dogs can't get into the squirrel yard, so I go outside searching everywhere for them. Nothing. Well, now we're considering the fact that somehow our dogs got out. So we check the perimeter of our yard. We have a six foot privacy fence, so our dogs cannot jump it, but they have been known to dig holes under it. Here's the thing, no holes, none. Absolutely no way that they could have squeezed under that fence. So now we're thinking somebody stole our dogs. Our 100 pound dog looks like a pit bull mix, so it would make sense that they would get stolen because of dog fights and stuff like that. And maybe they took the 50 pound one for similar reasons. But the thing is, they would have had to climb the privacy fence because the fence is padlocked and the locks were still in place. And even if they did that, how would they get these dogs over the fence? The short answer, nobody could do that. So we nixed that idea and turned to checking our house locks. Maybe they came inside. Nah, everything was locked, even the windows. Well, maybe the dogs are inside and they're hiding. We checked everywhere, under the beds, in the closets, even in rooms that were closed off. Nothing. I go back outside, and I end up taking the grate off from our access point to the crawl space. I crawl around under the house. They aren't there. Our last bet is to go search the neighborhood, and even though there is logically no way that they could have gotten out, we still go. We leave the house, all the doors locked per usual, and we begin searching. Nothing. An hour later, we come home, dejected, planning our next move. I'm about to go into the crawl space again when I hear my mom shouting for me. There, laying in their beds, sound asleep, were our dogs. No one else has keys to our house. No locks were broken. All windows were shut and locked. There's no logical way for our dogs to have left our property and suddenly reappear. And they were totally fine. One of them is scared of everything, so it would have made sense for him to be freaking out if something had happened, but nope. This took place over the course of three hours, from the time we got home to when they magically reappeared. We still can't figure out how our dogs just disappeared, where they went, or how they got back. I don't know if it's some glitch in the matrix or what, but we were pretty freaked out. I'm fairly skeptical of the paranormal, so I don't really know what to believe. But the only stories that are even a little similar to what I experienced all seem to be paranormal. To give some backstory, my street and neighborhood are pretty quiet, especially at night due to the number of young families and elderly couples that live on my street, which makes staying up into the early hours of the morning more relaxing and also a bit cooler, knowing that I'm most likely the only person on my street that's awake. The only thing is that I've had some creepy experiences, like hearing noises or even seeing a few drug deals, but most of that can be chalked up to living next to a big forest with lots of wildlife or just some sketchy neighbors. But for the past week, I've been trying to find a logical explanation for the strange events that keep occurring. It started at 2 a.m. last Tuesday morning. I was just sitting in my bed, on my phone with earbuds in, something I do almost every night, when I began to hear whistling coming from out my window. I took my earbuds out and began listening to the whistle, trying to come up with an explanation. Normally I'm not scared by anything in my neighborhood this late. And to be honest, I get more excited that something's happening and that I'm there to witness it. But this time felt different. I wanted so badly to get up, to look out my window, but I was almost paralyzed with fear. I don't know what came over me, but every minute that went by of this whistling, I felt the pit in my stomach growing larger. 
It went on for almost an hour, and for the entire hour I waited for the whistling to start a tune or a song I could look up. But it just kept whistling the same note in a strange pattern. It would whistle one note for a good minute, then take a break for about 30 seconds, and then return to its one minute whistle. Until about 20 minutes in, when the whistles got shorter and closer together, only to return to the original pattern after about 10 minutes. What was even stranger was that whatever it was, was pacing in front of mine and my neighbor's house up until it stopped when it retreated back down the other side of the street. As I heard it leave, I almost immediately felt the pit in my stomach subside, and while I was still confused, I decided I should just go to sleep before I scared myself even more. So the next day, I asked my parents and even some of my friends that live close by if they had ever heard anything like that. Everyone assumed it was some kind of animal, which made me feel a lot better. But I wanted a definite answer of what I heard. I stayed up for hours that night, researching types of animals that were local to my area and the noises they made. I didn't find anything that matched. This only left me more frustrated that I had no clue what it was. So I continued staying up in hopes that I would hear it again, and that this time I would look out my window to see it. But with my luck, I've never heard the whistling again. Except, lots of weird things have been happening. After the whistle, I began hearing somebody, or something, walking around in mine and my neighbor's driveways and sometimes even yards, very late at night. But whenever I go to check, I can't see anything. Then about two nights ago, I swear I saw a figure of a person lurking behind my neighbor's car. And then the night after that, I saw what looked like a flashlight in the woods near my house. And whatever was holding that flashlight was running out of the woods. Then again last night, I swear I saw a person crouching near my neighbor's car, just looking around. I thought I was done researching because I couldn't find anything about animals. But now I've begun researching any stories even similar to mine, hoping that either I'm not alone, or even better, somebody has the answer to the strange occurrences going on. Because I would like to start sleeping at more normal times again, and not have to be worried about either a stalker or a poltergeist or something else, coming to get me in my sleep. I ride my bicycle at night. To me, there is nothing more freeing than the sensation that I have the world to myself and I can explore and adventure as I please. Last night, I was biking through the neighborhood of my childhood and teenage years. I was in a mood for a bit of nostalgic melancholy, I suppose. There's a road where the development ends that I called the Creepy Wood Street when I was a kid. One side has houses, the other is a train track topped hill. The name came from before the area was expanded, and it was a dirt track cutting through the woods. So I was on the former creepy woods area when I noticed something felt... off. I felt a presence, and I can only say it felt like... rot. It's hard to articulate it precisely. Around the time that I became aware of this presence, I became aware of something else. Silence. The crickets had stopped their chorus, and the air seemed to keep moving, but the rustle of the trees and bushes were somehow muted. Strangely, there was a sensation that these were faded out, rather than an immediate cessation. About this time, I began to feel... hunted. I guess fight or flight told me in no uncertain terms that flight was the answer and I began to pedal like a maniac. I had the notion to not look back. I'm not sure why, but I didn't question it. When I got off the road, I felt a little bit better, but I still felt 
watched. It was then that I heard what a lot of folks would think is a blood-curdling scream, but I recognized it as a vixen's call. We have a ton of foxes in my area. I somehow felt drawn to it, and sure enough, as I turned off toward it, I saw her. A red vixen. This was a little unique, as I have only seen brown ones before. She regarded me a moment, and then ran off toward the creepy wood street. I didn't think a lot of it, until I saw a fox at the next turn who did the same, then again at the next intersection, which was the road leading out of the neighborhood. Granted, I knew the way out, but I felt like I was being guided by them somehow, protected. All of them also dashed off after looking at me a moment, all toward the road where I felt like something was after me. I'm so curious to know what anybody else thinks. I'd like to know if anybody has any idea what the thing after me was, and why the foxes seemed to show me a safe path. It was a really cool experience, whatever it was. We have a home video of me at around three years old. I'm just sitting in the bathtub talking to my mom about whatever three-year-olds have to talk about. The video seems like your average home video of a toddler, talking. Until I stopped my current train of thought, and abruptly insert that my dad has broken his neck. My mom stops me and asks why I would say that, and of course I didn't have an answer. I just repeated myself and said it again, and then went back to talking about whatever I had been talking about before. The video was filmed in a house in the town I was born in, and soon we moved into my old grandparents' house in another town. My dad had been working the graveyard shift when we moved into the new house, and one night he was later than usual coming home. My mom had stayed up waiting for him, but his dad showed up at our house instead saying that we had to go to the hospital. My dad had been falling asleep at the wheel and had hit a car head-on while coming home. The crash broke his neck. I remember going to see him at the hospital that night, but I didn't remember having said that this exact thing was going to happen some six or seven months before. My dad lived and is all right now, and my mom showed me the video when I was around 12. My dad said that his brothers had predicted things or said things out of nowhere that ended up happening too. I feel like it's all just an odd coincidence rather than having a family of people who have predicted multiple events. But the date on the tape and the house that we lived in are from before my dad's accident. The tape is there and the date shows it to be true, but I still have a hard time believing I said what I did, when I did. My stepdad was always a dry man. His humor was always what you would expect from someone born in the 1940s. He was devout in his faith as a Christian and hated superstition. It intrigued me then. In 2006, he confessed, and I say confess, because he tells his story in a tone that didn't really fit the mood of the night that he told us. We were all just eating dinner, talking about the Patriots football game. And that's when he tells me of a time that he took the train from Chicago to southern Wisconsin that stops in Kenosha. He was on the near-empty train, by himself, when he looks out the window and sees a frozen pond, very small, about ten feet from the train. He sees about a dozen small men in green outfits. Some have top hats. Some have pointed hats of red and gold. He was shocked. It was a traditional Midwest winter, lightly snowing. He was so shocked that he shared the experience with a random woman who was sitting across from him. 
She noticed it too, and the both of them watched in fascination and horror. They said that they were scared, that their train cart was so empty that nobody else seemed to notice. The train began to move, and they moved on. As a teenager, you can imagine my brothers and I asking many questions. In my rational mind, I thought perhaps it was an issue of scale. Maybe it appeared that they were short little men, but he said that it was so close to the train, and the pond was so small, that there was no issue in scale or perspective. He says that he knows he saw little gnomish men ice skating and doing acrobatics on a small little pond in the middle of winter. It's interesting because now that I'm nearly 30, my husband told me a story recently about when he was 19. He was playing Game Boy at 9 p.m. in bed, and a little man with a pointy hand was at the foot of his bed. And when he noticed him, the little man ran under the covers and disappeared. When I was in the third or fourth grade, I saw a UFO with my older cousin and little brother. This was in Voorhees, New Jersey, during our summer vacation. We were in a high-end apartment complex and had gone outside to go play. This was in the late 90s. We had decided to first see who was out before deciding on what toys to bring out with us. Think water guns, bikes, scooters, Pokemon cards, things like that. We were going to go to the park first, but heard a strange high-pitched whistling noise down the hill from our apartment building near the mailboxes. It was the kind of whistling noise that brought about a strange energy. I noticed everything seemed really quiet, except for this whistling. I say whistling, but that's the closest sound we have in this world that people would collectively be able to understand. But it wasn't exactly whistling. It gave me the creeps. I wasn't scared, I just felt uneasy. My older cousin decided to go check it out. He ran down the hill, and I saw him turn his head left and just stop dead in his tracks. I saw his jaw drop and his eyes go big. He said, oh my gosh, come look at this, it's a UFO. My brother and I were both younger and weary of him since he was known to be a prankster and mischievous. We didn't want to come, and he was like, you won't regret it. He looked at us in such a way that I believed him, so I went down to go look as well. There was an apartment building blocking the view of the UFO, so I walked slowly to where I would pass it and be standing by my cousin. As I neared the location, this whistling noise became louder. I started to see the UFO floating and hovering right next to the balcony of a family we knew because they had older kids that would sometimes play with us. The UFO was about the size of a large pickup truck, and it was giant and metallic, but not a metallic ball. It was spinning really fast and looked as if it should have been able to reflect its surroundings because it was so shiny, but it didn't. The whistling was this ball spinning so fast, yet so slowly as well. It had that saucer thing around it, but not huge or anything. Maybe the saucer it was spinning inside was only about three feet in width. But the UFO had to have had a diameter about the length of a Ford Tundra. I was in absolute awe. I felt like I'd won something. Like, yes, there's proof. And I know something that my parents don't know. My brother had been calling to us, and I hadn't been paying attention. I just told him to come and look. He was always shy and a crybaby, but he came reluctantly. I was just observing this thing spinning and thinking that it had to be observing me too. I noticed in the sky there was like a tunnel of a spinning energy or clouds in the air. That tunnel went straight up into the sky and far away, and the UFO, or its copy, 
was on the other side way off in the distance. My cousin wanted to throw a rock at it and tell them to get out. My little brother screamed his panic scream and told him no. I also told him not to do that. He listened to us, but I guess they felt his hostility, and the UFO moved back and higher. My cousin said, see, they're scared, let's make them go, and he started screaming and saying go away and get out. My brother and I joined. I can't remember if we actually did start throwing rocks or not, but I don't think we did. That part gets murky. The tunnel looked like it got bigger in size, and the UFO started looking like it was appearing in the tunnel, even though it was right in front of us. It was like there was a delay, and we could see snapshots of the UFO in the tunnel going up, like a loading bar where it's copying itself. There was a loud sound like a whoosh, and my little brother screamed and bolted home. The UFO was no longer in front of us, but the tunnel was still there, and we could see like a bright light and the UFO at the end of the tunnel, and then it was gone. We ran home to tell my mom. When we got there, my mom was pissed and thought that my cousin and I had tricked my brother and scared him. She couldn't quite understand through my brother's hysterical crying what he was saying, only heard that they made me see the aliens. We saw no aliens, and we explained this to my mom. We explained what we saw, and I said, Mom, it's real. I was the only girl, and my mom believed me because I wasn't one to lie or prank. I used to keep a diary, and I wrote this experience down. I forgot about it, and somehow it had felt like a dream over the years. We had moved to a new house. Many strange things happened there. And something absolutely terrifying and awe-inspiring happened that made me check my diary. I had asked my brother if he remembered the UFO, and he said he did. He told me the story and it matched what was in my diary. We called my uncle and cousin and had my cousin retell his side of the story. Years later, all of our stories matched. I've had three UFO encounters. I'll tell them here. Number one. In the summer of 2011 or 2012, I was 12 years old, and my mom, my sister, and I were all driving out to California to drop my sister off at boarding school. I was sitting in the back seat doing whatever, when all of a sudden my mom says, Hey, look up in the sky. You may never see this again in your life. When I looked up, I remember seeing this orange dot in the sky, just sitting there. Well, to me it looked like that, but my mom said that it followed us throughout the whole ride. People on the highway were slowing their cars down and looking out their windows to try to see what this thing was, when it suddenly let out this really bright flash and continued to hover. I still vividly remember seeing a plane fly by it as well. We called my brother, who was an astronomy enthusiast at the time, and tried to ask him what he thought it was that we were seeing, but he had no idea. Months later, I told a former science teacher of mine the story and asked what he thought of it. But he couldn't explain it either. Number two. This one takes place three years after the first event. By now, I was 15 and it was winter. I was getting ready for the night and already had my PJs on, when suddenly my mom said, Hey, you want to see a UFO? I, being an enthusiast of the unknown, happily obliged and went outside. When I got there, I remember seeing these lights just hovering over our backyard. I remember seeing two, but my mom and stepdad said that there were three and that they were in a perfect triangle. I remember they kept changing color and we were all sitting out there trying to figure out what they were. From what I can recall, they had been out there for days. Finally, in 2016, I was 16 years old, and I was driving with a friend of mine back from camp. We were near our home when we saw this bright light just hovering. 
At first, I thought it was a helicopter, but he pointed out that it was too close to be that. As we got closer, we saw that it was triangular in shape. I told him to pull over and get a picture. We pulled over, and I remember that it took him forever to eventually get the camera. By then, I was watching this thing, and it was slowly moving away. When he finally got his camera together, it had already disappeared. This one could easily be explained, as it could have been a military drone. We were close to some military base thing. But either way, it was still very interesting. It was October 26th of 2017. It was the night before Season 2 of Stranger Things came out. As a huge fan, I was super excited and decided to stay up the whole night to watch all of it. I was half awake, half asleep, watching YouTube when I started hearing a light banging noise on the downstairs window. It was almost like a bird had flown into it and was flapping its wings against it. Keep in mind, I live in a heavily wooded area, so it's not that uncommon to have animals around your house at night. I just ignored it and figured it was a bird. About two to three minutes later, I hear three sets of three bangs, except it sounded more like a human doing it this time. I tried to listen to see if I could hear anything like talking or laughing. I hear nothing at all, like absolutely nothing. So I kind of just ignore it again. Time goes on, and again, two to three minutes later, more bangs. Except this wasn't like a bang that a human could do without tools. It sounded like the equivalent of someone banging a hammer against the side of my house. At this point, I am scared to death, and I'm thinking about calling the cops. But I decide I'm just going to wait, and if it happens one more time, I will. This time, it's at least five minutes before the next knocks. These were just like the last one where it sounded like a hammer. Except this time, it was all around my house. It sounded like there were a hundred people banging all at once. The speed at which the bangs were happening was just not something a human could do. At that point, I decided to run to the kitchen to grab a knife. I grabbed my dog and ran up to my room, locking the door. I calmed down for a second, and out of nowhere, my neighbor texts me, asking if I hear the banging too. So at this point, I know I'm not crazy. I decided to call 911 as the knocking was still happening. I'd say a minute later, the knocking stops, and soon after, a few cops came and searched the entire house, yard, and a decent bit of the woods. They looked on the windows and siding for any sort of handprint or any sort of proof that somebody was knocking. Absolutely nothing. Now this is the part that really gets me. Earlier that night it was raining, so the ground was quite muddy. They looked for any sort of shoe print or even an animal print. Absolutely nothing. The only prints they found were their own. Years later, about two weeks ago actually, I was walking through the woods grabbing my motion-activated camera to check the footage. It's about 7pm, so it's by no means dark, but it's starting to get a little bit. I'm a decent way into the woods at this point, when I hear this god-awful noise. I don't even know what to call it. It was like a wailing, but it was so loud. It was like oohs and ahs and screeches all mixed together. It sounded like screaming, but higher and more intense. It was horrific. No human could make a noise like that. There was absolutely no way. After that, I hopped on my ATV and gunned it home, not looking back. No joke. When I got home, I checked my phone and the same neighbor that had asked about the knocking years earlier asked me if I had heard screaming while I was in the woods. I have absolutely no idea what this could be, 
but I know it was real because I wasn't the only one that heard it, and I sure as hell don't want to run into it. I wanted to share an experience that my best friend and I had about three to four years ago. I'm 17 currently, and he is 18. At the time, we were both Christian, and this experience scared the living hell out of us. I was spending the night at his house, and his mom wanted us to walk their dog before it got too late. It was around 8 to 9 at night. This wasn't the first time that we had walked around at night. In my friend's neighborhood, there's this elementary school. We would always go there and let his dog run around on the field. We arrived at the school, but we didn't feel like going on the field, so instead we decided to just walk around it. After passing the classrooms and the gym, we walked around the perimeter of the field, which has a chain link fence. I noticed that when we made a left toward the last stretch of fence, there were two people waiting on the curb across the street. We assumed it was just a couple out walking, but we couldn't really make them out, except for dark, human-like figures. We got a little spooked and decided to pick up the pace, not walking fast, but definitely not as slowly as we were before. I turned around, and they were following us. I whispered to my friend, and he saw them about 20 feet behind us on the corner that we had just turned. At this point, we weren't just spooked, we were pretty scared. We started to fast walk down the sidewalk. When we made it to the end of the chain link fence, about 30 feet from where I turned and whispered to my friend, we noticed that they had already made it all the way down the sidewalk before the corner we turned and first saw them at. There's no way they could have turned and made it there in time, even sprinting. My friend's dog started to whine, and we just decided to book it back to his place. This was the neighborhood he grew up in, and he knew a shortcut back to his house. The only other way to get to his home is to walk about two blocks on the main road. We were out of breath by the time we made it back, and we sprinted as fast as our legs could carry us. We opened his front gate, and I turned around just to see if anything was there. Lo and behold, there were two black, human-like figures on the main road, walking toward the house. There's no way that any people could have made it there in time, even if they did know where to go. We ran inside, locked the door, and prayed to God that nothing would happen. We googled how to get rid of demons, prayers we could use, and so on. Nothing else happened that night. We talked to our pastor, and he told us about an experience with a demon that he had as a child. He told us to memorize certain prayers and to trust in God. Since then, I haven't really thought about it until I read some other stories. We have no idea what it was that night that followed us. All we knew was that we had to run away as fast as possible. I've always had a belief in the unknown and spirits, but I had never really experienced anything from the unknown other than the typical deja vu we all experience from time to time. And then, high school happened. I have two stories about my own personal experiences. They are true events, even if people are skeptical. I know what I saw. I know what I felt. Believe whatever you want to believe, or believe what will help you sleep at night. But either way, these are true. Before I get into the stories, it's probably worth pointing out that I used to use Ouija boards with one of my friends. Stupid, I know. So when I was in high school, we lived in this neighborhood with an old textile mill in it. I always had a creepy vibe about the mill. I've never looked up if anything happened there because I've always been, and still am, afraid of what I might find. My bus stop used to be in front of the mill. 
and I had to start walking to school because I just couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched by someone or something at the mill. Now, two things happened after I started walking to school. One, I started seeing a little girl out of the corner of my eye about four or five in the mornings as I was getting ready for school. I was the only one awake at the time, so maybe she just felt comfortable appearing then. I never felt threatened by her, and I don't know her name, but she looked like she was maybe from the 20s. I actually stopped seeing her after a while, which made me kind of sad, even though her presence also sent a shiver down my spine. The second thing that happened was my brother and his friend decided to go in the mill, where, according to them, they found markings where a body was and dried blood. I don't know how true that is because I refuse to go into that place, but I still can't ever shake the feeling that something is watching me, even to this day. In fact, I think it has intensified since my brother and his friend went in there. Apparently now it's being remodeled and reopened. I hope they cleansed that building of any negative energies and spirits first, but somehow I doubt it. My second story takes place a few years after the incident with the little girl at my sweet 16. My parents threw me a surprise party with a luau theme. I had a few of my close friends over, some staying overnight. One of my friends, let's call her Cat, needed to go home, so we all decided to walk her home. I mean, she didn't live that far, maybe two or three blocks at most. Well, we get there and we're all hanging out. Cat lived near a cemetery, and another friend who I'll call Sam suggested that we just walk around for a little bit. Now, it's maybe 9.30 at night. This cemetery has been known to have fog only in the cemetery. Fog that doesn't affect the area outside of its cobblestone walls. I didn't tell anyone, of course, and we all thought it would be a great idea. So we all hop over the wall, which really isn't that tall, and we just start walking around, looking at who's buried there. In this cemetery, there is an area that has its own fence, and after a while, Sam and I get a little bored and decided we wanted to go inside. So we did. And immediately, she starts feeling sick to her stomach, and we can't figure out why. So we tell everybody still in the cemetery, and we leave. The second we leave, Sam is feeling better. No nausea, no stomach pain, nothing. Then I started feeling nauseous, which freaked me out a little bit. So I convinced everyone to go back to my house, because I didn't want to be around that place anymore. We told Kat goodbye, and we left. I didn't stop feeling nauseous until we were inside my house. I don't think whatever was in there wanted us there, and I'm glad that all that ever happened to me was a wave of nausea. I assume it could have been a lot worse. I always get random intrusive thoughts at night, when everything is quiet and I can't sleep. They're thoughts composed of words I sometimes don't even say or know the meaning to, and they just pop into my mind without any prior thoughts related to them. Often they lead me to have to look up definitions. I'm legitimately afraid that some sort of frequency wave is intruding on my mind and manipulating my cognitive functioning. Also, sometimes when I nod out at night, when I'm tired but I'm trying to stay awake, as soon as I nod out but am still mostly conscious, I'll hear fragments of a voice making a sound. Sometimes it will say my name. And one time, I didn't even nod out, and to the right of me, I heard the name of my boyfriend out loud. I swear my house is haunted by some kind of energy. My father died here eleven years ago by killing himself. I was the last one to enter his bedroom where he passed to shut the windows because it was storming heavily outside before leaving to spend the night at my grandmother's house. I was very close to my dad and took after him in many ways, features and all. 
However, years before he passed, I was very resentful and nothing but mean and nasty to him. Literally minutes before he passed, I gave him a dirty look, for no reason. Flash forward eleven years, and I found myself exactly where he was before he died. Isolated, depressed, and addicted to opioids. At first I thought I was haunted by him, but maybe there's a dark energy that followed him throughout his life and now it's attached to me. I just feel so haunted here all the time, alone in my mom's basement. Late at night when everything is quiet, around midnight until four o'clock when the sun is just about to rise and the birds start chirping, I always feel a strong presence around me, and sometimes my lamp and bedroom lights will glow brighter and cause all the shadows in my room to become darker and darker. It's creepy. And to make my mom's house even creepier, it's full of my grandmother's old furniture from the 50s and 60s. Everything is old with weird energies attached. Everyone that I've asked who's come over to my house has told me that they feel a very strange and dark and sinister energy here. We moved into it newly built, and it's only about 14 years old now, so I really don't know what's going on. My father's house is a creepy one. It isn't secluded, as we had many neighbors, but it was by no means in a suburb, if you get what I mean. This story is about my father's first experience, and also my first experience with the paranormal. My father is a skeptical man when it comes to the paranormal. Skeptical meaning that if something is explainable, he won't bother with it. That fact is what makes everything I'm about to tell you so much more terrifying. As he used to work graveyard shift for the school district in our town, he would sleep during the day. Back when this incident happened, we only had a cheap futon for a couch. The futon had a metal frame with a dingy cover as the cushion portion of it, and the back of the futon, when locked up into a couch, had vertical, hollow bars. He told me that one day, while everyone was away at either work or school, he was having trouble sleeping and was awake for about an hour before being able to fall back asleep. He told me that while he was laying there trying to convince himself to sleep, he heard someone open our front door, but he never heard it close. It's a finicky door, so you have to slam it to get it actually closed. Essentially, he would have had to have heard someone close it. He had a reason to believe it was his girlfriend, now ex, coming home from work early for lunch and he thought nothing of it. While he's waiting for her to come to the bedroom, he suddenly hears heavy footsteps walk around what he believes is our living room and slowly run their fingers, theoretically, across the back of our futon. This is where the description earlier comes in. What he thought was fingers ran across the back of the futon. There's a distinct metallic thunk, thunk, thunk when someone does this. It's not mistakable for anything else in the house. It's the only object that could make that sound. He immediately thinks that it's an intruder and rushes into the living room, but no one is there. The door is wide open and nobody's anywhere in the house. I should also mention that we have a deck made of wood that has a flight of stairs leading down to the ground level. Also, the walls are paper thin. You can hear anything from one place in the house to another. I can hear my father sneeze when he's in his room while I'm in the living room. This means that he would have had to have heard, or at least seen, somebody walk out the front door and down the stairs to leave the house, and he did not. This experience had him on edge for months. He tried talking to whatever manifested in the house and taking pictures of it, just to get some sense of closure from that day. As for my encounter, when I was a teenager, my sisters and I would hang out in our bathroom to talk and whatnot. Don't ask why, it was a thing for us for some reason. 
One particular day, one of my sisters and I were in there talking to each other when we heard somebody sprinting down the hall. It's a very short hallway, so it didn't phase us when it stopped abruptly at the end of the hall. We were on edge, as we thought it was our younger sister and we didn't want to get in trouble. As mentioned, my father worked nights and he would be upset when woken up while sleeping. So I open the door and as soon as I do, this huge gust of wind hits me in the face. Like, you know, if someone's running past you. I look out into the living room and see my father's now ex sitting on the futon watching television. I asked her where my sister was and she pointed next to her and motioned that she was sleeping. I asked if she had just heard that running and she gave me a funny look. As my heart sank, I slowly closed the door and looked at my sister, who was frozen with fear. We both knew what it was and didn't really mention it for a while. We didn't want to make the story feel any more real than it already did. So my boyfriend and I were staying at my grandma's house for about a week. We both like late night walking, so I decided to take him out on one and show him what it's like at my grandma's. He's used to the city, and my grandma's house is in the middle of nowhere. We ended up walking a direction that I never go, and we had walked for a few minutes before we hit a field clearing on either side of the road. We were talking when all of a sudden we heard coyotes toward the back part of the fields and mountains. I told him they move fast and that we should probably turn back and get back to the house. We did, but it seemed like the moment we turned to walk back, they began to close in. Within a matter of seconds, they seemed to be right behind us and were closing the distance fast. We began to panic and power walk and then jog because they sounded like they were in a frenzy. After a minute or two of fear and adrenaline, the sound died to a near silence. Almost home, a dog ran out in front of us wanting attention. However, as soon as I went to pet him, he seemed to notice something and immediately positioned himself behind us toward the coyote area we had just left and began barking and growling. We took it as our cue and booked it the rest of the way home, with his frantic barks in the background. When we made it back, my boyfriend wanted to sit on the steps to see if they had tracked us all the way back. We sat for a moment before everything went silent. All of a sudden, a low, deep growling noise filled the air. It was everywhere, all at once, like a jet taking off. It began to get louder as an ice-cold chill ran straight down my back. We both looked at each other for a second before I spoke up and told him something wasn't right and we needed to go in now. We darted in the house and locked the doors, done exploring for the night. The coyotes are normal for our area and we're on their normal trail, but what made them go silent and stop tracking us? What was the dog so frantic about? And more importantly, what was that sound? We had a few things happen in our old house. We lived there for 13 years a mid-terraced Victorian house in the United Kingdom. My partner has two sons that used to come over on the weekend to stay. The youngest would never walk down the hall on the ground floor by himself to go to the toilet because he said he didn't like it. We used to think it was just because it was a dark house. You'd have to leave the living room, walk down a hall that had a little dog leg before you got to the kitchen and then into the bathroom. He wasn't bothered about the kitchen. It was just the hall he didn't like. 
That just happened all the time, and we would just moan that he wouldn't go to the toilet, but we would walk him through the hall anyway, trying to convince him that it was fine, and that it was just an old house. We also used to have our PC desk under the stairs. It was open to the hall, but it was a nifty little space to work from. I was making dinner one night and chopping something, when I saw my partner pop his head round the door from my peripheral vision. I knew he was working at the PC and thought, what does he want? So I walked down to the door and asked him. He looked really confused, so I told him what had just happened. He swore that he hadn't moved from the spot. I believed him because of his reaction. I have no idea who it was, but it was the head and shoulders of a man, and it was so domestic, that's why I was positive it was my partner to start with. A few months later we were redecorating, and the stairs were boxed in with plywood. We had thought it looked pretty ugly for such an old house, so he pulled it all down. The next thing we both felt was a fresh air breeze building up. No doors or windows were open. We joked around, saying it was the spirit trying to get out, and he opened the front door and said goodbye. The weird thing was that his son started going to the toilet all by himself after that happened. He never said anything else about the hallway, and had no issues with it. We're pretty realistic and have a healthy skepticism, but that was a little bit odd. That whole place was a little bit odd. I lost my very brilliant, witty, overachieving son to opioids almost five years ago. He was extremely intelligent, had a high IQ, was a gifted student who graduated college in three years. He was self-sufficient with a great job and had a very dark, terrible secret. He became addicted to pills in college and managed to hide it for four years. He didn't smoke and rarely drank. I found out about his addiction just five weeks before his death, and I was able to get him into treatment. He would only stay there eleven days, and I was with him at his apartment the last six days of his life. On November 10th, 2014, he gave me two red roses. He said, because you deserve these, Mom. And I then dropped him off at an AA meeting. But he didn't go to the meeting. He was found 45 minutes later unresponsive in a pet smart bathroom with a needle in his arm. Since his death, and I can't remember exactly when it started, I have had roses come into my life time and time again in many different forms. I moved to Portland, the Rose City. I adopted a cat. She was already named Rosie. I decided to start photographing two roses which appear frequently. I swear if anybody could figure out how to reach beyond the other world, it would be my brilliant son. They appear randomly and also on important dates. His birthday. My birthday. Mother's Day. For example, on his birthday in 2016, I was at a thrift store the night before, feeling sad and like a loser, really. I frequently beat myself up over losing my son the way I did. As I was leaving, I saw two red roses in a glass display case. It stopped me in my tracks, and as I looked at it, I saw a little note. Pull my pin close to you. It was a music box. As I wound it up and pulled the pin, it played Close to You by the Carpenters. On the day that you were born, the angels got together and decided to create a dream come true. A song about a birthday. Of course I bought it. I planted a red rose bush for my son when I moved to Portland in 2015. It has struggled and has never really produced much. Last year, in 2018, I noticed that it had two buds. The bush produced two perfect red roses, side by side, that bloomed from Mother's Day to my birthday. It produced no other flowers that year. So odd. My other roses had dozens of blooms. I have countless other signs, sometimes roses, 
sometimes other unexplained events that leave me wondering. At any rate, this is my story. I started recording my sleep a month ago to hear myself sleep talk, but haven't really heard myself. However, yesterday morning I came across a very strange voice clearly saying, wake up, at 4.30. It's definitely not me, as I'm a female and the voice is very deep. My partner was in the spare room that night, and you can hear no entrance into the room previous to the recording which you can hear with other recordings on the app where we enter or leave the bedroom, no matter how quiet we are. I have no idea what this could be. Nothing was heard after this, apart from me possibly moving around, and then when I woke up a few hours later. Now I'm scared, especially as we've had some weird things happening in our house. Also, just some answers to some questions or assumptions I know I'll get. My partner pranking me. It couldn't be that. I started using the app as my partner told me that I sleep talk. I hadn't really heard much in the month that I was using it, so I stopped using it for a couple of weeks. Therefore, he had no idea I was recording on this night. My partner is a terrible prankster and always ends up laughing. Even he's a bit freaked out. Me pranking? Definitely not. Like my partner, I'm not good at holding it out. And also, I would probably come up with something a little bit better. Another assumption is that it's my voice, but it's too low to be mine, and it sounds robotic. When I've heard myself sleep talk on this app in the past, it sounds nothing like it. According to Fitbit, at this time I wasn't dreaming, so I couldn't have been sleep talking. Although I accept that this isn't exactly the most highly accurate data. It's not a noise coming from outside, either. It's too clear. Noises from farther away sound, well, farther away, and the phone is right next to me on the bedside table. We have no idea what said it. I had a lot of creepy experiences as a child, but I never truly realized how unnatural they were until I got older. The first of many weird experiences was when I was six. This one by far was probably the creepiest and scariest one I can recall. It was your average night. I don't remember anything from earlier that day. I was upstairs in the bathroom having just cleaned up before dinner. I opened the door to exit the bathroom into the upstairs hallway. Now, the way my house is laid out is when you exit the bathroom, you come into the small hallway. At the end of the hallway is the door to the attic, and to the right of that is my parents' master bedroom. The minute I look down the hall, I'm about to turn out the bathroom light, and that's when it happened. There was a figure at the end of the hall, in front of the attic door, it was a completely blacked out shadow person, but he looked exactly like my dad. Same height, same build, same everything. Just without any discernible features or details. Except for one thing. My dad wore glasses. As I'm looking at it, this thing did as well. But the area where the clear lenses would be were completely white. They also had no discernible details except for the shape. I was thinking to myself, why would my father be upstairs? And that's when my blood ran cold, because I could hear my father yelling to my mom from downstairs. She was making dinner in the kitchen. I instantly knew that this wasn't my dad. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. It was like this thing took control over my whole body. The next thing I know, I'm walking back into the bathroom, and I rested my head on the towel rack. The only thing I can remember after that was my mother calling me from downstairs. 
I am now 20 years old, but I can still remember this horrifying experience vividly to this day. I've always wondered what that thing was and why it looked like my dad. This was not a dream. I was fully awake, but I was having a hard time trying to go to sleep. I was in my room, but I couldn't fall asleep there, so I moved to the living room. Usually, as I'm trying to go to sleep, I'll let my mind wander on its own, and I always end up thinking of nonsense, like sentences or scenarios that don't mean anything. This time was different, though. I can almost always control the thoughts and steer them into the direction I want them to go, but this time I couldn't. It's like my thoughts were not my own. My mind was just racing with random sentences that I would never be able to think of. I had my eyes closed, but suddenly every thought racing through my head just stopped on a dime, and I hear a high-pitched female voice scream, Someone is home. She said a name, but I couldn't make it out. It seriously sounded like it was being yelled directly into my ear, and it turned into an echo chamber in my brain. I heard it replay over and over and over until it faded out. All of this happened in maybe five seconds, but it felt like I had heard it 15 times. I lifted my head up off the couch to see who was there, but it was no one. So I decided to try to go to sleep again, and as soon as I closed my eyes, all I could see was dirt, a field, and eight blue orbs. I'm still awake at this point, and out of nowhere, I hear the voice again, this time inside of my head, saying, eight people died here. I'm really not sure what to think of this. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before. I used to experience sleep paralysis and lucid dreaming quite often, but not like this. With everything I was hearing and seeing, I felt like it was completely out of my control. It was so weird. Last night, I had a really weird experience. I was laying down, ready to fall asleep, but still fully awake. My boyfriend turned on the noise machine that he has so he could fall asleep. He always does this, and it's never bothered me before. However, not too long after he turned on the machine, I started hearing a sequence of individual tunes that eventually became a melody. It's like a sound that starts and stops. First, I thought that he had changed the machine itself, or that the sound coming out of the machine was different. I asked him if he could hear the music, and he said no. He asked me what it sounded like, and he still couldn't hear it, even when he was intentionally listening for it. Then he changed the sound, and I stopped hearing the first melody. And a few minutes later, I started hearing a new one. I asked him again, and he said he couldn't hear anything but I was hearing something completely different. This time it sounded almost like a symphony, but with very few instruments. Then he turned the machine on and off a couple of times, and finally, he told me he could hear something. He said that he could hear small pitches when the machine was on, but it was completely different from what I was hearing, as this was a third distinct and different melody that I was hearing. He eventually turned the machine off, but I could still hear melodies all night long. I never figured out what that was. I've seen spirits all of my life. I interact with human ones. I've seen the spirits of some of my deceased pets, but last week I saw something different. I work more than one job, 
but one has a stockroom. It is on land leased from one of several local tribes. It was tribal land for centuries, before there was a highway built through the center of it in a mountain pass. In the stock area, we have racks that can be rolled. These are called lundias. About a year ago, I confided in a friend that there were in fact some odd spirits there. My friend asked me if I had seen the ones in the stockroom. He said they were some sort of gremlin-like shadows and that he had seen them at night. I did not see or sense any of them for a long time. When I saw some last week, I remembered his comments. They are odd. They're black, shadowy things. They're different, about two and a half to three feet long. They run in the lundias, low to the ground. A former co-worker asked me over two years ago if I had seen them running through the nearby desert. I told her I had never seen anything like them, but I have seen them now. They are hunched over at the spine, so their heads are lower than their backs. Their backs are rounded. The vertebrae are fairly well defined. They don't expect to be seen. They're sort of coyote-like, and sort of dog-like, as if they were the victims of some terrible spinal disease. They have dark fur or hair on the spine, thinning to bare skin on the bellies. Their legs are bent at the knees like dogs, in the back, and bent at the knees in the front. Their faces are dog-like with canine-style teeth. I know they have been there for many, many centuries. Some sort of nature spirits, maybe? Either way, I don't plan to bother them at all. I was about 11, and I was just laying in my bed, but the way my bed was positioned in my room made it so that I could look straight down the hallway, as in the bottom of my bed faced the door, and my head was near a wall. Anyway, I was laying there, and I was trying to go to sleep, when I heard a door open. So I looked down the hallway, and all I saw was a completely nude woman standing down at the end of the hallway, staring at me. She was kind of a pretty woman. She had long, dark hair, and I could even see her pale blue eyes. She was probably in her late twenties, or early thirties. She was moving closer and closer to me. I was already afraid, because there was this strange naked woman in my house, but what was even weirder is that her legs weren't moving. They weren't even touching the ground. The weirdest part, though, is that the closer she got to me, the older she looked. By the time she was at my door, she was hunched over, had gray hair that looked like it had never been brushed, wrinkled skin, and all the other features of an old woman that you would expect. As soon as she entered my room, she started screaming at me, which scared me, so I pulled the blankets above my head. I closed my eyes, but when I pulled the blankets off, I didn't see anything. If anyone has ever experienced something like this, or you know what kind of entity this was, please let me know. I was an assistant librarian in a Hawaiian middle school. As usual, I was asked to print copies and fix a machine as one of my many tasks. Every machine I walked next to, in more than one room, made a loud electronic hum when I was near, or a beep, which was odd but not unsettling. It only made me slightly curious. The broken machine worked just fine, and people would look at me strangely when I said that. The music in the library was always on the AM station. That's right, only classical music was allowed in there. I was cleaning the glass door and the music went from classical to static for a bit, and then to full-on hip-hop. 
The librarian screamed at me, saying, Why did you change the radio station? I was fed up with her always yelling at me, so I finally spoke up for myself and yelled back, You're closer to the radio. You're right next to it. I'm cleaning the glass door. There's no way I could have changed it. We stared at each other with anger like an old western showdown for a long minute or two. Then the hip-hop music went to static and back to classical. We stopped staring at each other then and carried on with our daily duties. The radio didn't malfunction after that. The day continued and school teachers entered the library asking me how my day was going. Cheerfully and kind of joking, standing with my hands on my hips like a superhero, I said, I'm an electric girl because all the machines were coming to life with noise when I walked by them. That there was a broken machine that only worked for me and that weird things happened with the radio station. So today, I must have electrical powers, so I am electric girl. A little later, the librarian screamed for me, saying that I had a phone call. My sister called me to tell me that her dad had died that day at 12 p.m. We were half-sisters, and she just wanted to let me know. When I got off the phone, the librarian yelled at me not to have people call me at work. Mind you, this was the first time that it ever happened. I told her what my sister said, and told her maybe that's why the radio station was being weird. She said she didn't care what the reason was, nobody should ever call me there, and that there must have been rain somewhere to mess up the station. It was a sunny and peaceful day all over the island that day. I worked there for three years, and the radio station never did that before. When I arrived at my apartment complex, the elevator acted weird for me too. I stretched my hand out to the button, and it made a weird noise right before I touched it. Then, when I was in the elevator going up, it fell a floor or so and bounced back. I said out loud, Okay, this is enough. Now you're scaring me. You need to stop. The elevator then started to move properly back up to my floor, the fourth floor. Nothing weird happened after that. I think I might have scared my sister's dad's ghost away. I told my half-sister and her siblings what happened that day and they said it sounded like something that their dad would do because he was a prankster. I know my half-sister sounded mad. She asked me, why would her dad visit me? I said, I don't know. I thought it was weird too. Why would my sister's dad's ghost visit me? I wasn't even blood related. I wasn't raised by him or with him or near him. I knew I visited him on holidays and just the last week before he died, with lots of people knowing that he might die soon, hence the visit. He was losing his mind a bit toward the end. My half-sister told me that her father told her I had visited, but he told her this days after I had actually visited, because he'd only just then figured out who I was. It's also strange that this spirit visited me quickly after his death, if not exactly at the time that he died and stuck around for hours after. So after writing my personal experience down, I thought, hey, maybe I should see if this ghost reached out to his family. So I messaged his family members individually on Facebook to see if they had had any paranormal experiences too. Her dad had a shit ton of kids by different ladies. I guess he was one of the first to ask in ancient times for friends with benefits. I guess they were still living their hippy-dippy days with free love, even though babies with diapers does not sound free to me. My mom would say, he must be doing something right. Yuck. Then she went on to tell me that she couldn't share a man, so she left. However, she still dragged me to all these shindigs that they would go to. I guess I was a human shield for my mom to feel brave, who knows. Let's just say the holiday gatherings felt a little weird, with all these women and kids there, and the only man there was my half-sister's dad. I sensed some jealousy with these fake-ass smiles coming from thirsty women. Thirsty for one dude, regardless of the obstacles. They always talked shit about each other to me. Then they told me not to say anything like they thought my mom was a prostitute. So there's no confusion. Whenever I use the word his, I am probably referring to the dead guy, so just keep that in mind. We'll start with his grumpy daughter, my half-sister, who worked two jobs 16 hours a day. I'm not sure if she was just sleep deprived when she experienced this, but she would never admit it. She said the night before her dad died, she saw his face in her bedroom curtain. He was alive in Pukalani when this happened, and she was on the other side of the island in Napoli, in her house. 
Now I introduce to you his widow, a long-term groupie. I only say that because I saw her at all the holiday gatherings and never understood the connection until 20 plus years later when she finally married him. He never had kids with her, so I thought, maybe just friends? All my sister's dad's groupies passed away from old age, except for one. He snagged the last one alive and put a ring on it when he had one foot in the grave. It's like marrying your caretaker but with benefits. Anyway, she said the night he passed, she had a clear dream of him being with others, happy and joyful. Three days after he died, she could feel the weight of someone sitting on her bed. When she thought of him, a song on the radio about magic came on. He was a magician. And she found a painted rock with an angel on it and thought that it must have been from him. His youngest kids both said that occasionally they had very vivid, almost lucid dreams where their dad was talking to them, giving them advice, telling them how much he loves them, and so on. The youngest daughter is a badass skater chick. I only say that with mad respect because she won a lot of competitions. She said whenever she was trying to make very hard decisions about her life, her dad always tried to protect her by pointing her in the right direction, in her very vivid, almost lucid dreams. Her dad's ghost once told her in a dream to take the offer. He was referring to a plane ticket that her sister had offered her to get away from an abusive ex. Later, the ex told her he was going to get counseling and that he had changed. At the time, she was very torn and wanted to go back to him, believing that he was sorry and that he would go to counseling. Her dad warned her again in a dream and she didn't listen. She left the safety of the women's shelter to see him and got kidnapped. He strangled and beat her almost to death in front of their baby. He put bruises on the baby too. The ex is sitting in prison now and she said basically nothing good has ever come from ignoring her dad dreams. And now I finally bring you to his youngest son, little bro, who I will always remember as the naked kid running around the house while everyone screamed for him to put clothes on and he giggled. He's grown up now. I shared my experience with him. He said his dad used to have a radio show when he was young and always seemed to be interested in the way that electronics worked. So he became an electrician. So it's kind of ironic what happened to me. He went on to share his story that an old light in his garage where his dad used to hang out turned on and off a lot after he died. He said that he really wanted to dream about his dad, and years later he finally did. In his first dream, his dad was sitting in a chair next to his wife in a room. He asked his dad, What are you doing here? His dad's response? I've always been here. Three or four months later, he had a very vivid dream in full color with him in a magic prop studio. He used to be a magician too. He was able to have a full-on hour-long conversation where he could ask his dad questions and he gave back answers. He asked his dad, does everyone want to be happy? The dad said, no. His dad would always say inspirational stuff to him like, do what you want to do, not what other people say you have to do. But mostly they talked about magic. Before you know it, his son was getting constantly booked for magic shows. He said that his dreams really helped give him the confidence he needed to become the magician he is today. He said that he feels he channels his dad's spirit at all of his shows. He's still getting advice from his dad and his dreams to this very day. After he messaged me all this info, he went to go pick up his friend. And his car smelled like his dad. Weed, cigarettes, beer, and incense. He said that he got kind of teary-eyed after that. And now to his sweet vegan daughter. She said she didn't have anything paranormal happen to her. That sucks, I guess, but it happens sometimes. I have had a lot of ghost experiences in my life, but I was super bummed when I didn't have one when I really wanted to, when one of my best friends hanged himself over a heartbreak. I begged his spirit to show me a sign, but I never got one. I don't understand why sometimes paranormal things happen and sometimes they don't. I don't always understand why spirits choose to show themselves to some people and not others. Maybe there was a sign, but it never looked paranormal to me, so I didn't notice it. My mother married an older man about nine years ago 
whose previous wife had died from cancer several years beforehand. We moved into his home, and I was about 13 years old. I had always felt an odd feeling in this home, as my room was in the basement. Nothing out of the ordinary happened here besides the odd being-watched feeling that I would experience. My mom has hired my biological father, whom I'm close to, to remodel the downstairs bathroom in my stepdad's home. My dad told me he had several of his tools moved around while he was alone working at that house. My dad finished the job and never returned. Fast forward to when my stepdad, mom, and I moved to Washington State. He and my mother began to have a lot of issues and were arguing frequently. I came to learn that my stepfather had a lot of problems and was sleeping with prostitutes, some younger than his own children. His oldest daughter was 30, and he was sleeping with prostitutes that were about a decade younger. I found this very concerning. Of course, he was cheating on my mom, and also just the behavior in general, and some other details that I won't get into that I experienced with him. But it was very evident that this guy had some real serious problems, and he gave me the creeps. I told my mother and she was dismissive of it, but she gave off the vibe that she knew exactly what was going on. I wanted to get away from him and everything that he does, and he bought a vacation home in western Arizona. I was 18 at the time, and so I moved down there and was living on my own. He had most of the items and furniture from his old home in this home that I was staying at. A couple of weeks go by and I'm lying in my bed alone in my room. I heard footsteps that sounded like somebody wearing slippers scuffling along the tile floor in the living room. I was scared shitless and I couldn't sleep after that. About a week after this, the hall bathroom shower was having problems, so I used the master bathroom shower. I had an awful feeling that I was being watched in the master bathroom as well as the master bedroom and the closet there. It was such a bad feeling that I no longer went into that room, and I was frightened to be on that side of the house. When I was done showering, I was near running through the bathroom and bedroom, shutting the door behind me. The same week, I was playing computer games in the office, and the desk was facing the living room. I was sitting in my chair, and I felt like I was being watched again. And then I felt something touch my right shoulder. I jumped up and looked behind me, but nothing was there. I was pretty spooked, but I sat back down and continued with my game. Maybe an hour after feeling something touch my shoulder, I suddenly heard a very loud slam near the side of the house where the master bedroom is. Maybe 10 to 15 seconds later, I heard several knocks along the wall on the same side of the house. I was so frozen in fear that I stood up at my desk, and all I could do was scream. I called my mother, hysterical, and explained to her what had happened, and two days later she drove over a thousand miles to come get me and take me back home. When I returned home, I had found out that she was divorcing my stepdad and sending him to the house in Arizona that I had just come from. After he was gone, I didn't experience much in my mom's house, beside the same feeling of being watched. I opted to stay upstairs. It was a split-level home, with the living room and kitchen upstairs and my bedroom downstairs. I was upstairs in the living room when my mom's dog stood at the top of the stairs, staring downward at the base of it, growling, completely frozen. Soon after that, my mother sold the house and I moved out of state, and I haven't experienced anything like that since. I'm wondering if anybody might have an explanation as to what occurred paranormal or otherwise. I believe this may have been paranormal, and I haven't experienced anything like this since, nor had I ever experienced anything at all until living in the same home that my mom's ex-husband lived in. Ever since I was a child, I've gotten random snippets of deja vu. These episodes last from a few seconds to a minute. Whenever I have them, though, I always get the sense that what just happened was something I had dreamt about. I don't have particularly vivid dreams often, and I rarely remember the details when they are vivid. 
The real-life occurrences trigger the feelings of deja vu, but when I think about it logically, I know that it's not something I've experienced before, but rather something from a dream, or maybe an alternate reality, or something that my mind just interprets as a dream. I'm not sure what to make of it, and I've never told anyone else about this. I guess I just want to know that I'm not alone. I was a wildland firefighter back in the day in Arizona. I worked in a forest that was generally popular with a lot of recreation in the northern portion. But I worked on the southern portion of the forest that was really remote. It barely had any roads or campground. So, if you wanted to recreate there, you had to work for it. The fire crew that I was on had two duty stations, one in a small town where the rest of the forest employees worked out of as well, and one that was about two and a half hours way up a windy mountainous road. The remote duty station had an old forest service ranger station and a newer double wide trailer that was recently put in. When I worked at this place, it had no cell reception. When my crew and I weren't working, we were playing horseshoes and watching movies. They did eventually add a cell phone booster which sadly made people play on their phones, but I digress. So for my creepy story, I want to keep it pretty simple. But my supervisor from that crew had experienced some weird things as well working up there. There was one night that he told me he was cowboy camping, sleeping outside with no tent for the uninitiated, and he kept getting a weird, mucusy drop of liquid on his face. He kept looking around and even yelling, but there was no one and nothing there. He told me that he wasn't below any trees, so it wasn't sap. He never slept outside there ever again, which leads me to believe that he was telling the truth. Now for my story. I've had other interesting experiences at that remote duty station, but this one was scary. It was the night of July 4th, and we weren't on a fire, so the crew was playing horseshoes and having a good time. Everyone went to bed pretty early, because we were going to have a PT hike the next day. I had my own small room in the double-wide trailer, and my bed was situated next to a big window. I started dozing off, but felt awake still, and I hear one of my coworkers outside my window asking me to come outside. I was laying on my side facing the window, and I didn't look up, but I felt their presence by the window. It felt as though something tall was looming over me from outside. They kept beckoning me, and I kept saying no. Pretty quickly their voice started changing to a deeper, raspier, angrier voice. They started cursing at me. Get the F outside. I was frozen. It was sort of a demonic voice. I lay frozen, not moving, while they continued to yell at me. Eventually it stopped, and somehow I fell asleep. I woke up the next day, and I wanted to ask my coworker if he was standing outside my window, but somehow I knew that he wasn't, and asking the question was just too weird. Perhaps this was a mild form of sleep paralysis, but it was still scary. My great-great-grandpa swore that the devil appeared to him in a Mexican desert when he was a young man. Some time ago, my grandpa was telling me the story that he had once heard from his own grandfather when he was a boy. My great-great-grandpa lived in Mexico and worked in agriculture. One day, he was out in the fields, sitting down under a tree, kind of grumbling and feeling sorry for himself. He wished that he was a rich man, so that he would never have to work so hard again in his life. While he sat there daydreaming about how much better his life could be if he had money, this man literally just appeared out of nowhere. 
He was dressed in cowboy garb with leather chaps and everything, and dangling from his entire body were gold coins that jingled with every slight movement. The strange man also had money pouring from his palms. He held it out to my great-great-grandpa and said, Timoteo, do you want to be rich? My great-great-grandpa, realizing that this had to be some sort of trick, tried to figure out what to do next. He knew there had to be a catch. No one would walk around wearing money, handing it out for free. He panicked and went to fetch his horse. But when he turned back around just a few seconds later, the cowboy dude had vanished. It was like he blinked and the guy was gone. My great-great-grandpa rode home like crazy and locked himself in the house the rest of the day, convinced that Satan himself had just shown up and tried to tempt him into sin and damnation. Apparently, he was very insistent that he hadn't just dreamt it or imagined the whole thing. My grandpa still tells this story without the slightest hint of humor. It's like he totally believed what his grandpa had told him so many years ago. I guess I'll never know for sure, but I always wonder. So I finally talked my friend into moving from Seattle to Texas. We decided to split it into two parts. The first one last week, moving her stuff in a rented SUV. Since we both had some time, we decided to take the trip on all the back roads. We stayed at a Mineral Springs resort in the middle of nowhere of Oregon, and that was amazing. On the second day, we got up to drive to Vegas. We took US 50 which is known as the loneliest highway in America. So I'll admit before this, it was eight to 10 hours before we had any human contact. I'm a former over the road trucker and a US veteran, so I'm used to traveling to different places and being in new surroundings every day. But it also taught me to listen to my instincts. Let me tell you, did they come in loud and clear while on this trip a few hours away from Vegas? We stopped to get gas, and as we rolled into the place, it just looked very aged and dated. My friend decided to get gas, and I walked inside to look the place over and get some snacks. I can honestly say that I can't point to any one thing that was wrong, but the feeling that overcame me was indescribable. It basically told me that this place was out of place, and if I wanted to leave, or be able to, I needed to go. Right now. Now I'll admit that it could just be my own experience, and maybe because I had such a bad feeling, I was imagining things. But the minute I decided to leave without buying anything, or even using the restroom, I swear everybody in this place started looking at me. I don't just mean the employees, but the patrons too. I walked quickly to the car and told my friend that if she believed in instincts, we should get in the car and leave right now. We did, and we didn't breathe easy until we were 10 miles away from that place. I've heard a lot of people have weird experiences and spooky encounters in the middle of Death Valley, and I guess now I do too. This happened when living in Indian Springs across from the base. We lived in a one-story, older home. One night, my significant other heard a noise outside, got a flashlight, and shone it out an open window. He called his oldest son over to the window, too. They saw what my partner, who was a scientist, by the way, working on the installation there at the time, described as a dark, human-like creature, about two and a half to three feet tall. He quickly retreated from the window to wake me up. At this time, the creature jumped up onto the roof. So as he was shaking me awake, all I saw was my partner's white face and then heard two thumps on the roof. Then I heard something hit the ground behind us, outside the window that was facing the backyard. My partner grabbed the flashlight again, and he and his son went to the back door to look out. 
The creature was now lurking by some bushes in the backyard. After a few minutes of watching it, it skittered away outside of flashlight range. They were both white as ghosts and trembling as they described this thing. My significant other's son was friends with the son of the police chief. He told his friend what they'd seen, and the friend related it to his father. His father, the police chief, came over shortly afterward, off the record of course, and told us that he had gotten calls from tourists and people passing through, who had also described encounters with this creature. He was highly intrigued himself, and wanted more information on it. He said that he had seen fuzzy pictures of it, and that these sightings were years apart, and that the people who called in to report it didn't know one another. We are miles away from the springs now, but every time I've mentioned that night to my significant other, he still goes white as a sheet. I grew up in an apartment complex for the first six or so years of my life. It's been a long time, so I don't really truly remember it. But I know I used to live in an apartment complex near a mire. Well, we ended up moving into my grandmother's house with her after my grandfather passed away, and there were some disturbances I remember at my young age. The first time I ever had something paranormal happen was when I was helping my mom and grandma clean out my grandpa's old room so that my mother and I could use it as our room. I was really afraid to be alone as a kid, so I slept in my mom's room. They had had separate rooms, so my grandma had converted one of the living rooms into her bedroom. Well, one day we were taking a break from cleaning out the room, and we were laughing out in my grandma's room. I can't remember exactly why, but my mom asked me to go to my grandpa's room to grab something she had forgotten. It might have been a drink. Anyway, as I'm walking toward his room, I hear the most ghostly moan I've ever heard in my life. It almost sounded like something straight out of Scooby-Doo. I ran back to my mom and grandma, and they said that I was just being silly. A typical answer that a child would get from adults after telling a story like that. And my mom was an atheist who tried to explain and debunk everything she could. On occasion, I would hear stuff. I would see shadows. I would sense that somebody was watching me, but I was never really truly bothered by anything. My grandma would have liked to think that it was my grandpa messing around, but I was never really sure. I just knew that stuff was happening that I couldn't explain, and I didn't like it. As a kid, I loved horror games. I loved watching scary movies and stuff like Ghost Hunters, which did scare me and keep me up some nights. But it was always interesting to me, because I truly believed my house was haunted. I liked to pretend that it wasn't, though, so I could sleep at night. My mom died on November 5th of 2006, and ever since that day, things got weird, and the feelings of being watched and noises and shadows increased, but nothing super significant. I always thought it was due to the fact that my grandma had, like, six cats, one night in particular that I remember was when my friend came over to spend the night. We played video games, and he in particular loved to talk to me about his dreams because they were so creative and vivid. I mean, they could have been comic books. Well, we went to sleep, and before that I closed my bedroom door because one of the cats would come into the room all the time and wake us up by licking plastic stuff for like an hour straight. Almost suddenly, out of a dead sleep, I woke up. No reason behind it, I just did. I was drawn to look at the bedroom door, and it slowly opens. An almost pitch black cloud hovers into my room and stays close to the ceiling. As this is happening, my friend is yelling in his sleep, No, stop. And at this time, not only am I scared beyond belief, but I have the strangest, eeriest feeling that I've ever had in my life. I was so scared, but also simultaneously so tired 
that I covered my face with my blanket and eventually just passed out. I woke up the next day and everything seemed normal. I asked my friend about last night, and he said that he didn't see, feel, or hear anything. But when I asked him about his dream, he said, I actually can't remember it. That struck me as absolutely wild, because this guy would always tell me about how cool his dreams were. He seemed to remember them all. There were other things that I can't remember. My dad said one night he was intoxicated and opened his door to go upstairs and grab some food out of the fridge. When he says he ran into my mom as he walked out of the door and he kind of stumbled back and looked, but then nobody was there. From his face when he tells this story, you can tell how sobering of an experience this had to have been. All of us, however, would occasionally hear my mom's voice calling out to us when she hadn't. And, personally, I would just freeze and look in every direction to try to find where it had come from, but sometimes she wasn't even in the house. Fast forward to about 2013, a year or so before I eventually moved out. My grandmother's health and brain were deteriorating rapidly, until she finally called 911 and went into the ER, where she was diagnosed with brain and lung cancer, almost identical to what my mom had when she passed. After what I think was like a month, she ended up passing away. And ever since that day, the house was not the same. It was odd before then, but after that, it went from like level 20 to 100. Stuff was being knocked over, voices were echoing from the hallways in the basement, loud voices talking from other rooms when you were alone in the house, people coughing right into your ear, shadows walking down the hall, doors being slammed in the basement, the list goes on and on. I had a friend move into my house that always told me that when he went downstairs to take a shower, somebody would shake the bathroom door handle while he was in there. He said he would open it multiple times to find nobody on the other side. He was still trying to figure out how I was doing it. Until one day he realized that I wasn't because I had another friend of mine come over to my house because he wanted help dyeing his hair black. I was in that phase already, so I helped him. He went downstairs to take a shower, and when he came back upstairs, my buddy and I were playing a video game. He walks in and says, how the hell did you guys get up here so fast without making a noise? We were really puzzled until he told us that somebody had kept shaking the door handle. My friend went pale, and told him exactly what had been happening to him. At that point, we were all scared and left the house for a bit. He stopped coming over as much, and honestly, I don't blame him. He vowed to never shower at my house again. Between hearing doors in the basement, seeing shadows, stuff like that, my dad kept telling me how when he was home by himself, he would just hear my mom and grandma screaming his name from other parts of the house which drove him back to alcoholism. Then one morning, I woke up to find my grandma's last cat that we had had died. That was shortly before we moved out. When I say these encounters intensified, I mean it. All of my friends that came over just said that the house didn't feel right. It wasn't welcoming. We would always hear voices or cats meowing, even though at that point all the cats had passed and nobody would be there. I would go into my basement before work and open all of the doors, and when I'd get home, I'd go check and find that pretty much all of them were closed when nobody could have possibly been in the house. And this is just all my perspective. My friends, and my roommate especially, had their own crazy stories that still get me to this day, no matter how many times I hear them. Ever since I moved out into a new apartment, now a trailer, I haven't experienced anything else. It's been a nice change of pace, and I hope to never experience anything of that kind ever again. I work at one of my local schools. I was grading papers and posting the grades late in the evening, since they had been due the night before. 
The custodians stopped by my room before they left for the day to wish me a good night and save travels home. So I knew that was going to be the last person in the building, aside from the security who stays at the guardhouse outside the gate. I continued grading as normal, and after about 40 minutes, I began to hear odd noises. Nearby my classroom is an elevator, and when my classroom door is open, I can hear the ding when the elevator arrives to my floor. As I graded, I continuously heard the elevator doors open and close, as well as it shifting from floor to floor. I assumed the custodians were doing one last inspection of the classrooms, so I wasn't really that concerned. I began to get suspicious when this kept occurring, because A, there are only two floors, and B, the custodians would not need to keep traveling up and down for inspections. Sure enough, I stepped outside of my classroom, and I saw that the hallway was completely empty. I checked down the hall, just to make sure, to look inside of the other classrooms, and I found that I was indeed alone. I figured they were downstairs, so I went back to my room to continue grading. About half an hour later, I heard giggling and a cart being pushed down the hall. I felt relieved at that time, because I thought that I was right and that it was just the custodian still at work. Since it's a very short haul, I figured that when they passed by my room, I would laugh and tell them about how the elevator had spooked me. The rolling continued, but they never came. A solid minute or two passed, and I could still hear the rolling of this cart. I got up to see where they were in the hall, but the moment I got up, the rolling sound ceased. I briskly walked to the hallway to find that, again, it was empty. I felt a pit in my stomach and decided to go home. I packed my things and headed downstairs, hoping to see the custodians on the lower floor. It was empty as well. Trying to muster up all hope and courage, I began walking through the dark campus toward the parking lot. A part of me was praying that I would see their cars out in the lot, but my suspicions were confirmed when I found that my car was the only one left on campus. Of course, I drove as fast as I could to the gate, but I found that it was locked. I got down and knocked on the door of the guardhouse, but nobody answered. I looked inside. It was empty. It turned out that everyone left at around 10 or 10.30, so I was truly the only person on campus. I actually had to call the principal to open the gates for me. I know this sounds made up, but I can assure you that it's real and it definitely freaked me out. I work at a Hampton Inn and Suites, and I've always had paranormal experiences throughout my life. But recently, I started to work from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., doing audits at the hotel. I'm by myself, and things seem to be more active on this shift. I have spoken to other employees, and they've noticed weird things happening, and a few have seen figures. They've told me about elevators opening and closing without anybody in them, things falling over from across the room, motion sensor lights going off in locked rooms that nobody has access to, and things like that. Innocent things and I honestly didn't think much of it. I noticed things like that on my 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. shift when I first started working, but I kind of brushed it off. I was the only one on the shift, but there was a constant flow of people in and out of the lobby, so I was around people a lot. My first night working 10 to 6, though, I was with someone so he could train me. The radios got staticky and loud at about 2.30 to 3. He said that we just have to turn them off, because they do that sometimes. So, the next day, I came in and I made sure to turn off all the radios when I got there, so that I wouldn't have to hear it. 2.30 to 3 a.m. rolled around, and the radios start making their sound again. You can understand my confusion and fear. I made sure they were all off. The motion light in the PBX room... It's pretty much a big room full of computers that controls Wi-Fi and computer systems, turned on. 
I'm the only one on shift, and nobody else is allowed in the back. I walk back there. No one. I shrug it off, and I head into the kitchen. It's about 3.30 at this point, and again the motion light turns on, in the pantry. The door was closed, but I could see the light turn on from the crack underneath it. Things like this happen a lot now, but what freaks me out the most is when I'll be walking around and just feel something tug on my ponytail or lanyard. Again, this happens when I'm the only one on shift and there's nobody else around. And where I'm walking, there's nothing for it to snag on. We also have a plexiglass divider to separate us from the guests, and I can see my reflection in them. I tend to see movement behind me in the glass sometimes. There's just a wall behind me, so nobody's walking back there without me noticing. It freaks me out, but I don't think it's out to hurt me. I don't know what entity or which entities are at this hotel, but it seems to be much more playful than the others I've encountered. Tonight, I heard something fall over when I was walking into the back office. Then, the top of a large hand sanitizer bottle was taken off and was laying on the floor, with the bottle laying spilled out on the counter. My hair gets tugged a lot more often now. This is just a short list of the things that happen on my shifts. Honestly, I'm getting used to it, but it still freaks me out. I didn't know about the ghosts at Disneyland prior to this experience. I've been going to Disneyland since I was five. I was at the park one day when I was about 13 or 14 with my mom and my sister, and we decided to go on the Haunted Mansion. So we wait in line and get on the ride. My mom and my sister got on one doom buggy, and I got another one all to myself. We go through the ride and everything is going great, until we reach the hitchhiking ghost part of the ride, which is near the end. This is where things get good. Right when we enter the room, the ride stops. I thought, eh, okay, they stop the ride all the time. They're probably just helping someone off. So I'm sitting there waiting for the ride to start again, when I suddenly feel somebody push on my right shoulder. I could clearly feel a palm and fingers when I got pushed on. I spin around really quickly to look, but I see nobody. It couldn't have been my mom or my sister, because when you enter the room, the cars turn left, and if they had tried to touch me, they wouldn't have been able to reach me. And if they did, then it would have been on my left shoulder. It also couldn't have been the people behind me, because the doom buggies behind me were in a straight line, and they also wouldn't have been able to reach. The only way for them to touch me would have been for them to get out of their car, run up, push me, and then go back and climb back in, but I would have caught them doing that when I looked. It also wasn't any cast member, because they would have had to walk right in front of me to get behind me, or even to get on the side, and I would have seen them. The next day I hop on the computer and I start doing some research about deaths in the park and ghosts. I soon come across a story about a kid that had died on the ride. According to the story, the kid was at the park attending grad night. While on the ride, he decides to get out of his doom buggy and walk around to view the different rooms and the special effects. While he was walking along the side of the track, he came upon a staircase that he did not see and fell down the stairs. The stairs were painted black, so it was impossible to see them unless you had a flashlight. Well, he fell down the stairs and broke his neck and died. Apparently, this happened in the seance room, but since then, people have also reported cold spots and being touched or shoved in the hitchhiking ghost section of the ride. When I read that, I thought to myself, wow, maybe I just experienced a ghost. In my many visits back to the park after that, I always kind of hoped that I would experience something like that again, but I never did. 
It's worth mentioning that there's another story about the man in the tuxedo. According to that story, this guy hangs out near the end of the ride in the hitchhiking ghost section and the area where guests disembark. All in all, a pretty interesting experience. So I visited Dorset this spring, and I stayed in a hotel with my partner. I believe it was room 18 or 19. It's a stunning hotel with the most beautiful rooms. However, I don't think I'll be returning in a hurry. The first night, I kept seeing someone standing in the bathroom doorway. I brushed it off as my eyes seeing something that wasn't really there. I didn't want to jump to conclusions, and I simply assumed that I was seeing the back of the toilet seat even though what I had seen came nearly to the top of the door. I didn't say anything about it the next morning, not wanting to completely freak out my partner, as you do. I did test, however, and from where I was laying in bed, you really couldn't see the toilet or the toilet seat, as it was hidden behind the wall. So what the heck was I looking at? Night two, I shut the bathroom door completely, and I made sure that it wouldn't unlatch and swing open in the night by giving it a good rattle in its frame. It didn't budge. Awesome, I thought. We can sleep in peace. Then we got hot and heavy and fell asleep. I watched some TV and turned it off and went to sleep too. I woke up some hours later to find the door completely wide open. I got up, went to use the bathroom, closed the door behind me again, and went to sleep. The next morning, my partner was already up, so I can't tell you if the door was open or not again and they didn't say anything, so neither did I. I just assumed that they had forgotten to shut it when they went to go to the bathroom. No big deal. Whatever. We went out for the day. I think we went to a raptor place and saw a bird show, which was really cool, actually. When we came back to change before we headed out for a meal, we entered the room to find the wardrobe doors were wide open and so was the bathroom door, again. I'll put in here that we always locked the room door behind us and put a little sign on the door, stating that the room didn't need any refreshing, so no one else should have been entering that room except us. Nothing else was out of place. Nothing was moved or missing. Just doors open that shouldn't have been. The wardrobe, I assume, was Victorian or around that period. It was solid wood, well-built, and extremely heavy and stiff. It was awkward to open and close the rightmost door. It seemed like they only just fit together when they were closed. And not only that, but the leftmost door was actually latched shut from the inside, which I left well alone, as it didn't need to be open for any reason anyway. Night three, same thing as night two. I wake up to find the bathroom door open. I just leave it, too tired to get up and close it, as it had been a long day. And I'd been having a drink or two in the bar downstairs. I ended up actually having the worst night's sleep that night, with nightmares thrown in there for good measure. Coincidence? I don't know. When I got up in the morning, my partner proceeds to tell me that she woke up in the middle of the night and saw somebody pass by the door inside the bathroom from right to left, and that they were darker than the room itself and nearly as tall as the door. Nope. No thank you. The funny thing is, we were visiting with family, staying in another room, and they wanted to cut the trip short and leave a day early, but they didn't say why. We agreed because we wanted to leave as well, and we didn't really fancy spending another night in that room. So after breakfast, we packed up and got the heck out of there. I'm not a religious person. I don't even think I believe in God, but as I was packing, I was praying and saying in my head that whoever or whatever it was had to stay there and couldn't follow us home. Hopefully, it listened.
Hoth is a little village near Canterbury and Sturry, out on the old marshes that were once the Wansom Channel. A few years ago in 2014, my landscaping company were called to a job in a beautiful house there. The house was a converted barn and had been bought by the new owners who wanted some work to be done there before moving in, as is often the case. So the first step was to visit the property and take a look to come up with a price for the job. There was a great deal of land surrounding the property, with extensive gardens that had fallen into a state of disrepair. After visiting the property, I returned, saying that the place gave me the creeps, and that although it was empty and isolated several hundred yards from the next dwelling, it felt like I was being watched. Obviously, everybody laughed at me. I priced the job, which was a big one, and would need us to be on site for about five days, and forgot about the whole thing. As it turned out, we were given the contract for the garden clearance and various tree works, and we booked in for a few weeks' time. When we arrived on site, there was a crew of builders there already, who were working inside the house, and had been living there for a couple of weeks while they carried out the renovations. When we arrived, we said our hellos, and John asked what they thought of the house. The reply was, It's a lovely place, but it's haunted as hell. We laughed and asked why they thought that, and they told us that all night they could hear banging coming from empty rooms. Their tools were being moved around. They heard whispering, and one had even received a phone call from a distant voice that he couldn't understand, from a number that was just all zeros. He showed us the call record to prove it on his mobile phone. Interested, but still not entirely convinced, we got on with our work. Joe told us that the back courtyard garden gave him the willies, but apart from that, day one was uneventful. On day two, it was quiet in the morning. Then, in the afternoon, I went inside for coffee. While I was there, there were knocking sounds coming from one of the back rooms. Nobody was in there, but it could well have been someone in one of the garden areas knocking against the wooden walls from outside while doing some kind of job. But then there was a sound like wallpaper being unrolled or a poster falling off of a wall, something like that. It came from the hall. Then out of the hall, a shadow shot through the kitchen and out the front door. I was alone in the house at the time. And after looking from every angle, the only way the shadow could have been cast was by the kitchen lights in the middle of the room. But there was nothing there to cast it. I was starting to become a believer. On day three, Paul, one of the builders, was having an argument with somebody on the phone. When he hung up, he said, I can't believe that. The driver from the skip company says he won't come here to pick up the skip unless we can promise that there's somebody on site to meet him, because he reckons that he saw something here when he dropped the skip off before we got here, and he says that it's definitely haunted. When he did arrive, he said that when he dropped the skip off the first time, he knew the place was empty, but he saw somebody moving around in there. And while he was unloading the skip, the radio in his lorry came on with a loud load of static. Day four was quiet, apart from the knocking and banging, which we'd all gotten used to by then, even though it was louder than before, and definitely not one of us messing about. On day five, a guy turned up to put in a new TV aerial and that involved some wiring being fitted in the back room where most of the noises had come from. A few hours in, he was having coffee with everyone else in the kitchen, and he said that he'd be glad when he was done because that room was creeping him out. He said that he was sure he kept hearing somebody walking around in there, but there was nobody inside the house, let alone in that room. The final thing that happened while we were working there was that another contractor turned up to do some light fittings. He parked outside the house. While he was in there, his van radio came on blaring with really loud static, just like the skip driver had said happened to him when he was there before. A few weeks after we'd been there, the new owners had moved in, and John and I went over to visit them and settle up the bill. John was curious and asked the owner if he was enjoying living there. He obviously read between the lines a little bit, Maybe he'd already been asked about the place by one of the other contractors, and he responded by saying, It's a beautiful house, but I must say, it takes on a completely different feeling at night. 
It's not such a nice place after it gets dark. We returned to work there a couple more times on smaller jobs, but as the clients were living there full time by then, we didn't spend much time in the actual house itself. On one occasion, we were in the kitchen in the evening, having a cup of tea with the owner, when from the back room there was a huge crash, like a wardrobe being pushed over. The owner just put his finger up and whispered, Please just pretend you didn't hear that. We don't want the children to be scared. We do a lot of work on repossessed houses, no pun intended, and houses going through probate. So I've visited a lot of empty properties, often where the owner has recently died. And in over 10 years, I have never been creeped out by a place like I was that one. For a couple of days, I have been hearing footsteps in the middle of the night, loud enough to wake me up. When I wake up, they suddenly disappear. This could be an auditory hallucination, but I'm damn sure I heard it. Spots in my house also suddenly turn cold when I'm home alone, like the kitchen. Also, my television has occasionally been flickering on and off for a couple of days. My two dogs also keep barking at random spots in my house and they seem agitated a lot. I can't get them to stop, even if I offer them treats. There's also just a terribly weird feeling in my own house. I don't have any audio or video evidence. If I get some, I'll let you know. But it's so freaking scary. I can't live in my own home without fear anymore. I'm usually skeptical when it comes to spirits and demons, but this has really got me convinced that something very odd is going on. There's no past history of paranormal activity in my house. No one's messed around with a Ouija board. I'm just so scared. I can't sleep or go places in my house without turning the lights on. If you have any idea what's going on, please let me know. So this was when I was about 16. My family and I moved into a registered historic home that was 240 years old. It was dated around when our town was founded. When you first walked into the house, you felt it. It was like an ominous cloud that hung over everything. The first experience I ever had was in the parlor that used to hold wakes in it. I was sitting at the computer, we had converted it into an office, and I kept hearing loud noises directly above me. The room above me was my bedroom, and I was the only one home. I looked around to make sure the dogs were with me and that they weren't tearing anything apart. I initially ignored it, and it subsided. After about an hour, it started up again, but with more violence. It sounded like somebody had moved my entire wardrobe across the bedroom floor. I ran up the staircase, but by the time I got to the second landing, the sound stopped. I barged into my room and it was completely silent. No furniture had been moved. The second event was a lot more terrifying. It was about 3 a.m. I woke up to the sound of grown men arguing outside of my bedroom door. The catch? The only male that lived with us was my 14-year-old brother. I jumped out of my bed and flung the door open, trying to catch it. Nothing. I got back in bed after I stupidly locked the door as if that was going to stop anything, and it started again. This time, I went to my grandmother's and brother's separate rooms. They were both asleep, and every TV was off. The toilet down the hall flushed itself, and I ran back to my room. The third event is when we decided to move. My brother was taking a shower upstairs. While he showered, a clear, perfect imprint of another set of feet appeared in front of him. Small things had happened in between those events, but these really stood out the most. I'm so glad we don't live there anymore.
When I was pregnant, my kid's father and I stayed at his cousin's house for about a month before we moved into our apartment. It's an old farmhouse in a newly developed area of Warwick, Rhode Island. There are farms and woods in one direction and a small town in the other. We were told when we moved in that the house had been built in the 1840s, which to me was super interesting until my kid's father, I'll call him Brian, remarked at how the stairs seemed awfully dark and creepy for the middle of the day. And when I looked, he was right. It gave off such a sinister vibe. We slept in the living room, and at night, we could see through the kitchen, and it was as if the stairs became this dark, uncomfortable void. When we brought this up to Brian's cousin and his wife, they proceeded to laugh and tell us stories of people being pushed down the stairs. I don't think they really believed in ghosts, and the husband was an abusive drunk and drug addict, so they had enough problems. That house was chaotic. The husband and wife clearly had serious issues, emotionally and financially. They had a six-year-old son who was afraid to sleep upstairs by himself because of the shadows. Great. After being in the house alone a couple of times and seeing genuine human figures out of the corner of my eye, or even better, black dots on the floor with what looked like long, spindly legs running, I was a little on edge. Every time you would look at these things, they would disappear. A few times, I would see a figure out of the corner of my eye, and I would look and see one of the family members who I hadn't heard come in. I think that freaked me out the most, because how can you explain to yourself seeing a person, and sometimes nothing being there, but other times you expect it to disappear, and it would, in fact, be a person. It was so weird and unsettling. Brian would say how sitting in one chair in the living room, you would want to look over your shoulder into the doorway, as if someone was coming down a set of stairs that used to be there. This also freaked me out, considering that I slept right near the doorway, and would often get a feeling of someone coming toward me. One day, Brian and I were the only two in the entire house, facing one another about two feet away, face to face, we were talking as we usually do. Directly in the middle of us, we heard a woman's voice say, Shh. I asked if he had said that, and he stared at me with huge eyes and said, No. Did you? Then we laughed it off, as we were clearly talking too loud for the inhabitants, apparently. We eventually brought this up to the family, who included a second cousin living upstairs, and they confirmed that they too saw and felt things. They told us they assumed that the black voids that ran on the floor were just one of their dogs and ignored it if it wasn't. The cousin who lived upstairs said that the curtains to his closet often moved, like they were being pushed by a breeze or something. He chalked it up to being stoned or tired. There was no breeze. The wife told me that when they first moved in there, her son would see a man in a hat, but assumed that it was just his imagination. How could you live in a house so clearly haunted and just pass it off? The front of the house at night was avoided by basically everybody, as it was right where it felt like somebody was walking by that door frame at you in the living room. One night I didn't feel like walking all the way around this huge house to the car, so I walked as fast as I could to the car through the front door. I heard a deep growling coming from the side of the house. They owned three dogs, one of which was a bull mastiff. Too freaked out to call for her, I ran in, and, to my horror, all three dogs were inside the house. Needless to say, I didn't use that entrance again. It was such an emotionally depressing house, and maybe me being pregnant, I was just more aware of everything, I don't really know. There were other weird things, but one of the last conversations that I had with one of the roommates was really interesting. The roommate was renting a back bedroom. It was down a long hall at the very end, the only door in this isolated hallway. I told her about Brian and I hearing the shh directly in the middle of us. She explained that she hears the same exact thing in the hallway. If she and her son were getting too loud, they would hear a woman say shh. They were sure that it was the owner's young son sneaking into the hallway, but I'm not so sure. (laughs) 
I'm pretty sure that the house I babysit at is haunted. The parents were going to a party, and they were supposed to be home at around 9, but rang me saying that they wouldn't be back until midnight, so it was my job to put the kids to bed, which I had no problem with. They are the sweetest, most well-behaved kids I've ever met. It got to 9.30, and the kids brushed their teeth, got their books, and went to bed. I tidied up, sat down, did a little homework, and then FaceTimed with my friend. This is a religious family, and there are crosses on some of their walls. I heard what sounded like someone knocking on the front door, but it was about 10.15, and the parents usually message me when they're almost home. And, of course, they have keys, so I automatically suspected that it wasn't them. I checked, but there was nobody at the door, so I just sat back down on the couch and got carried away talking to my friend again. Then, the same three knocks. They have guinea pigs, and I started to suspect that it was those guys nibbling on the cage or just messing around, so I went and checked, but they were in their little home things. I still believed it was them, but then, as I was leaving the room, I saw the wooden cross that was nailed at its head on the wall lift from the bottom and drop three times, knocking three times. It was as though some force was lifting the bottom half that wasn't nailed and dropping it like a door knocker. I just froze, and my friend was like, oh, what, what, what was that? I tiptoe ran back into the living room. I have no idea what caused that. I started to think maybe it was one of the kids jumping from upstairs, causing the walls to shake or something. But the cross is on the wall between the kitchen and the dining room, and directly above was the parents' room and the bathroom. So unless they were in their parents' room or the bathroom jumping up and down in sets of threes, it doesn't really make sense. Plus, they were asleep. Perhaps coincidentally, the homework that I was doing was philosophy which can be very anti-religion and sometimes anti-God. In fact, I was actually writing an answer to the question, is the Western idea of God illogical? Probably not the most respectful homework to do in the house of religious people, but hey, I don't know what it was. A mocking? God showing me he was real? Maybe not. I can't explain it to this day. When I was a kid, I would always feel watched from a very young age, around six or seven. I would refuse to sleep alone for this reason, and I insisted on sleeping with my brother or mum. If I was forced to sleep alone, which was the case most of the time, I would stare into my room and observe the details for hours before finally falling asleep. My first experience came when I was around eight. I went to bed like I would on a normal night. My mom would pretend to sleep next to me and keep me company so that I would fall asleep. When she didn't do this, I would place a large body pillow next to me so that I wouldn't feel watched. I woke up in the middle of the night one night. I would always wake up at around two. But on this night, next to my bed was an old woman that I could see through. I could see all the details, though. She had wrinkles, probably around 80 years old. She had curly hair and wore a buttoned sweater with stripes. I screamed at the top of my lungs and ran out the door, next to her. My dad picked me up and let me sleep in their bedroom. It would only escalate from here. Almost every night from this point on, I would see a cloud shaped like a human standing next to my door when I woke up in the middle of the night. Keep in mind, I would always wake up at around 2 a.m., with no exceptions. It would disappear after 30 or 60 seconds, and kind of just dissolve and float up into the roof. I could move and speak, so it was not sleep paralysis. One night, it spoke with me in a woman's voice. I was sleeping when I woke up to the voice saying, Hi. I thought it was my mom, so I hesitated to even open my eyes at first. But then, I was greeted by the figure standing at the door once more. I tried saying a few words, but no response. If I had to guess, I saw this figure at my door every night for months, maybe years. The vibes I got every time I went face to face with it 
were terrible. I was absolutely horrified. It's hard to explain, but it felt like the thing in front of me was evil. If I remember correctly, it was not 100% stationary. The mass or body of the thing was moving slightly, sort of hovering in position, if that makes sense. My brother reported a female voice whispering, Good night, in his ear one night as well, which is super scary. At this stage, sometimes things would fall down in my room at night, and my parents would come search it but find nothing. My brothers, one remains skeptical till this day, started reporting heavy footsteps when they brushed their teeth at night. They would go and check, find nothing, go back to brushing their teeth, then hear the footsteps and repeat. Hearing heavy breathing right next to me at night also happened a few times, stopping when I turned on the lights. One night, where my brother and I were relaxing in the living room, we spotted a figure walking back and forth, right outside our window, maybe five meters away on the grass. It was a summer night, so it was fairly bright. It was shaped like the person I always saw, but this figure was black and not the cloudy type that I would always spot. It walked back and forth for minutes. We called our dad over, but he couldn't see it. Only my brother and I could. One particular incident made me call it quits and beg for help. I was sick and home from school. My mom was going to the bakery, so I would be home alone for a little while, which I hated. I went to my brother's room and started playing some Counter-Strike. After a few minutes, a large sculpture that my brother had made at school fell down onto my face. I got scared, opened the door, and across the hallway I saw the cloud figure at my own room exactly the same spot I saw it every night. This time, it moved quickly toward the kitchen, at a pretty fast pace. I jumped out the window and waited for my mom to come home outside. I had never been that afraid. I get chills just remembering it. At this point, I couldn't take it anymore, and I begged for my parents to find someone that could help. My parents, who had witnessed nothing alarming, didn't share the same desire, but agreed to do it. I could not be present when he was here. I was, quote, too young. But he claimed that three entities lived in the house and gave us some details as to why they were present. From that point on, I never experienced it again. I wouldn't feel watched anymore. I could sleep alone, and I never saw anything again. I don't know what the hell that was, but I'm getting curious now, now that some years have passed. So, if anyone has any ideas as to where these things come from or what I experienced beyond what I've told you and what I know, I would be anxious to hear it. Shortly before becoming pregnant with my second child in 2008, we moved into a 100-year-old mansion that had been renovated into separate apartments. I had never had any sort of paranormal experience before living here, so most of what I experienced I brushed off or made excuses for, but some things were really hard to ignore. I would frequently see shadows or movements out of the corner of my eye hear whispers that very distinctly sounded like they were coming from inside my apartment, and would often have lights turn on and off by themselves. One night in the middle of summer, I was about seven months pregnant at the time, I was struggling to get comfortable in bed, but finally settled on my back with my hands above my head. No sooner had I started to relax that I felt a cold hand on my stomach. It took me a moment to realize that the hand was coming from the wrong direction. It was as if somebody standing beside my bed had their hand on my stomach. I immediately sat up and looked around, but there was no one there other than my ex who was facing the opposite direction. I told him what happened, and he told me it was probably just the baby kicking and I was mistaken. What I felt was definitely not that. Shortly after this, I started to see a yellow flowing dress with small flowers. I don't really know how to explain it. It was like I constantly would see the tail end of someone walking into a room or down the hall. I never got to see the whole person wearing it, 
just the back of the flowing dress. Every time I saw it, I didn't feel scared, but peaceful. After the birth of my second child, we moved into a bigger apartment across the hall in the same house. I immediately noticed the atmosphere felt different, like the air felt almost heavy. The second night there, I could hear voices on the baby monitor. Thinking maybe it was picking up voices from the apartment above ours, and being the nosy person I am, I laid there with my eyes closed and the monitor pressed to my ear, listening hard, trying to pick up what was being said. Suddenly, I could hear a door in my son's room slowly creak open through the monitor. I stopped breathing, trying to listen closely, thinking I was going to hear my son's tiny voice or small footsteps. Instead, it sounded like somebody with heavy, steel-toed boots on was running down my hallway, into my room, and then they launched themselves onto the bottom of our bed. The whole bed shook. I felt paralyzed. My ex started screaming, thinking that we had an intruder, but there was no one there. We tried to rationalize what had happened. Maybe a spring got caught in the mattress during the move and happened to release at that exact moment. And maybe the footsteps I heard were actually from upstairs. All I know is that from that point on, I was absolutely terrified to stay in the apartment at night without a lot of lights on. There was also a weird room or storage area attached to my son's room that gave me the absolute creeps, and I could never get the door to stay closed. I put a hook and eye lock at the top of the door, and almost every day I would go in and the lock would be off and the door would be open. We never used that room, and my son was only three at the time. Finding the door open always gave me anxiety, like that feeling you get right before something bad happens, which is such a weird thing to say about a random empty room, but it's true. Not one second from the time I moved into that apartment until I moved out a few months later did I ever feel comfortable. I always felt like I was being watched. After moving out, I met multiple people that lived in that house, and every single one talked about all the weird and unexplainable things that happened while they lived there. This is the only place that I have ever lived that I've had weird, creepy, or otherwise unexplainable experiences. But that was the house that made me a believer. Let me start by saying that this has been going on for over a year now. Some days are really bad. Some days, absolutely nothing happens. I live in a rural area. I have lived in this house since my son was two years old, and he'll be 16 in May. Nothing at all happened or felt weird up until about three years ago. I was sitting on my patio in the summer. All of a sudden, I got the feeling that somebody was watching me. My son wasn't home at the time, and I was alone. My house is surrounded by wooded areas. My actual driveway is almost a half mile long from street to house. I looked towards the woods at the back of my house, and I saw a man standing in front of a tree. He was older. I'd say he looked to be in his 70s. He was wearing a dark suit. The color was faded black. He did absolutely nothing but stand there, staring. He was bald, and the left side of his head looked like a deflated basketball, for lack of a better description. He made me nervous, and I went back inside my house. Fast forward to the present. My son and I have seen this many, many times. He never leaves the woods, doesn't speak, and doesn't try to do anything. We've become used to him. We respect his area, and he respects ours. About three months ago, in early October, I was walking my dog in our yard. She started barking and took off running into the woods. I yelled for her to stop and caught up to her about 400 feet in. I grabbed her leash. Before I could turn to head back home, she started growling. My dog loves people, wouldn't hurt a fly, but her growl was vicious. I finally turned around, and there was a man standing there approximately four feet away. 
I never heard him or saw him approach. There's no reason for him to be in the woods behind my house. My closest neighbor is a mile down the road. He was also dressed in a suit, a navy blue one, blonde hair, roughly mid-thirties. He caught me off guard and I said, oh, <laughs> you scared me. He replied, beautiful day out today. I said, yes, yes it is. And I began moving to walk around him. I got beside him and had the most awful case of nausea to the point that my mouth filled with saliva and I thought I was going to vomit. I kept walking with my dog. I didn't want him to follow me to my house because my son was in there alone. So I walked along the wooded edge all the way to the top of my driveway. I looked back several times and didn't see him. After a few minutes, I began going back down my driveway to my home. My son called me and said, I thought you were in the backyard. I said, no, I walked up to the road and we're heading back now. He said, mom, a man came to the door and said to tell you that it's very rude to walk away during a conversation. Since that day, things have happened at least three times a week. I found a tooth laying on my kitchen floor. I found a small pendant cross on my windowsill. I've had bruises on my arm that look like fingerprints. My dog died from metastasized sarcoma on what we thought was just a sprained shoulder. The same day my dog passed, my son and I both saw this man again. Well, we saw his face, but his body was grayish white. His arms were unusually long, and his legs were just as long. He was crouched down in a position, like a spider. My son is terrified and wants to move. I'd be on board with the idea as well if it weren't for the fact that this man or thing followed me to a friend's house one day, and she saw him too. So I don't think moving is going to do any good. My uncle's house was constructed from zero, but the place where it is had been long abandoned before he started building. I have so many stories from there that, to me, prove that it is indeed haunted. But I'll begin with the oldest one I can remember, before there was even a house there. Right next to the house, there's a kindergarten. I studied there when I was a kid, just like my mom and her brothers before me. There was always a playground legend about a man in a military uniform who called the kids to go behind the school, and then they disappeared. Even as a kid, I remember being so afraid of going to that particular place behind the school, but as I grew, I stopped thinking about it. Fast forward a few years, and my uncle's house had just been finished. One night, when I was out doing laundry with my cousin, I decided that I wanted to see the kindergarten from above, as it had been years since I saw it on the inside. So we go into the balcony and get a really good view of the place. And after a few seconds, I notice somebody walking in between the classrooms and the back of the school. I couldn't see their face, but my whole body tensed as I saw this shadow go through the wall and then disappear behind the school. I remembered the story from my childhood and I still wonder if that's the same man that the kids saw back then. Most of the paranormal experiences I've had have been with my cousin. I believe her when it comes to the paranormal things that she's told me has happened in my uncle's house. One of the scariest ones for her was a time when she had just come home from school and wanted to ask her aunt, let's call her Sarah, if they were going to eat at her grandparents' house or if they would be staying there. So she goes to the bottom of the stairs and yells, Aunt Sarah, are you here? To which Sarah's voice responded, Yes. Then my cousin yelled again, Are we going to go to Grandma's? But no one answered after that. After a few minutes without a response, my cousin went to the second floor and started looking for Sarah. But there was absolutely no one there. Not a single person. She then called her on the phone, only to find out that they had all gone to her grandparents' house and were waiting for her to go as well. She ran out of there and didn't come back for weeks as she was too afraid of the voice she had heard. I wasn't present when this happened, 
but it's important to the next story where I was present. After those things and a bunch of other paranormal things happened to her and our family, they decided that they would call in a priest to bless the house and invited everybody to pray and later hang out with them. My whole family was there, 20 plus people in the backyard as the priest blessed the house. We were all praying and singing, happy, united, when suddenly, just as the priest was going to climb the stairs to the second floor, a loud voice sounded, as if it was coming from where we were standing. It just said, Go away. My 14-year-old self was shaking with fear, but the lady that was directing the prayer yelled at us to pray louder and to take each other's hands. A lot of people were crying with horror at what we had just witnessed. That has to be one of the scariest things I've ever been through. And for that, I'm convinced that there's something horrible hiding in my uncle's house. I've had a few interesting experiences since I started using my spare room three months ago. A little backstory about the spare room. When I first bought my home last year, there was a family of around 13 people living in it, six of which were adults. There were three small bedrooms and one sketchy annex in the garage. A year later and the neighborhood is still telling me stories about how awful these people were as neighbors. The annex room was initially shoddy framing and drywall work, presumably installed by that family. The walls were painted a weird green color, and the rug was a wrinkly stained mess. It became apparent that someone had been peeing in all four corners of the room. I figured it might just be pets, but there was a mirror that had, please help me, written on it in makeup, and the room locked from the outside. The day we got our keys, I called to respond to the Seattle riots with my National Guard unit, and I was gone for about a month. During that time, my wife and the in-laws began renovating the home to make it livable. I felt guilty being unable to help. My wife got together with my mom to convert that scary extra room into a man cave and jam room with all my musical equipment and memorabilia. It came out really nice, but I haven't found much time to use it in the past year. A couple of months ago, I built a gaming PC and decided to set it up in that room. Now that I've been going in there almost daily, things have started to feel a little strange around the house. I get the sensation that someone is standing directly behind me once or twice a day in the room. Our TV caught fire in the living room a few weeks ago our water main burst last weekend, causing us to dig our yard up over the course of three days. And my garage light keeps turning on and off. I can hear the light switch moving. This morning, I got out of the shower to find that my wife had already left for work. I'm coming down the hall and I hear her clearly say, Hey babe, from the spare room side of the house. I replied, You're still here? To which I got silence. I looked out the front window, and sure enough, her truck was gone. That's when I heard her again. Babe, come here. I grabbed my things and noped to work. Anyway, when I was pulling out of the driveway, I could hear what sounded like a girl screaming from outside, followed by a bang. I stopped before backing into the street, thinking, was that my phone? I waited for a second before continuing on my way, thinking it might just be the school across the street. I got about 50 feet down the road before I heard it again. This time it was faint, but it sounded like it was coming from inside the car. I paused at the stop sign and rolled down the windows to see if it would happen again, as it had sounded identical to the first one. Nothing. I roll up my windows and continue on my way to find that it happened several more times, almost like a recording. The same scream and the same bang, over and over, for another mile or so. Anyway, I'm weirded out for the day. I might sage and bang some pans later. I don't know. Update. 
So this could all be a coincidence, but we've had a string of bad luck events take place with the recent snow. The following events happened over the course of a week, starting on Christmas Eve. We had a crazy cold snap here in Whatcom County, bringing us to unheard of low temps for the area. As one could expect, our hot water line froze and separated, leaving us without hot water for almost the entire week. Why is it always water problems lately? I ended up spending a bunch of time in the attic installing new copper lines and stuff started going off around the home, with everything beginning from me using the spare room office more often. I'm not surprised that I might have once again disturbed the privacy of whatever entity is in our place. My wife keeps telling me that she's under the impression I've opened and closed the bathroom door when I hadn't been back there all day. This has happened pretty often since I originally told the story about this room. Maybe it's paranoia. The other night we woke up to a really loud sound from the spare room area. Our entire pantry rack system had come off the wall and was barely held up by one of the accordion doors. This could be explained by too much weight on the shelves, maybe, but what happened next made it odd. I got up early the same morning and booted my PC to play some Tarkov. I was in there from around 7 to 10 a.m. When I came out, I noticed that the closet next to our front door was wide open and all the coats inside were on the ground. After a closer look, I realized the plastic hangers were all broken off, like somebody had just ripped everything down. The cold cracked our truck windshield. We've been experiencing some relationship struggles that I don't even care to elaborate on. We had no hot water, couldn't work all that week because of inclement weather, and now this? It's just a lot of stuff in such a short period. Anyway, I don't know what you guys think this might be, but I thought you might enjoy the story. Back in 2009, me, my mom, and my stepdad moved into a really old, rustic rural cottage in England. My father had passed away not too long before, and this was going to be a new start for us all. The house was an absolute bargain. It had six bedrooms, two very spacious living rooms, and a huge annex at the back that was essentially a second house. We couldn't work out why it was so cheap. We went for the viewing and the family eventually told us that their elderly mother had passed away there peacefully in the annex and they just needed to get away from the feeling of her. That probably should have been a first red flag. We weren't put off though and we bought the house. From the beginning it was unsettling. My parents didn't see it at first, but I was incredibly uncomfortable there. It was extremely unnerving and cold. Not to mention, it was isolated behind rows of trees and a very long driveway, so far away from anyone else. It started on the first night. My room was at the end of the corridor, and if you came out of my room, on the right was a bathroom and a locked door that led to the annex, the place where the elderly mother had died. My parents slept a long way down the corridor, in the last bedrooms, so I was quite isolated and directly opposite my room were the stairs. This first night, it was freakishly cold. I pulled my blankets up to my head, but after my dad passed away, I had suffered from insomnia for years, so the cold and the anxieties of moving to a new house all added together to create zero sleep. So I ended up laying awake for hours, just sort of staring around the room. My bedroom door was one of those old and mismatched wooden country house doors. It didn't quite reach the carpets. And after a few hours, I could hear the creaking of floorboards directly outside my room. And shadows that seemed even darker than the darkness of the hallway walking past my door. I presumed that one of my parents had gotten up to use the bathroom at first. But this went on, back and forth back and forth for several minutes and it was fast it was a very brisk walk 
Not to mention, next to my door was the locked door to the annex. Anybody walking at that speed would have hit the door, but nothing. It freaked me out and had me dreading the next night. This kept happening every night for a few weeks. And I remember vividly one night I actually left my bedroom door open. Around the same time, as always, I heard the creaking. I turned around and unmistakably there was a figure, blacker than black, walking forward and backwards in front of the door, just visible in the darkness of the hallway. I couldn't take my eyes off it the entire time it was there. It's safe to say I never slept with the door open again after that night. But this is where things start to get properly creepy. I'd been terrified of this shadow for weeks now. There was a really horrible feeling that I had around it, like it was after me. And one night, as I was going downstairs for dinner, I had the same cold feeling. And for just a second, I froze in place in the dark hallway and looked to my right toward the annex door. And there, sure as anything, and without my sleepy eyes to blame it on, I saw the same black shadow walking directly at me at high speed. I ran downstairs as quickly as I could and I told my parents everything. They mostly laughed it off and didn't believe me, and tried to reassure me that ghosts aren't real, and there was no chance of anything about this old lady still being in the house. Now a bit of backstory. This old lady was terrified of the previous owner's family dog, so much so that they had installed a pulley system in the house so she could pull a cord from her bedroom that would trigger an old bell to ring in the kitchen if she wanted anything. The whole system was still there when we moved in. And this night, the night after I told my parents, I was woken at around 2.30 in the morning by this bell in the kitchen ringing loudly and repetitively, like it was being pulled firmly and constantly over and over. I ran out into the corridor and my parents were there too, equally as confused and concerned as I was. We all looked at each other with ever increasingly worried expressions and ran downstairs into the kitchen to see what was going on. As soon as we entered the kitchen, it stopped. We ventured up into the annex to see what could have caused this, but nothing, no sign of anyone. And my gosh, I hated it there. It was even colder and more lifeless than the main part of the house and I just felt like I needed to leave as soon as I could. My parents didn't quite believe that this was a ghost yet, but they were clearly less skeptical than before. From here, any activity became much more obvious. All of us, my parents included, started to hear knocking from the annex door next to my bedroom, noises from downstairs that sounded like someone was down there moving. Sometimes my fish tank light would flick on and off with an audible click and wake me up. And I would often even wake up to my wardrobe doors being wide open with no breeze in sight. One night, I was sat reading alone in my room, and one of these wardrobe doors opened by itself, wide and with relative force. I got up, cautiously, and closed it, and then I ran downstairs to see my parents. When I came up around 15 minutes later, Every single covered door, around a dozen of them, were open as wide as they could go. Lots more went on, too. Taps turning themselves on became a particularly regular occurrence. And one night, I awoke to the sound of my cupboard door opening again, and saw droplets of water running from the bathroom next to the annex door, all the way to a few feet from my bed, with no droplets out again. I was terrified. It was around six months after all this had started that we eventually moved out. My grandma had begun to grow unwell and couldn't care for herself anymore, and she moved in with us. From the beginning, she hated that house. My grandma was so incredibly sweet and calm, and I've never seen her distressed like she was there. On one night in particular, when I was sat downstairs in the kitchen with her, she took my hand, pointed directly toward the annex, and said, don't you go in there. I don't like it in there. It's safe to say this scared the crap out of me. On the last night we all spent together in the house, I was awoken by my mum screaming. 
Clear as day, she said she felt two hands firmly grab her ankles over the bed sheets and pull her down the bed just a few inches. And right there and then, she asked to leave. We went to stay in our old house for a while, but because of size, my stepdad, the biggest skeptic among us, stayed in Lilac Cottage for a few more months. He's still quiet to this day about that house. He hates talking about it. But even he admits that there was something incredibly wrong there. And without much warning, he put the house up for sale, selling it so desperately that he lost almost a quarter of the price he paid for it. And he's never told us why. I've promised myself that one day I'll reach out to the current owners of that house and see if they have also experienced anything. But I haven't. At least not yet. About five years ago, I was in the Air Cadets, a UK organization affiliated with the RAF. My squadron was, and is, based in the Sergeant's Mess at IWM Duxford, a former RAF station, now a vast air museum. On this particular occasion, it was a summer evening and dusk was settling in. I was in charge of a camouflage exercise, which involved the cadets using camouflage to hide and me trying to spot them. I was walking past several World War II era buildings when I saw two figures in the distance walking toward me. As I got closer, I saw that the two figures were U.S. Air Force officers, not an uncommon sight, were not far from RAF Lakenheath, a U.S. Air Force base. Maybe they're visiting. As I got closer, I realized that they were wearing very outdated uniforms and had flying equipment that was extremely old. Still not thinking much of it, I saluted them as I walked past, as is customary. They didn't acknowledge the salute, nor did they say anything. I walked off, feeling a little uneasy. Later that night, as the exercise wrapped up, I remembered the incident, and I asked my commanding officer who the two officers were. I got a very odd look. He said, Corporal, we haven't had any visitors tonight. Concerned that somebody may have broken in, security made a site-wide search, but could find nothing. They then quizzed me, and when I described the airmen I had seen, a grim look came over their faces. They proceeded to let me know that this wasn't the first time they'd been seen. Back in 1944, a B-17 Flying Fortress visited the airfield and took some personnel on a joyride. The aircraft collided with a navigation mast at low altitude and smashed into an accommodation building exploding on impact and killing all aboard, plus one man in the barracks block. The building was located right next to where I had been walking. Furthermore, the men I described, they were the pilot and the navigator. They have been seen a few times over the years, often by security making patrols at night. I've always felt like I'm being watched when passing that spot. And sometimes I wonder if others feel the same way. I had a creepy experience at the Lizzie Borden house and I thought I'd share. For the record, I don't believe in ghosts and I'm skeptical of all paranormal experiences. But I will certainly admit when something is creepy and can't be easily explained. I didn't go into this day expecting or hoping to have any kind of experience. We stayed in one of the attic rooms, the Knowlton room, which had a large toy chest in the corner. I had no issue with the room and found it cute and comfortable. But when I went to sleep, I had awful dreams all night. It was a hyper-realistic dream. I was lying in the very same bed that I was actually sleeping in, feeling terrified. I was trying to fall back to sleep, but it was difficult because of the strong sense of fear and because I was so thirsty. My throat felt like paper. 
I wanted to get up and get a drink of water from the bathroom, but I was too afraid. I felt that if I opened my eyes, I would see somebody in the room. I lay there for what felt like hours trying to fall back to sleep so that morning would come. At one point, I heard what sounded like a ball go bouncing across the floor. I heard it a second time, and I woke up my friend who was sleeping next to me to ask if she had heard it, but she hadn't and it didn't happen again. I assume that I dreamed this whole part because she doesn't remember me waking her up, but maybe she was just too tired to. Then at some point, I think I woke up for real because I was suddenly aware that I was lying in bed with my eyes open and the fear was suddenly lifted, and the room felt completely normal. It was like a cloud had been lifted from my mind, which I sometimes feel when I'm struggling to wake up and I finally pull out of it. I was still really thirsty, though. I didn't think much of my bad dream, until the tour guide started to mention experiences that other guests had had while sleeping in the house. When we went to the attic, the guide told us that a lot of people who sleep there hear the sound of children playing at night. I asked if anyone had ever reported hearing a ball bounce across the floor. She said, that's pretty common. Why do you ask? She also refused to go into the attic guest rooms. She let us explore, but despite having no issue with the murder room and the master bedroom, she would not go into Knowlton room. This could have just been an act to enhance a tour's spookiness, but I don't know. I've also since learned that bad nightmares are very common in that room. For the record, I don't typically have dreams like this. I have no problem sleeping in strange places. I have stayed at many hotels and inns and friends' houses. And while I may have restless dreams, I don't have nightmares, especially not these vividly realistic ones where I'm just lying in bed feeling afraid. I've only had a dream like this once before shortly after I had moved into my current apartment and was sleeping alone in my new room. No one ever lived in that part of the attic. It was open storage space and was only converted into guest rooms when the house became a bed and breakfast. So there's no reason for why there would be children's ghosts in the attic, let alone any ghosts at all. I know the tour guides claim that the attic is the most haunted part of the house, but there isn't really a logical reason for this. There were some children who were killed next door, and they claim that those children come to visit, but I don't know. Maybe the atmosphere cultivates bad dreams. I did look at the toy chest before going to bed, so maybe that influenced my dream. But I didn't notice any balls in it, just dolls and stuffed animals. I know a bad dream isn't the most interesting thing, but the fact that many people have had bad dreams in this room is at least a little weird. It's the spookiest thing that I've ever experienced, for sure. I was hoping I might get another independent report of hearing a ball bouncing. I'm too skeptical to believe anyone who says, me too, after hearing my story. But nonetheless, I find it neat that I dreamed of a ball bouncing. Despite only noticing dolls and not balls, and not being a person who's overly susceptible to creepy places, and that this fits with other people's reports of having heard children playing. What do you think? Have you ever had any strange experiences at the Lizzie Borden house?